Hey there, audiobook enthusiasts. Welcome to the audiobook collection. Today's upcoming audiobook is a special shout out to one of our amazing Patreon backers. If you're keen on personalized requests, consider becoming a part of our Patreon community. The link is in the video description below. Your support is truly appreciated, and I'm grateful to have you with me on this exciting audiobook adventure. And hey, if you're looking for a bundle of 300 plus novels, swing by my Kofi shop. For just $35, you can snag a Google Drive link to an audiobook treasure trove. Additionally, if you want to show some love to the original author of this novel, check out the author's credits discreetly provided in the description. Your support makes a difference. Thanks for being part of this literary journey with me. Chapter 26, Civil War Part 5 Marvel DC, Images, Manhus, and every anime that will be mentioned and used in this story are not mine. They all belong to their respective owners. The main character carried to Josue Valdez and the story are mine. Small time skip. As the Quinjet soared through the Siberian skies, the trio of heroes engaged in small talk, finding solace in each other's presence as they prepared to confront the hidden winter soldiers in the bunker ahead. Bucky, what's gonna happen to you two's friends? Carito, they're gonna get arrested for turning into criminals in a high-end prison. I think it was called the Raft or something? I don't remember, didn't bother listening. Steve. Whatever it is, I'll deal with it. Carito, no, I'll handle it. I'm most likely on the wanted list anyways. Bucky, guys, I don't know if I'm worth all this. Carito, it wasn't your fault Bucky. You were brainwashed for years. You had no control over your actions just like how I didn't have control over the suit and beat everyone to a pulp in the airport. I didn't think the symbiote would empower my negative emotions so much. I guess I really am that fucked up. So don't say that you aren't worth everything that's happened. You're you now and not the weapon that Hydra created and I took back control of my body from the symbiote, okay? Bucky, I guess we can relate to being brainwashed, though it might have been different. Carito, I guess we do, huh? Smirks. Steve, taps Carito's shoulder thanks. Carito, I dry. Meanwhile with Tony Stark. In the aftermath of the cataclysmic confrontation with their former ally Carito, the Avengers found themselves ensnared in a web of chaos and despair. The team's physical wounds were only a tangible reflection of the deeper scars left by the harrowing experience. Bruised bodies and fractured bones bore witness to the toll of the battle, yet they were fortunate that the toxin symbiote, driven by Carito's restrained willpower, had spared them from permanent harm. In the somber aftermath, a tense meeting convened, with General Ross asserting that Spider-Man, in his altered state, was now deemed a menacing threat, positioning him alongside the notorious Captain America on the top of the wanted list. Tony, ever the defender of Carito, tried to intercede, but his efforts were met with a cold resistance, the secretary's acrimony towards the Spider-Hero palpable. Caught in the throes of confusion and guilt, Tony found himself grappling with conflicting emotions. He watched his once cohesive team now fractured by the actions of a dear friend, and the tormenting questions flooded his mind. Why did Carito choose Steve over him? Did he fail in his efforts to protect and guide his friend? The burden of overthinking weighed heavily on his shoulders, rendering him vulnerable to the dark recesses of his mind. As the restless introspection threatened to consume him, Natasha, her face adorned with a bandage, approached Tony with empathy and understanding. The two sought solace in their shared experiences. Their conversation veiled in the intimate bond forged by their heroic endeavors. Tony, how are you feeling? Natasha, my face still hurts. Tony, how bad did he hurt you? Natasha, enough to fracture my cheekbones with a slap. Tony, damn, I fractured my arm when he slammed me to the ground. It isn't too bad at least. Natasha, I don't know how to feel about him after that. Tony, it wasn't him, it was the suit. He would never hurt us. Natasha, but after the argument he and I had. What if he was still angry about it? Tony, don't. He might look like someone to hold grudges but he's not. Natasha, okay. Size you know, Steve's not gonna stop. If you don't either, the beatdown is gonna be the best case scenario. What if Carito? Tony, don't. Natasha, we played this wrong. Tony, starts to get agitated we? Holy shit, it must be hard to shake the whole double agent thing, huh? It sticks in the DNA. Natasha, are you incapable of letting go of your ego? Weren't you almost losing your mind before I interrupted your inner monologue? Tony, deep sigh I tried not to lose a friend I care about. I'm trying to do what is best for all of us. I made my friend into a monster. Steve is ruining everything. 
My head is about to explode. Natasha, I don't want to do this anymore. Tony, what? Natasha, I can't. Everything that's been going on. I just can't. Tony, you. You can't leave. Natasha, yes, I can. Nothing is like it was before and it'll never be. I at least hoped that being here was the best choice, but I should have listened to Steve. Tony, W what? Tony observed Natasha's weary countenance, and it struck him as a stark departure from her usual resolute demeanor. It was perplexing, and his mind churned with questions as to why she appeared so detached and disengaged. Her demeanor was uncharacteristic, leaving Tony to wonder if something had altered her perspective on their mission and their shared cause. Had the ordeal with Carito shaken her trust in the team? Or was there something else simmering beneath the surface? Lost in his contemplation, Tony was interrupted by a timely notification from his watch, beckoning him back to the present. He instinctively shifted his focus to the information before him, seeking a refuge from the weighty thoughts that had been haunting him. But even amidst the influx of data and analysis, the turmoil within remained unabated. Tony, Friday, what am I looking at? Friday, priority upload from Berlin Police. Tony, size fire up the chopper. Small time skip. In the solitary confines of the chopper, high above the vast expanse of the sea, Tony found himself deep in thought, contemplating the enigmatic revelations that had unfolded before him. As the swirling currents of the ocean mirrored the tumultuous churn of his mind, the voice of his AI resonated through the cabin, punctuating the silence with crucial information that Carito had been desperately trying to convey. Friday, the task force called for a psychiatrist as soon as Barnes was captured. The UN dispatched Dr. Theo Broussard from Geneva within the hour. He was met by this man, shows video footage of Zemo. Tony, did you run facial recognition yet? Friday, I didn't have to, Carito already had dug up everything. Tony, of course, he's always one step ahead of us. Friday, maybe you shouldn't have ignored him the entire time he was trying to tell you and everyone else, you decided to listen when it was too late. Tony, yeah. I really should have. Friday, anyways, the information Carito had dug him is this. The fake doctor is actually Colonel Helmut Zemo. Sokovian intelligence. Zemo ran Echo Scorpion. A Sokovian covert kill squad. Carito really doesn't stop impressing me. Tony, what happened to the real Broussard? Friday, he was found dead in a Berlin hotel room, where police also found a wig and facial prosthesis. Approximating the appearance of one James Buchanan Barnes. Tony, remembers what Kala said to him. Memory. Kala, your spider friend is something else. Tony, how so, your highness? Kala, he said that he was gonna prove me and everyone wrong that it wasn't Barnes, but a guy named Zemo that's framing him. Tony, well, he does get a bit crazy when something this crazy happens. Kala, he's crazy indeed. Memory end. Tony felt an overwhelming sense of guilt for dismissing Carito's warnings as mere delusions. He realized the consequences of his actions and acknowledged the need for humility and empathy in his quest for truth. Tony, son of a bitch. Pinches the bridge of his nose I should have listened to you since the beginning, Carito. You're always right. Get this information to Ross. Friday, yes, boss. Siberia, Hydra secret base. Zemo arrived at the ancient bunker with impeccable timing, adeptly clearing the ice around the pad to access the sealed gate. His keen intellect and determination led him to secure a crucial red book, which held the key to unlock the gate, a relic of the past guarding its secrets. With methodical precision, he skillfully opened the gate, revealing a vast repository of knowledge contained within a labyrinth of crates and boxes. His eyes scanned the archives until he laid hands on the document he sought, marked with the cryptic title December 1991. The significance of this find weighed heavily on Zemmer's mind, hinting at a pivotal moment in history. Pushing further into the recesses of the bunker, he came upon an eerie sight, five imposing containers, each housing a frozen winter soldier. Zemo, so this is what that hunter was talking about? With calculated steps, Zemo approached a console adorned with mysterious controls and interfaces, an enigma from a bygone era. His acute mind analyzed the intricate mechanisms, revealing the method behind the chilling preservation of the winter soldiers' bodies. A wry smile tugged at the corners of his lips as he discerned the secret behind their icy slumber. From the depths of his pocket emerged a vial containing a dark, enigmatic liquid, an ominous substance pulsating with an otherworldly aura. Carefully, he observed its properties, the inky blackness seemingly alive with subtle currents of mystical energy. With deliberate intent, he introduced this arcane concoction into the chamber where once benign liquid nitrogen flowed. 
A metamorphosis occurred before his eyes as the once tranquil white gas transformed into a swirling mass of darkness. An ethereal black cloud now enveloped the slumbering super soldiers, infusing their icy chambers with the essence of dark power. Location, the raft. As Tony's aircraft neared the predetermined coordinates, he engaged the radio to announce his presence, invoking the language of identification and protocol. The airwaves crackled with electronic transmissions, resonating like a symphony of signals amidst the vast expanse of the sky. Guard, on radio this is raft prison control. You're clear for landing, Mr. Stark. Amidst the shimmering lights that encircled the ocean's edge, a colossal structure emerged, ascending from the depths with a certain ominous grace. The resurfacing prison, known only as the raft. This circular bastion of confinement housed individuals with nefarious pasts, once aligned with the enigmatic darks, now divested of their powers by Spider-Man's intervention. Dubbed small fry by Carito, they found themselves ensnared within the formidable walls of the raft, alongside vigilantes who were now deemed a menace to the very fabric of humanity. Tony's helicopter touched down within this formidable enclosure, and he was met with an austere presence, none other than Director Ross. Their encounter took on the air of formality, two forces converging in the heart of the raft, both burdened with their respective agendas and convictions. Tony, so? You got the files? Let's reroute the satellites, and start facial scanning for this Zemo guy. Ross, you seriously think I'm gonna listen to you after that fiasco in Leipzig? Especially when these files are from Spider-Man, that fucking worthless piece of shit. You're lucky you're not in one of these cells. With a resolute sense of restraint, Tony suppressed the instinct to unleash his ire upon Director Ross, choosing instead to accompany the imposing figure further into the depths of the prison. As he stepped into the camera room, a poignant tableau unfolded before him, one that pierced his heart with guilt. Within the cells stood his former comrades, once revered as heroes, now subjected to the disheartening treatment reserved for perceived villains. A profound sense of revulsion surged through Tony, as the weight of remorse and regret began to settle upon his soul. Descending further into the heart of this somber place, Tony sought to engage with those he once stood shoulder to shoulder with, hoping to glean any fragment of insight that might help illuminate the enigma before them. Yet, as he stepped into their presence, he was greeted not with warmth, but a palpable air of disillusionment. Clint's sardonic applause served as a poignant testament to the fractured camaraderie, a vivid portrayal of the fractures that had emerged within their once unified ranks. Clint, the futurist, gentlemen. Clapping the Futurist is here. He sees all. He knows what's best for you, whether you like it or not. Tony, give me a break, Barton. I had no idea they'd put you here. Come on. Clint, spits on the floor yeah. Well, you knew they'd put us somewhere, Tony. Tony, yeah, but not some supermax floating ocean pocky. This place is for maniacs. The ones Carito puts here constantly all the time. This is a place for... Clint, criminals criminals, Tony. Think that's the word you're looking for, right? That didn't used to mean me, or Sam, or Wanda, nor Carito. I don't even want to imagine what they would do to him if they capture him. But yet, here we all are. Tony, because you broke the law. Clint, yeah. Tony, I didn't make you. You read, you broke it. Clint, ignoring him la, 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 la. Tony, you're all grown up. You got a wife and kids. I don't understand, why didn't you think about them before you chose the wrong side? Clint, TCH. You gotta watch your back with this guy. Slams the hardened glass cell there's a chance he's gonna break it. Or turn you into a monster. Scott, Hank Pym always said you never can trust a Stark. Tony, who are you? Scott, someone who doesn't turn their friends into monsters. Tony, TCH. Keeps walking. Sam, what do you want? Tony, what do you need? They feed you yet? Sam, turns around you're the good cop, now? Tony, I'm just the guy who needs to know where Steve went and save Carito. Sam, save Carito? After the ass whopping he gave us because you gave him a suit that turned him into a killing machine? He's better off without your help. I still can't believe you managed to make one of the nicest and funniest people I know into someone I feared with my entire being, hoping he wouldn't break a bone or kill me. Tony, taps his watch a few times I just knocked the A out of their avenue we got about 30 seconds before they realize it's not their equipment, please, tell me. The guilt of turning Carito into that thing suffocates me and I want to actually fix things. Carito was right about this entire thing since the start. Look I made mistakes. Sam, no shit, Sherlock. Tony, Psycap is definitely off the reservation. But he's about to need all the help he can get. 
We don't know each other very well. You don't have to. Sam, hey, it's all right. Size look, I'll tell you. But you have to go alone and as a friend. Tony, easy. As Tony made a hasty exit from the room, his mind already consumed with the newfound information about Steve's location, his determination to confront his friends alone burned fiercely within him. The weight of responsibility for this crucial mission rested solely on his shoulders, a burden he bore willingly in his pursuit to reach Steve, not as adversaries, but as erstwhile comrades. Ross, stuck? Did he give you anything on Rogers? Tony, nope, told me to go to hell. I'm going back to the compound instead, but you can call me anytime. I'll put you on hold. I like to watch the line blink. As Tony's helicopter steadily gained altitude, leaving the former double prison behind, a subtle transformation unfolded within the confines of the aircraft. With purposeful finesse, he liberated his arm from the encumbering cast, an emblem of resilience and determination, and proceeded to activate the mechanisms that would don his iconic suit of armor. Amidst the hum of advanced technology, the Iron Man suit enveloped Tony, shrouding him in a formidable fusion of man and machine. This emblem of strength and protection represented more than just a physical shield, it embodied the unwavering spirit of a hero who fought for justice and sought redemption amidst the tangled web of friendships and responsibilities. However, unbeknownst to the armored Avendia, the shadow of Wakanda's sovereign, Tkala, lay concealed amidst the ethereal embrace of the clouds. Within the sleek confines of a stealthy Quinjet, the Black Panther maintained a vigilant watch, resolute in his decision to pursue Tony and covertly trail the path that led to Steve, Bucky, and the enigmatic Carito. Location, Siberia. As the Quinjet gracefully descended upon its designated landing spot, its occupants, Captain America, Bucky Barnes, and Carito, prepared to embark on their solemn mission. With practiced efficiency, Carito activated a concealed compartment within the jet, revealing an array of armaments displayed upon a shimmering wall. In a tacit understanding, he handed a formidable assault rifle to Bucky, who offered his gratitude in response. Stepping out of the jet, their collective resolve mirrored the gravity of their objective. The air seemed to hum with unspoken sentiments as they walked purposefully toward the hidden bunker. Despite the weight of their mission, Captain America sought to bridge the silence with gentle discourse, attempting to infuse a semblance of normalcy into their daunting undertaking. Captain America, Bucky, you remember that time we had to ride back from Rockaway Beach in the back of that freezer truck? Winter Soldier, was that the time we used our train money to buy hot dogs? Spider-Man, PFFF no you didn't. Captain America, check this, he blew three bucks trying to win that stuffed bear for a redhead. Spider-Man, it's always got to be the redheads, huh? Smirked. Winter Soldier, hey. She was cute alright? Also, what was her name, again? Spider-Man, damn, tap and leave? That's harsh man. Winter Soldier, no, I didn't do such a thing, man. Bumps Spider-Man's shoulder. Spider-Man, chuckles. Captain America, if I recall it was Dolores. He used to call her dot. Spider-Man, imagine being called the small circle that ends a sentence. Winter Soldier, I thought it was a nice nickname. But she's got to be a hundred years old right now. Spider-Man, you talk like you two aren't also a hundred years old. Captain America, he's not wrong. Spider-Man, anyways, cracks neck let's do this. Through the shadowed terrain, Spider-Man's enigmatic presence took the lead, exuding an air of calculated poise as he guided his two compatriots, Captain America and Bucky Barnes, with utmost precision. The subtle nuances of their body language spoke volumes, attuned to each other's unspoken cues as they cautiously approached the enigmatic bunker. As they drew nearer, its mysterious entrance stood ominously ajar, causing a ripple of unease to course through their collective consciousness. With a slight hand gesture, Spider-Man silently conveyed the need for heightened vigilance. His keen senses attuned to every subtle sound and movement, ensuring the trio remained acutely aware of the potential dangers lurking in the vicinity. Captain America, he can't have been here more than a few hours. Winter Soldier, long enough to wake them up. Spider-Man, exactly. I'll stay ahead and warn you with my spider sense. Captain America, right. In seamless unison, the intrepid trio stepped into the elevator, their gazes meeting and exchanging silent assurances of their readiness for the task at hand. The confined space seemed to amplify the gravity of the situation, and yet their collective determination shone through, lending an air of steely resolve to their countenances. As the elevator gently hummed to a stop, the doors slid open, revealing the heart of the mysterious bunker. In a display of nonverbal communication, 
they nodded in mutual understanding, confirming their individual readiness for the forthcoming challenges. With a calculated nod, Captain America took the lead, ascending the second set of doors as the other two pressed forward. The path ahead held a shroud of secrecy, and the heroes advanced with caution, their senses heightened, and their instincts on high alert. Amidst the dimly lit corridors, Spider-Man gracefully adjusted his posture, assuming a crouching position just ahead, his keen spider sense attuned to the minutest fluctuations in the environment. His role was clear, to act as the harbinger of any impending danger, a guardian of the path they tread. Their steps led them up a flight of stairs, and Spider-Man's acute senses detected a subtle presence approaching from behind. Alerting his comrades, with a swift gesture, the trio quickly adopted a tactical formation. Captain America, you two ready? Spider-Man, I don't feel any killing intent or ill intentions. Winter Soldier, you sure? Spider-Man, yes. I have a feeling this is Tony. The elevator doors parted, and a figure clad in a resplendent armor emerged into view. There, before them, was none other than Iron Man, his approach deliberate and measured. The soft, luminous glow of his suit illuminated the tension in the air, casting an ethereal aura upon his presence. Iron Man, you seem a little defensive. Captain America, it's been a long day. Iron Man, at ease, you too. I'm not after you too. Spider-Man, I know. Iron Man, of course you do. Captain America, then why are you here? Iron Man, I saw Carito's files on the situation and he was right. Your story's not so crazy. Spider-Man, fucking finally man. Iron Man, Ross has no idea I'm here. I'd like to keep it that way. Otherwise, I got to arrest myself. Captain America, well, that sounds like a lot of paperwork. Iron Man, scoff. Captain America, it's good to see you, Tony. Iron Man, you too, Cap. Spider-Man, no, good to see you for me? Iron Man, Carito, look the suit. Spider-Man, it's fine, I was already aware it was alive and I thought I could control it. I was wrong, don't blame yourself, I'm the one to blame for thinking I could do it and ending up hurting everyone who cares about me. Iron Man, thank you. Spider-Man, no problem man, it's on me. Iron Man, looks at Bucky Hay, Manchurian candidate, you're killing me. There's a truce here, you can drop. Captain America, signals him to stand down. Winter Soldier, calms down. In a seamless display of coordination, Iron Man and Spider-Man assume their positions at the forefront, leading the charge into the depths of the formidable Hydra base. Their movements were guided by a sense of purpose, as if each step was a deliberate dance in perfect harmony with the unfolding mission. Spider-Man and Iron Man, I got heat signatures. What? Captain America, how many? Spider-Man and Iron Man, six. Dark entities detected, five approximately. Spider-Man, guys, there are five darks in here. Captain America, what? Iron Man, shit. In a chilling twist of fate, the trio stepped into a room only to find the once-occupied containers now empty, their contents mysteriously gone, and the shadows of uncertainty looming large. It was a scene that stoked the embers of apprehension, casting an aura of intrigue and foreboding over the team. As they grappled with this disconcerting discovery, an enigmatic voice, bearing the weight of secrets and machinations, resonated through the base's speakers, like an unseen puppeteer pulling the strings of destiny. It was Zemo, the orchestrator of this intricate web of events, his calculated words tinged with a dispassionate yet commanding cadence. Zemo. My plan was to kill them in their sleep but I had struck a deal with an entity who told me to do this and I'm a man of my word. Spider-Man, fuck. Zemo, so you're this dimension's guardian? Spider-Man, who would have thought? Spider-Man, the hell do you want from me? Zemo, well it wasn't just you, the soldiers were the bait and you all took it. I'm grateful for them for that reason. As the room's ambience shifted, the subtle interplay of light and shadows danced upon the iron door concealing the enigmatic figure lurking behind its cold, metallic facade. A collective tension rippled through the team, each member attuned to the gravity of the moment. Iron Man, with his suit's sensors honed to precision, poised himself with calculated readiness, his eyes narrowing upon the door's mysterious occupant. Beside him, the ever-vigilant Captain America felt an instinctual uneasiness, a flicker of caution within the depths of his indomitable spirit, reacting to this unease. He uncharacteristically released his iconic shield, sending it forth like a deadly projectile, aimed at the heart of the unknown. Yet, with a seamless choreography of trust and synergy, Spider-Man, with agile dexterity, intercepted the iconic discus of defense. 
Zemo, impressed reflexes, Spider-Man. Spider-Man. Zemo, that shield wouldn't have done anything anyways. The Soviets built this chamber to withstand the launch blast of UR-100 rockets. Iron Man, I'm betting I could beat that. Zemo, oh, I'm sure you could, Mr. Stark. Given time. Black Panther was hiding in the shadows listening to the conversation. Zemo, but then you'd never know why you came. Captain America, you killed innocent people in Vienna just to bring us here? Zemo, I've thought about nothing else for over a year. I studied you and Spider-Man. I followed. But now that you're both standing here. I just realized. There's a bit of green in the blue of Captain Rogers' eyes. Chuckles how nice to find a flaw. And you Spider-Man? Oh my. I could tell that the weight of the universe is on your shoulders, I can't even fathom the responsibility you carry to keep us all safe, every day, week, and year. It's admiring how you are still going even after everything you've been through. Spider-Man, clenches his fists. Captain America, you're Sokovian. Is that what this is about? Zemo, Sokovia was a failed state long before Spider-Man blew it to hell. No. I'm here because I made a promise and a deal. Captain America, you lost someone. Zemo, clicks tongue I lost everyone. And so will you. As the room was engulfed in an aura of tension, an enigmatic screen flickered to life, projecting a mesmerizing sequence that seemed to bridge the gap between past and present. The video's grainy footage unfolded like a hidden treasure, a clandestine glimpse into a bygone era. Mission Report, 16th of December 1991, the words etched in digital luminescence, marked the beginning of a journey through time. The scene materialized as if from the recesses of memory, revealing a clandestine operation veiled in shadows and secrets. Zemo, an empire toppled by its enemies can rise again. But one which crumbles from within? That's dead. Forever. As the enigmatic video played, the heroes found themselves drawn inexorably towards the illuminated screen, like moths drawn to the mesmerizing glow of a distant flame. The images flickered and danced before them, an intricate dance of shadows and secrets weaving a tapestry of clandestine affairs. Spider-Man, however, seemed to be grappling with an internal tempest, his countenance betraying a rising sense of unease. His instincts surged him to shatter the screen and dispel the haunting revelations, yet an unseen force held him back, restraining him like an ethereal hand gripping his very soul. Spider-Man, what the hell? Zemo, no, no, no. Let them watch Spider. Spider-Man, no. Tony. Iron Man, I. I know that road. What is this? Zemo. In the confines of the dimly lit room, the haunting images of the video unfolded like an enigmatic tableau, capturing the essence of a fateful moment frozen in time. A car wreck, a motorcycle racing by in swift succession, the scene bore the weight of inexplicable tragedy. As the seconds ticked by, the enigmatic figure on the motorcycle revealed himself to be none other than Bucky Barnes. Tony Stark, enshrouded in his formidable Iron Man armor, watched with a mounting sense of unease as the pieces of a heart-rending puzzle fell into place before his very eyes. His once stern expression began to unravel, yielding to the raw emotions that surged within him. The facade of invulnerability that the armored visage projected could no longer conceal the turmoil that now stirred beneath the surface. The video served as a cruel reminder of a past that lay dormant, a past he had tried so desperately to suppress and forget. But truth, like an indomitable tide, had a way of surging forth, unyielding and unrelenting. Tony's heart ached with the weight of loss, as the memories of his lost parents came flooding back, threatening to consume him. The video. Howard Stark, weakly help my wife. Coughs please. Help. As the footage progresses, the Winter Soldier's actions become more evident, and Tony's father, Howard Stark, slowly falls victim to his cold grip. Howard Stark, Sergeant Barnes? Maria Stark, in pain Howard. In a chilling display of ruthless efficiency, the Winter Soldier's metallic fist collides with Howard Stark's vulnerable face, with a resounding impact that shatters the peace of the past. The tragic scene plays out on the screen before the somber audience, each frame etching itself into the collective memory of those present. The act is swift, yet its consequences are irrevocable. The life of a brilliant and visionary man, Howard Stark, is abruptly extinguished, leaving a void in the world that can never be filled. The anguish of Maria Stark, his wife, is palpable in the raw emotion conveyed through the moving images. Her distress grows more profound with every passing second, as her world collapses around her. Maria Stark, Howard. Bucky advances with a cold and emotionless demeanor, drawn inexorably toward his next victim, Maria Stark, a woman of grace and warmth, fights with every fiber of her being to survive. 
her eyes pleading for mercy and understanding, but all to no avail. The Winter Soldier's grip tightens with remorseless resolve, and the horrifying sound of bones cracking reverberates through the room as he claims yet another innocent life. The haunting tableau culminates with Bucky's merciless act, a single gunshot obliterating the camera, plunging the screen into an abyss of darkness. Back to reality. In the aftermath of the haunting revelation captured on the flickering screen, a profound and solemn silence fell upon the room, shrouding it in an aura of anguish and disbelief. The pallid visage of Iron Man bore witness to the depths of agony and wrath, his eyes aflame with unquenchable fury, yet his heart torn by the unbearable weight of sorrow and regret. The tempest of emotions within him threatened to consume him whole, as he teetered precariously on the precipice of despair. Meanwhile, Spider-Man, his youthful countenance etched with torment, found himself overwhelmed by the nightmarish scenes he had just encountered. His very essence reverberated with anxiety, his thoughts entangled in the mire of haunting images, struggling to make sense of the unfathomable darkness that had been exposed. The web-slinger's instinctive desire to shield his friend from further harm compelled him to interpose himself, placing his own body between Iron Man and the embodiment of his torment. Spider-Man, Tony. No. Captain America, no. Stop, Tony. Iron Man, looks at both Spider-Man and Captain America did you know? Captain America, I didn't know it was him. Iron Man, don't bullshit, me Rogers. Did you know? Carito? Spider-Man, looks down. Captain America, yes. The atmosphere crackled with tension as Iron Man, consumed by a tempest of emotions, forcibly pushed Captain America away. The gravity of the revelations he had witnessed weighed heavily upon him, leaving him in a state of profound disbelief. In that moment, the bond between the two once inseparable comrades seemed to falter, as a fissure of betrayal threatened to fracture their unyielding connection. Amidst the palpable air of disillusionment, Spider-Man, who had placed himself in the path of Iron Man's turmoil, was met with a gaze that bore the weight of a thousand shattered trust. The hero's heart sank at the sight of that look, as the innocent belief in his friend was now marred by the shadows of doubt and suspicion. Iron Man, why? In a breathtaking display of power and finesse, Iron Man delivered a swift backhand strike to Captain America's visage, propelling the righteous leader through the air with remarkable force. With unrivaled precision, Iron Man pivoted, his focus now trained on the youthful hero, Spider-Man. A potent burst of energy erupted from his repulsor gauntlets, coursing through the air with blistering speed toward the unsuspecting Spider-Man, who found himself careening into one of the metallic containers, the impact sending tremors through the surrounding structure. Spider-Man, shakes his head and focuses Tony. Stop. Iron Man's calculated precision took center stage as he unleashed a well-timed shot, shattering Bucky's rifle into fragmented remnants. In a swift display of mastery over his suit's capabilities, the Avenger effortlessly nullified Bucky's attempt to retaliate, grasping the Winter Soldier's incoming punch with an almost casual ease. Dark Winter Solid Number 1, When Do We Strike? Zemo, let them fight among themselves when they are most tired, you all attack. In the labyrinthine darkness of the room, shadows played a silent witness to the imminent clash of forces, concealed with a strategical precision befitting the clandestine nature of their intentions. Like coiled serpents awaiting the opportune moment to strike, the enigmatic soldiers lingered, their presence veiled in the obscurity of their surroundings, poised to pounce upon unsuspecting prey. In this clash of titans, the symphony of strength and skill unfolded in an intricate dance of combat. Iron Man, encased in his resplendent armor, engaged in a relentless struggle with the Winter Soldier, the sound of their blows echoing through the chamber. The dance of conflict ebbed and flowed, as they grappled with the formidable might of each other's resolve. The resounding thud of iron meeting ground marked Iron Man's decisive maneuver, deftly taking his adversary to the skies and plummeting him with unyielding force upon the ground. Yet, Captain America, ever vigilant, sees the moment to intervene hurtling towards the armored Avenger with unyielding valor, aiming to curtail the ongoing skirmish. In the face of this orchestrated tussle, the brilliance of Iron Man's technology harmonized with the indomitable strength of the super-soldier, forging a symphony of strength and artifice. The battlefront became a canvas upon which history etched its saga, their clashing ideologies and allegiances illuminating the twilight of conviction. However, fate conspired to interlace its hand, as a twist of intervention emerged from the webbed enigma known as Spider-Man. With uncanny agility and dexterity, the arachnid hero shot forth his web lines to redirect the course of calamity. A lethal missile's trajectory was averted, veering away from its intended target, resulting in a cascade of domino effects, prompting debris to descend from the heavens. 
In this cacophony of collapsing infrastructure, Spider-Man, the virtuoso of quick thinking, intervened with swiftness. With skillful finesse, he ensnared the falling remnants with his webbing, orchestrating a symphony of saviors, staving off the impending avalanche of destruction. The room quivered with uncertainty, but the young hero's deft hands, like a conductor's wand, directed the course of chaos. Spider-Man, I'm not having another building fall on me again. Spider-Man noticed Captain America breaking free and urgently shouted at Bucky. Captain America, get out of here. With the emergency exit slowly opening, Bucky wasted no time and ran for his life, his heart pounding with adrenaline. He found himself in a room dominated by a massive missile, and his eyes scanned for any means of escape. Spotting the towering gate above the missile, he knew that could be his way out. Without hesitation, he triggered the emergency opening mechanism. Meanwhile, in the adjacent room, Captain America stood resolute, determined to reason with Iron Man and stop the conflict from escalating any further. Captain America, it wasn't him, Tony. Hydra had control of his mind. Iron Man, move. Spider-Man, just think about it. Do you think he would actually do that if someone wasn't controlling his brain? Iron Man, I don't care. Captain America, it wasn't him. In a display of swift and calculated action, Spider-Man intervened just as Iron Man was about to confront Captain America. With impeccable timing, he grabbed Iron Man by the leg mid-flight, expertly maneuvering to bring him crashing down to the ground. Utilizing his stinger, Spider-Man deftly pierced and disabled Iron Man's left jet boot, momentarily grounding the armored Avenger. Spider-Man, please, I don't want to hurt you. Amidst the fervent pleas of Spider-Man, Iron Man remained steadfast in his resolve, the pain of betrayal etched across his face. Utilizing the sole operational jet boot, he lunged forward with unyielding determination, forcing Spider-Man into the room where Bucky was attempting his escape. In an act of formidable force, Iron Man hurled Spider-Man across the chamber, the impact echoing through the space. As Captain America pressed on, seeking to intervene, Iron Man, driven by his conflicted emotions, summoned his laser to obstruct his path. Despite the hindered state of his jet boots, Iron Man continued his pursuit of Bucky, but his movements were compromised. In an attempt to impede him, Spider-Man fearlessly tackled Iron Man, driving him into the wall. The intensity of their confrontation mirrored the turmoil within their hearts, leaving the room charged with an aura of uncertainty. Spider-Man, charges of any blast fucking stop. There are bigger threats around here. This isn't important. Iron Man, it is to me. In a tangle of conflicting emotions and physical struggles, Iron Man's firm grip locked onto Spider-Man's arm, directing it upward in a compelling stance. Winter Soldier, ag. Spider-Man turned around and his eyes widen. Spider-Man, Bucky. In a timely twist of fate, Bucky found salvation in the stalwart grip of Captain America, who swooped in to catch him just as he teetered perilously close to the precipice of a potentially fatal fall. With swift precision, Captain steadied his comrade, positioning him securely on the precipice, his heart heavy with concern for his friend's well-being. Meanwhile, Spider-Man, displaying agile acumen and quick thinking, skillfully engaged Iron Man in a high-stakes stance of distraction. Each move and gesture became a calculated gambit to divert Iron Man's attention from the unfolding drama on the precipice. Captain America, Bucky, don't go to sleep. We need to go. Gently slaps Bucky on the face. Winter Soldier, Adrenaline Shock Ha! Huh? What? Captain America, we need to go. Carito, will keep him distracted. In the midst of the tumultuous clash between Spider-Man and Iron Man, it became evident that the web-slinger's internal conflict was manifesting in his actions. His reluctance to unleash his full potential against his cherished ally granted the armored Avenger a slight advantage, tilting the scales in his favor. In a swift maneuver, Iron Man seized Spider-Man by the visage, delivering a devastating knee strike that left one of the spider's lenses shattered. The ensuing force propelled the hero against a rugged wall, momentarily staggering him. Meanwhile, Bucky, with his escape seemingly within grasp, faced an unforeseen obstacle as the gate he sought refuge in abruptly slammed shut. A surge of frustration coursed through him as he found himself trapped once more within the labyrinthine Hydra base. In an unwavering determination to confront his destiny, he pressed onward, only to be confronted by the relentless Iron Man, poised to thwart his escape. Undeterred, the soldier wielded a makeshift metal pipe as he evaded Iron Man's attacks, delivering retaliatory strikes with deft precision. However, his weapon proved no match for Iron Man's swift disarmament, and soon, the soldier found himself ensnared in the vice-like grip of a chokehold, a symbol of his seemingly inescapable predicament. Iron Man, whisper do you even remember them? Winter Soldier, 
I remember all of them. Iron Man leapt and started free-falling with Bucky in his arms until Spider-Man and Captain America got on him. Spider-Man grabbed Bucky and threw him to one of the steps that were hanging from the side of the walls as they crashed to the floor, making all three of them disperse. Spider-Man stood up and he looked behind him as snow entered the gaps from the pillars holding the building. He looks at Iron Man who also recovered from the fall and glares at Spider-Man. Captain America then joins Spider-Man's side. Spider-Man, Tony, this isn't going to change anything. Iron Man, I don't care. He killed my mum. Spider-Man, so could I, if I didn't take back control of the suit. I tease the same thing. I was being controlled. I did not want to hurt any of you. I could have killed you all. Iron Man, it's not the same as killing one's parents. With the grace of a masterful dance, Iron Man surged forward, propelling himself like a comet towards Spider-Man, who deftly met the forceful attack with a front kick, propelling him through a wall and into the open air. In seamless transition, Iron Man spun on his axis, engaging Captain America in a kinetic exchange of blows. Their movements, almost like poetry in motion, echo their years of honed combat skills. Captain America, ever the tactician, sought to gain the upper hand by attempting a chokehold. However, Iron Man, leveraging the power of his blaster, skillfully propelled both combatants into the air, forcing Cap to relinquish his hold and crash to the ground below. In the blink of an eye, Iron Man seized the opportunity, positioning himself atop the fallen captain, initiating a relentless ground and pound assault. The resounding impact of each blow reverberated in the chamber as Cap gritted his teeth, enduring the onslaught. Yet, amidst the chaos, Bucky, who had been nursing his own injuries, witnessed this lopsided battle with an unwavering determination. His eyes fixed upon Captain America's iconic shield, resting nearby, a powerful symbol of his friend's legacy and prowess. Summoning his strength, he rose to his feet and made his way toward the shield. However, before he could intervene, Spider-Man re-emerged, his determination eclipsing the pain he had endured. Initially poised to deliver a formidable hammer fist, the spider's focus shifted as he heard Bucky's call. With a seamless fluidity of motion, Spider-Man caught Cap's shield, a weapon of immense power and history. Swiftly, he delivered a forceful strike to Iron Man's back, compelling him to relinquish his hold on Captain America. In unison, Cap and Spider-Man engaged in a seamless display of teamwork, exploiting Iron Man's momentary vulnerability. They launched into the relentless barrage of coordinated attacks, each blow amplifying the impact of the other, leaving Iron Man disoriented and overwhelmed by their combined might. The display of tactical coordination and unyielding camaraderie left an indelible mark on the battlefield. In a breathtaking display of reflexes and combat prowess, Iron Man demonstrated unparalleled speed as he evaded Captain America's advance with a deftly timed blast, sending the super soldier hurtling backward. Meanwhile, his focus shifted with unerring precision to Spider-Man, engaging the arachnid hero in a series of lightning-quick exchanges. Spider-Man's agility was a marvel to behold, countering Iron Man's punches with uncanny precision, delivering an open-palm strike infused with venomous energy that sent the armored Avenger crashing into a wall. The rhythmic dance of combat continued, Spider-Man's fists becoming a blur of motion as he unleashed a relentless barrage upon Iron Man. However, just as the momentum appeared to favor Spider-Man, a twist of fate altered the course of the battle. Iron Man skillfully seized the opportunity, countering Spider-Man's assault with a well-timed knee to the groin, followed by a powerful blast, propelling the web slinger into an unyielding wall. With the situation teetering on a precipice, Bucky intervened, deftly catching Iron Man and altering the trajectory of his blast, preventing further harm to Spider-Man. Spider-Man, A.C.K. Not cool, fuck. In a desperate bid to turn the tide of the grueling battle, Bucky unleashed an unprecedented surge of strength, pummeling Iron Man with a fierce barrage of punches that drove the armored Avenger backward, his back colliding forcefully with the unyielding wall. With an intensity born of desperation, Bucky sought to exploit any vulnerability, his hands frantically reaching for Iron Man's core in an audacious attempt to dismantle the formidable armor. Spider-Man, recovering from the punishing impact, rose to his feet with a gasp, his gaze transfixed on the unfolding scene. The young hero recognized the gravity of Bucky's audacious move, understanding that it represented a last-ditch effort to bring down their formidable opponent. Spider-Man, no. Stop. In a breathtaking display of agility, Spider-Man harnessed the power of his lateral repulsion to traverse the distance between Bucky and Iron Man with unparalleled speed. In a deft move, he deflected the potential danger, saving Bucky from the perilous encounter. However, in the aftermath of his heroic act, an unsettling sensation gnawed at Spider-Man's chest, leaving him momentarily disoriented and unnerved. 
as if suspended in time. The onlookers stood frozen, their minds struggling to comprehend the gravity of the situation. The air seemed heavy with a profound sense of disbelief, as if reality itself had momentarily faltered under the weight of the unforeseen event. The slow motion spectacle had etched itself into their memory. Breaking the silence, a collective gasp echoed through the room, shattering the trance like state. The shock on their faces was palpable, their emotions tumultuous and raw. Yet, amidst the chaos, the resounding thud of a body hitting the floor provided a stark reminder of the perilous consequences that lurked within the chaos of the battle. Without hesitation, Captain America and Iron Man sprang into action, each propelled by concern for their fallen comrade. Iron Man, with a sense of urgency, gently cradled Carito's body, his suit emitting a dim glow, encapsulating a somber moment of realization and panic. Iron Man, oh my god, Carito, D don't do anything, please. I can't lose you. Spider-Man, W what? Happened? Captain America, why you got shot? Voice was shaking. Spider-Man, oh, oh, it's not like I haven't been shot before, right? Iron Man was close to having a breakdown Yeah, You have survived many impossible things, all right? You can survive this. Spider-Man, too. NY. Did the arc blast worked? I upgraded it, so you could beat enemies faster. Iron Man starts to cry why yeah, it worked, too w well. Spider-Man, I, tried, my best, to stop everyone, from fighting. I was afraid, I would lose my friends. I love you guys. If it wasn't for, everyone, I wouldn't, know where I would, be right. Now. Captain America, clenched his fist you, you're a good friend. More than anyone could have asked for. Winter Soldier, W.Y., why did you do that? Spider-Man, Bucky, H. Hey. It's so, good to see you. Winter Soldier, please. Don't die, please. Dark Winter Soldier number one. Wow, I did not expect that kind of outcome. Warning, from here there will be scenes that the reader may find disturbing. You've been advised. In an intense moment of anticipation, the three valiant heroes pivoted their attention toward the source of the ominous voice, only to behold a haunting sight. Five super soldiers, enshrouded in an eerie dark aura, emerged from the shadows with an unwavering determination, their malevolence palpable in the charged air. The heroes found themselves at a precipice of shock, their composure momentarily shaken by the unexpected emergence of this formidable enemy. Iron Man, why you? You waited until Carito was down? Dark Winter Soldier number one, yeah, the idea was to kill you all while you were tired but to think you would blast a hole through your own friend. That's harsh. Winter Soldier, fuck you. In a burst of audacious valor, Bucky hastened his advance toward the nearest dark entity, identified as DWS No. 1 Dark Winter Soldier 1. With determined focus, he unleashed a resolute punch, channeling the formidable strength of his robotic arm into a direct blow upon his adversary's countenance. Yet, to his profound surprise, the strike yielded no impact whatsoever, it seemed as though DWS No. 1's visage remained impervious to the forceful assault. An unsettling revelation met with a sly grin on the dark soldier's face. DWS number one, this is gonna be easy, you killed your last hope of escaping here alive. With ruthless efficiency, the nefarious soldier nonchalantly exerted a measured force, propelling Bucky with an unrestrained push, hurtling him with alarming velocity towards an unforgiving wall. The impact was a visceral spectacle, a collision that echoed with ferocity, leaving Bucky momentarily ensnared in the clutches of insensibility. Captain America, Bucky. Shit. No, not another friend. In the midst of this dire confrontation, the heroes found themselves pitted against an overwhelming force of dark soldiers, their formidable powers manifesting with an ominous intensity. As Captain America valiantly hurled his iconic shield towards DWS No. 4, the adversary deftly intercepted the projectile, returning it with an astonishing force that forced Captain Nimbly evade its path, the shield finding its formidable home embedded in the unyielding wall. Iron Man, with characteristic daring, propelled himself toward DWS No. 2, but was swiftly met with a devastating axed kick, a shattering blow that sent him reeling to the unforgiving ground, his helmet rattled and near fracture. Subdued by the relentless onslaught, he found himself ensnared in the merciless grip of two sinister soldiers, their malicious amusement evident as they callously pummeled him, inflicting a torrent of pain that seemed to expose the very vulnerabilities of his armor. The once formidable hero, Tony Stark, cried out in agony as his defenses were brutally dismantled, 
his bloodied form left vulnerable to the malevolent laughter of his assailants. Even Captain America, the embodiment of resilience and unwavering determination, could not withstand the torrential onslaught of these dark adversaries. Despite his gallant attempts to stand his ground, he was outnumbered and outmatched, his unwavering spirit being subject to a torrent of ruthless blows. In the face of this uneven contest, Cap was tossed around like a mere plaything, his unyielding will the sole bastion against the relentless tide of malevolence. DWS number 3, you really don't give up do you? Catches Cap's punch and uppercuts him. Captain America, falls to the ground as he spits out blood eye. Can do this, all day. DWS number 5, don't think so soccer kicks him in the face. Captain America, NGH. DWS number 6, I'll finish off, Bucky Barnes. Captain America, no. Gets backhanded in the face UCK. In this macabre tableau of torment, DWS number 6 stalked her way towards the reawakening Bucky, whose eyes opened only to be greeted by a vicious blow to his already battered countenance. With nary a moment to gather his bearings, the relentless assault upon him commenced, as though he were naught but a hapless pawn in a sadistic game. Bucky, grappling with the remnants of consciousness, sought to mount a defense, but his valiant efforts were futile against the overwhelming onslaught. A tormentor with a sinister demeanor, DWS number 6 reveled in her cruel power, subjecting Bucky to a relentless barrage of strikes, each delivered with a malevolent precision that left him vulnerable and disoriented. His attempts to retaliate were swiftly and ruthlessly quashed, his body forcibly propelled to the ground, forcing him to curl protectively around his vital regions. Yet, the depths of this malevolence seemed boundless, as she singled out Bucky's metal appendage, an emblem of his past life. With a sadistic glee that bordered on the depraved, she took hold of the metal arm, summoning a strength beyond comprehension to wrench it from its socket. As cries of anguish echoed through the chamber, a cacophony of sickening sounds accompanied the grisly spectacle, the sickening crack of metal being torn asunder, the visceral spray of blood upon the floor, and the tortured screams of a man subjected to unimaginable agony. Spider-Man, no. Due to the player's unrelenting will, he was able to survive the fatal blow. Spider-Man, no. No. The player's mental condition is violently deteriorating. Spider-Man, no. 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 Warning. Warning. The player's sanity is being affected. Spider-Man, no iota. Iota iota. Adjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjjj
A hush settles upon the room, as through the very air held its breath in awe. The once unstoppable adversaries now stood frozen in the presence of this awe-inspiring metamorphosis. An aura of incipient intimidation emanated from the enigmatic hero who surveyed the room with an inscrutable gaze. Silent tension filled the air, as everyone bore witness to this extraordinary transformation. Suddenly, a surreal sight manifested, the appearance of a mouth-like formation that graced Spider-Man's visage, contorting into a smile that appeared both cryptic and unsettling. Buzzica Spider-Man and Toxin, your next stop is gonna be hell. But first I'm gonna eat you savagely and spit out your bones. In the tumultuous crescendo of this harrowing confrontation, Spider-Man's fury was unleashed with unparalleled intensity. As if transcending the very constraints of time and space, he surged forward with astonishing alacrity, defying perception itself. In a display of astonishing dexterity, his hands and sinewy tentacles became a blur, ensnaring all five dark winter soldiers and propelling them forcefully against the unyielding wall. The cacophonous reverberations echoed through the chamber as Spider-Man descended upon DWS number 2 with relentless ferocity, his blows resonating with inescapable impact. The remaining adversaries sought to seize an opportunity to escape, their minds aflame with desperation, yet met with the ineluctable grip of the spider's resolute tenacity. But amidst the chaos, a sinister glow emanated from one of the dark winter soldiers, as an infernal incandescence engulfed her hand, ablaze with nefarious energies. Undeterred, Spider-Man turned his attention to her, a feral growl escaping his lips as he confronted her dark powers with an aura of his own. A resonant pulse reverberated through the room as Spider-Man unleashed a powerful web shot, ensnaring the defiant adversary, her struggles for freedom silenced in a painful immobilization. Drawing near, his visage emanating a menacing intensity, he charged a venom-infused punch, the very air crackling with energy. With an earth-shattering impact, the strike tore through the Winter Soldier's defenses, leaving her shattered form gasping for breath. The aftermath of this cataclysmic blow yielded a dissonant stillness, a breathless moment of realization. In a surreal display, Spider-Man's countenance seemed to morph, an enigmatic more forming, exuding a sense of primal foreboding. An act both ghastly and surreal, the spider commenced an inexplicable devouring of the fallen soldier's remains, an act of macabre symbolism that seemed to transcend mortal norms. What once was flesh and bone, now lay reduced to mere remnants, discarded by the malevolent force that stood in his stead. Buzzica Spider-Man and Toxin, roars demonically. In the face of their collective fury, the four remaining soldiers converged upon Spider-Man with cries of unrestrained wrath. Yet, their concerted assault proved woefully inadequate, akin to a tempest against an impregnable fortress. With unrivaled acumen, Spider-Man evaded their onslaught with preternatural ease, an eerie semblance of a malevolent dance, accentuated by an unnerving laughter that resonated with a maddening cadence. In a macabre display of control and power, the symbiotic Spider-Man seemed to take solace in this bloodthirsty spectacle, relishing the chaos and discord he wrought upon his adversaries. The symbiote traveled in its newfound freedom, a cruel puppeteer that orchestrated the symphony of violence. As their blows met empty air or glanced off a seemingly inviolable defense, frustration gave way to fear in the eyes of the dark winter soldiers. They had unwittingly unleashed a monster, a force of darkness that found perverse pleasure in their anguish. Amidst the tumultuous fray, a tendril, like a dagger from the abyss, pierced DWS number no. 4's chest, extinguishing the light of life in an instant. His breath became shallow and labored as his gaze descended upon the harrowing sight before him, a menacing spike, now a symbol of his own mortality, jutting through his very heart. Buzzica Spider-Man and Toxin, that definitely took your breath away. Ha 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 ha. In a display of macabre dominance, Spider-Man summoned the hapless soldier toward him, akin to a puppeteer drawing strings. The darkened figure was drawn into the inexorable embrace of the symbiote, a malevolent dance of possession and demise unfolding before our eyes. As the unfortunate soldier met his fate, he was engulfed entirely within the voracious abyss of the symbiotic entity. In the ensuing moments, the air was fraught with the eerie symphony of disquieting sounds, a haunting amalgamation of crushing, squelching, and vibrations that reverberated through the very core of the room. The enigmatic Spider-Man, gripped by an insatiable, predatory force, visibly wrestled with the magnitude of this macabre act. His visage betrayed a disturbing mix of exultation and revulsion, like a fallen angel straddling a thin line between gratification and a moral conflict. Ultimately, the dark remains of the consumed soldier were expelled from the maw of the symbiote, unceremoniously discarded yet still bearing the macabre vestiges of the grim encounter.
It was an unsettling sight, the remnants of a once formidable adversary, now reduced to nothing more than lifeless, flesh-adorned fragments, cast aside by an insatiable force that appeared both malevolent and unstoppable. Berserker Spider-Man and Toxin, why so serious? Ha 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 he ha ha he. Amidst the gruesome tableau, an eerie stillness took hold as the three remaining Dark Winter soldiers stood in the presence of an entity that transcended their wildest nightmares. Terror seemed to cascade through their veins like a chilling stream, their hardened resolve now reduced to an inconsequential flicker before the overwhelming darkness that confronted them. In the face of this incomprehensible horror, their collective instinct for survival battled with the haunting memory of the spider's supernatural prowess, the terrifying demonstration of supernatural speed that allowed him to snatch them all at once, as if they were but mere playthings. Undeterred by the odds, their fear stricken minds struggled to conjure a glimmer of hope. Perhaps they could still resist this monstrosity, for they had weapons, and in a final act of desperation, they drew forth their arsenal of guns, the tools that once empowered them, now an attempt to face the nightmarish creature that stood before them. Berserker Spider-Man and Toxin, oh, so you also have Inventor? The tempest of explosive bullets inundated the enigmatic entity known as the Spider, ensnaring him within a cacophony of violent detonations. Each lethal round sought to disintegrate the very essence of the darkness that had enveloped him. As the deafening chorus of destruction subsided, the air grew heavy with anticipation, the soldiers cautiously stepping forward to survey the aftermath of their relentless assault. Within the heart of the desolate crater created by the malevolent munitions, their eyes fell upon the remnants of the once formidable spider. The eerie silence that followed the storm of bullets gave way to an unsettling sense of unease, for within the darkened husk of the entity, an ominous presence lingered a force unyielding and insatiable. Just as they dared to hope for a glimpse of victory, a swift, decisive stroke of a sword cleaved through their momentary relief. In a horrifying spectacle, DWS No. 3's body was severed in two, a grotesque cascade of organs and life force staining the ground in crimson. In the face of this gruesome tableau, the soldiers recoiled, their instincts betraying them as terror cascaded through their ranks. What they had thought to be a lifeless shell now revealed itself as a malevolence reinvigorated, a darkness that thrived on the violent spectacle that had unfolded. The spider's eerie demeanor offered no remorse, no respite from the horror it had wrought. As the soldiers stood ensnared within the clutches of an unyielding abyss, they became mere spectators to the ghastly fate that awaited them. The chilling image of the symbiotic entity licking its lips, an unnerving gesture that seemed to savor the macabre display, left no room for doubt. This was no longer their world. The boundaries that had once defined hero and villain, life and death, were now blurred beyond recognition. The embodiment of vengeance incarnate now stood before them, and in its wake, a chilling realization took hold. Their defiance had only invited a malevolent force that thrived on their terror. Berserker Spider-Man and Toxin, that tickled. With an eerie calm, Spider-Man's lithe form moved with lethal intent. A web, spun with otherworldly precision, ensnared DWS No. 2's face, effortlessly tearing it from its host. As the soldiers' agonized cries faded into the abyss, the arachnid enigma captured the severed head with an almost detached fascination. A surreal tableau unfolded as the symbiotic spider allowed the ghastly trophy to linger in his hands, its lifeless eyes gazing vacantly into the void. The macabre spectacle seemed to epitomize the unholy union of man and malevolence, a haunting visage that bore witness to the very depths of terror. In a display that defied all mortal comprehension, Spider-Man consumed the severed head with an eerie reverence. His unhurried movements exuded an eerie tranquility, as if savoring every grotesque detail of the grim feast. A flicker of a primal grin betrayed the inscrutable pleasure he derived from the morbid act, as he relished the potency of fear that now gripped his adversaries. In a chillingly deliberate manner, he expelled the skull from his maw, its bony remnants clattering to the ground. The sound echoed like a mournful cry, a requiem for the fallen. As he closed the distance to the last dark winter soldier, the eerie silence that enveloped him seemed to amplify the palpable dread that radiated from his prey. The soldier, trembling and pale, found himself paralyzed by a primordial fear, his very essence consumed by a malevolence that stood before him, an entity that now seemed a harbinger of his own demise. As the final moments of his life loomed before him, he could only bear witness to the manifestation of terror incarnate, the enigmatic figure that had transcended the boundaries of humanity, becoming a living embodiment of dread. Dark Winter Soldier Number 1, W What Are You? Berserker Spider-Man and Toxin, the last thing you'll ever see is I beat you with your comrade's skull. The relentless onslaught continued unabated as Spider-Man's web wrapped around the Dark Winter Soldier's chest, mercilessly hurling him into the unforgiving wall. Closing in on his prey, 
The symbiotic arachnid tightened his grip on the severed head, a gruesome makeshift weapon in his malevolent hands. The symphony of violence and agony that followed was an infernal crescendo, a cacophony of shattering bones, splattering fluids, and guttural gasps. Each brutal strike echoed through the corridors of the Hydra base like thunder, as Spider-Man unleashed a torrent of unfathomable force upon his hapless foe. The grim tableau unfolded in a grotesque dance of destruction, punctuated by the dissonant notes of deranged laughter. The very fabric of reality seemed to tremble under the weight of the savage spectacle, a dance of darkness and despair, where every strike was like the blast of a shotgun, reverberating through the trembling walls. Minutes passed like hours as the relentless assault persisted, the once formidable foe now reduced to a mangled and unrecognizable pulp. A macabre dance of death, accompanied by the haunting rhythm of the spider's malevolent laughter. Yet, amidst the turmoil of chaos and carnage, a pall of silence fell upon the room, a disconcerting hush that lingered like a premonition of doom. The relentless predator turned his blood-streaked gaze towards the stunned faces of Captain America and his fellow comrades, their expressions a tapestry of horror and disbelief. Captain America, K. Carito. With a primal ferocity that seemed almost otherworldly, Spider-Man surged forward like an unstoppable force of nature. His steps reverberated with a haunting intensity, each stride propelling him toward Captain America with inexorable determination. A blur of motion, he lashed out, his fist colliding with the revered shield, sending the once indomitable hero hurtling into a wall. His defiance shattered in an instant. Bucky, overwhelmed by the surreal spectacle before him, reacted with desperate instinct, but his efforts were futile against the preternatural might of Spider-Man. With an ominous display of power, a colossal fist emerged from the darkness, pummeling Bucky with brutal force, leaving him sprawled and dazed upon the floor. Iron Man, clad in the remnants of his armor, fired his blasters in a last-ditch attempt to quell the encroaching terror, but it was as though his efforts were a mere whisper in the tempest. The impact barely caused Spider-Man to flinch, and with a neary lack of urgency, he turned his unyielding gaze upon the armored Avenger. Iron Man, K. Carito. Wait. It's me, Tony. Don't you remember? In this harrowing confrontation, the once heroic Spider-Man had become a nightmarish embodiment of darkness, his malevolent power eclipsing all reason and restraint. Iron Man, in the throes of excruciating agony, found himself ensnared in the merciless grip of the transformed hero, his armored arm shattered by the overwhelming force. As the tension escalated, Captain America, driven by a desperate courage, lunged at Spider-Man, brandishing his shield as both weapon and shield. In a flurry of strikes, he sought to reclaim his ally from the grip of darkness. However, the malevolent aura surrounding Spider-Man had made him a formidable adversary, his entire form morphing into a treacherous array of deadly spikes. With uncanny precision, the lethal spikes found their mark, piercing Captain America's body, although by fortune, avoiding any mortal wounds. Struggling to maintain his footing, the soldier faltered and fell, his face bruised and bloodied by the merciless assault. Yet, the dark tides of the encounter were far from subsiding. With a chilling sense of purpose, Spider-Man seized Captain America's iconic shield, the symbol of hope and justice. In an unnerving twist of fate, he now wielded the sacred object as an instrument of malevolence. Captain America, I'm sorry. My friend. I'll see you on the other side. Berserker Spider-Man and Toxin. Amidst the relentless fury and chaos that enveloped the scene, a profound transformation was unfolding within Carito. As the dark influence waned, the floodgates of his memories were unlocked, and a torrent of cherished recollections came rushing back with an emotional force that threatened to overwhelm him. Each memory was a precious fragment of time spent with his comrades, his friends, his family and this world he had come to embrace. The camaraderie shared with Steve, their visits to museums, heartfelt conversations, and unwavering support, Carito was reminded of the true essence of friendship and the bond they had forged. The lessons imparted by Tony, the unwavering friendship that stood the test of time, and the shared secrets that cemented their trust, Carito felt an overwhelming gratitude and a deep yearning to express his appreciation for Tony's unwavering companionship. Natasha, the bringer of laughter and joy, the one who lifted spirits with her humor and wit, Carito longed to mend the rift that had formed between them, yearning for the camaraderie they once shared, and vowing to make amends. Thor, the storyteller whose tales ignited the imagination and bound them together in moments of mirth and adventure. Carito recalled the carefree days of revelry and laughter, cherishing those precious moments of connection. Bruce, the introverted friend with whom he found solace in shared interests and the gentle touch that calmed the turbulent storm within the Hulk, Carito treasured their deep conversations and quiet understanding. 
Clint, the cherished archer and companion in mischief, a true brother in arms, Carito felt the warmth of their bond, the unbreakable trust, and the lengths he would go to bring happiness to Clint's life. Vision, the inquisitive android who posed questions that probed the depths of existence, Carito recalled the intellectual exchanges, valuing the knowledge and guidance Vision provided. The Maximoff twins, Pietro and Wanda, akin to siblings who added color and vibrancy to his life, Carito fondly remembered their playful pranks and the closeness that bordered on familial ties. As the memories flooded his consciousness, a sense of longing and remorse washed over Carito, realizing that these bonds were fractured by the darkness that had consumed him. The tragedy of their rift weighed heavily on his heart, and he yearned to heal the wounds and reclaim the connections that had defined his journey. Yet, in the wake of this emotional turmoil, Carito found himself engulfed in a newfound power, one born of the symbiotic transformation he had undergone. And though the darkness had driven him to the brink, a glimmer of his former self emerged, a flicker of the friend, the ally, the hero he once was. As the echoes of his past mingled with the present turmoil, Carito stood before his comrades, a complex tapestry of emotions etched upon his face. The battle raged on, but within him, a battle of a different kind unfolded, a struggle to reconcile the darkness that had tainted his soul and the memories of friendship that now beckoned him back to the light. Berserker Spider-Man and Toxin, NGHHH, Stoop. An abrupt and unexpected disruption swept through Spider-Man's consciousness like a tempest, tearing at the very fabric of his being. An intense migraine gripped his mind, a searing pain that seemed to rend his thoughts asunder, leaving him vulnerable and exposed. With a sharp cry of agony, he stumbled, faltering in his graceful movements, and fell to the side, clutching his head in an attempt to quell the torrent of anguish. Captain America, amidst the chaos, was not blind to the plight of his friend. Even in his damaged state, he slowly tilted his head towards his friend with worry etched into his visage. The tumultuous clash of hero and foe moment really forgotten. Cap's thoughts now shifted to the well-being of his ally, who seemed to be grappling with an unseen adversary of a different nature. Captain America, weekly Kansas... Raito. Berserker Spider-Man and Toxin, ha. Huh? In the aftermath of his tumultuous outburst, Spider-Man's once ferocious roars were silenced, replaced by ragged breaths that mirrored the turbulent storm within him. As his sanity slowly regained its grip, he found himself confronted by the haunting aftermath of his actions. The very fabric of his consciousness seemed woven with a tapestry of newly remembered memories, memories that bore witness to the unimaginable horrors he had inflicted upon his adversaries. The weight of his actions, like an oppressive burden, bore down upon him, threatening to crush his very spirit. He surveyed the devastation that now lay before him, a testament to the chaos he had wrought in the grip of his primal fury. A mixture of fright and repulsion took hold of his senses, and the sight of the carnage he had unleashed filled him with revulsion. The memories of consuming his adversaries, the grotesque and malevolent actions he had carried out, played in agonizing loops in his mind. The sheer horror of it all overwhelmed him, causing him to lose control, and he wretchedly vomited in response to the depths of depravity he had sunk to. Tears streamed down his masked face as he grappled with the enormity of his transgressions. The once courageous and valiant hero was now reduced to a shattered soul, haunted by the atrocities he could not undo. The realization of the lives he had taken and the darkness he had embraced bore heavily on his conscience, threatening to engulf him in an abyss of guilt and remorse. His body trembled as the weight of his actions manifested in a visceral panic attack. Cold sweat trickled down his brow, and his once vibrant complexion turned ashen under the weight of his emotions. The world around him blurred as his breath grew labored, and the walls of the Hydra base seemed to close in around him. Spider-Man, crying I am a monster. No. No. I'm a monster. I'm a monster. Captain America, weekly Kansas... Raito. Spider-Man, Steve. Oh God, did I do this? I'll heal you, I'll. Captain America, weekly I'll. Never. Hate. You. None. Of. Us. Will. So don't. Call yourself. A monster. We. All make. Mistakes. You just. Learn. And improve. Spider-Man, but. I'm so sorry. If only. Grabs a potion from his inventory. Captain America, it's. Fine. Drinks the potion and a green aura surrounds him thank God for those potions. I'll give it to the others. Spider-Man, okay. Gives him two more potions. In the aftermath of the intense battle, everyone's wounds were miraculously healed, but the absence of Bucky's arm brought a moment of sorrow. However, Carito reassured him, offering words of comfort and hope, reminding him that strength and resilience lie within. Winter Soldier, is the suit. 
gonna be a problem again? Spider-Man, actually, I feel stronger for some reason. I don't feel anything different mentally so that's good at least. Iron Man, that's a relief then, I don't ever wanna see you out of control again. In an unexpected display of emotion, Iron Man enveloped Carito in a warm, heartfelt embrace. Spider-Man, Tony? Iron Man, you gave me a scare, I'm relieved that you're fine now. Spider-Man, I'm glad man. As the embrace between Iron Man and Carito came to an end, a tension-filled gaze was directed towards Bucky, fraught with a mix of lingering anger and vengeance. However, in a moment of self-reflection, the stern expression softened into the resigned sigh. Iron Man's gaze seemed to carry the weight of a thousand thoughts and inner struggles, as if wrestling with the complexities of trust, forgiveness, and the blurry lines between heroism and villainy. Iron Man, I'm just gonna report that you'll escape. Captain America, why? Iron Man, because it's not like I can fight with most of my armor gone, also I'm mentally and emotionally tired. Spider-Man, sorry. Iron Man, you're forgiven. Now everyone go, before I change my mind. In a moment of somber reflection, as the three heroes stood together, poised to depart from the scene of their intense battle, an unspoken understanding seemed to pass between them. Iron Man's arm reached out, gently halting Captain America from retrieving his shield. Iron Man, that's my father's, and I intend to keep it. Captain America, throws the shield to the ground. As the trio began their solemn walk toward the elevator, each lost in their own thoughts and emotions, a resonant voice echoed through the speakers of the base, arresting their movements and drawing their attention back to the present. The announcement carried an air of authority, yet an underlying tone of revelation that sent a shiver down their spines. Speaker announcer, missile is about to be launched, coordinates marked. The USA. The explosion will wipe out half of the country. In a moment of audacious determination, the heroes halted in their tracks, their gazes riveted skyward as the ominous missile began its ascent into the heavens. Time seemed to slow as they collectively processed the imminent threat, their minds racing to devise a plan of action. However, before any coordinated response could be executed, a blur of crimson and blue streaked across their field of vision. Spider-Man, infused with an unparalleled sense of urgency, sprang into action without hesitation. A kinetic whirlwind of agile grace, he launched himself into the air, propelling himself with extraordinary precision toward the rapidly ascending missile. Like a celestial dancer, he elegantly latched onto the metallic surface, his spider-like grip finding purchase amidst the metallic sheen. Captain America, Carito. Winter Soldier, what are you doing? Iron Man, no, Carito. In a sudden and awe-inspiring arrival, the enigmatic figure of Black Panther materialized with a dignified poise amidst the tense atmosphere. Black Panther, I didn't stop Zemo in time. Iron Man, what do you mean? Black Panther, he had a gun in his hand and he was about to kill himself but I stopped him. What I didn't expect is him to press a button and activate a nuclear bomb. Spider-Man, everyone it is fine. I'll see you on the other side. Trust me. Amidst lingering doubts and apprehension, the assembly of heroes found themselves faced with a pivotal decision, to entrust their fate to the singular figure of Spider-Man. Though the gravity of the situation weighed heavily upon them, there existed an unspoken consensus that this enigmatic Webslinger held the key to their salvation. Kerry Topoff. Amidst the thinning oxygen, my mind raced, grappling with the urgent task at hand. I couldn't afford to falter, I had to stop this missile. The determination in my voice echoed a resolute promise to myself. Recalling Vision's teachings, I delved into my knowledge, searching for a way to disrupt the missile's trajectory. My hands swiftly found purchase on a panel, and with tenacity, I tore it open, my heart pounding in my chest. Gyroscopic and GPS systems. That's it. If I can alter its course, direct it away from populated areas, into the ocean, perhaps. The cold gnawed at my body, but I couldn't let it hinder me. Kane's skill offered me some relief, warming me just enough to endure this harsh environment. I continued my mission, fervently digging into the missile's innards until my heightened senses led me to the crucial components. There it was, the pivotal moment. I had to act swiftly, rely on my hacker skill to manipulate the missile's course, redirect it to safety, far away from any harm. With resolve, I propelled the missile to higher altitudes, pushing it towards the Pacific Ocean, a realm of vastness and isolation. The ocean seemed like the safest option, but the cost was immense. My heart sank as I braced for the unavoidable explosion. In an instant, I released my grasp, the missile soaring towards its new destination. 
The ensuing detonation reverberated for miles, consuming the surroundings. Within the chaos, I found myself ensnared by the blast. Pain and shock coursed through me, a testament to the sacrifice I had made. The last thing I saw was the mass destruction that went my way and engulfed me. And then, everything went dark. Chapter 27, The Last Hunt Part 1 Marvel DC, Images, Manhus, and every anime that will be mentioned and used in this story are not mine. They all belong to their respective owners. The main character carried to Josu Valdez and the story are mine. Warning, this chapter will be very violent and will contain disturbing content that the reader may find disturbing. You have been highly advised. Carrie Topoff. Huh? How long? The question lingers in my mind, lost amid the expanse of water surrounding me. Time has ceased to matter, days blend into one another as I swim endlessly, relying on the symbiote and my healing factor to numb the burning pain of my wounds. The aftermath of the explosion left me in a grotesque state, but I had no choice but to push forward. Swimming for survival, I lost count at 56 days. Buying food from the system's store and eating on water brought its own set of challenges, leaving me with persistent stomach aches. The irony of rest being disrupted by waves and sea creatures, all while my spider sense keeps me alert, adds to the torment. The monotony of my routine leaves me yearning for escape. Sleep evades me amidst the waves and creatures, and a proper shower feels like a distant memory. Grateful for the store's water bottles, I manage to maintain dental hygiene, a small victory amidst the hardships. To combat the encroaching boredom, I find solace in conversation with Toxin. Bonding with the symbiote, even amidst the incessant questioning, keeps me tethered to sanity. I've gained full control of the symbiote suit, though I must remain vigilant to prevent emotional outbursts from unleashing its mindless rampage. Gara, a constant presence in this sea-bound ordeal, has been instrumental in maintaining some semblance of structure. Annoying as the routine may be, it's a lifeline to hold on to. Perhaps I should have sought her guidance earlier but such clarity eluded me amidst the struggle. In this desolate expanse, I seek to hold on to any semblance of normalcy, the smallest comforts that remind me of the world I once knew. And so, with renewed determination, I reach out to Kara, seeking her guidance and an answer to the elusive question that haunts me, how long have I been adrift at sea? Carito, hey you, Kara? Yes, player. Carito, how long have I been in the sea swimming like a dog? It took you three and a half months to finally ask that? You're a terrible master to Peter Parker, it's a good thing you left him some holographic training with him before disappearing completely. Carito, yeah, I got the idea from the Miles Morales game. Where Peter left Miles some training simulations. You aren't a complete lost cause then. Carito, what is that supposed to mean? Nothing to worry about. Carito, Sai so how much time do I have until I reach Hawaii? Another month, calculated on your current progress. Carito, it's because I keep stopping whenever I eat and barely 30 minute naps? Yes. Carito, may. I do have a large amount of stamina but because I'm sleep deprived I can barely even function properly. You have a huge disadvantage right now. You are extremely tired mentally and physically, you look even skinnier by how you aren't even digesting the food properly. Carito, I'm not digesting it properly? Try having your stomach rocked constantly with food inside and you'll understand my pain. If only you picked a species that can survive or doesn't need to eat constantly as a human does. Carito, maybe when I'm finished with this reality I can pick something else. You did tell me that there's a system called builds. Correct. The builds program is precisely what you think. Think of it like Destiny 2, with warlock builds, hunter builds and titan builds but infinite options. In your case, you can choose another character to get powers from. Carito, yeah, I'll think of something. I have a few already in mind when the switch happens. Whenever that is. You don't know if you'll take longer than necessary. Carito, I wanted to avoid that kind of thought and think that I will definitely be successful in this. Though, with how things are going, it's easier said than done. It is true that these last ducks have been unnecessarily stronger than could have been assumed. Characters who we think were weak are stronger with new abilities. You have been close to death a few times already. Carito, Ark. It sucks so much. Craven Puff. My mind is rage and glory. My heart is fire and pride. My body is grace and power. I am Craven off the man, an old man, now, though few would believe it. I was just a child when my parents came to my old world's Russia, shortly after the overthrow of the Tsar. That was some seventy odd years ago. There was no room in Russia for aristocrats. 
for culture, for honor, for human dignity. But all those things were bred into my bones, long before the Trotskys and Lenins dragged my homeland into the pits. Dignity, honor? In the many worlds, I have visited such qualities are missing. Many of them have followed Russia's sad example. If my parents have traveled with me to the dark dimensions and visited the multiverse, they would look upon this frightened, wounded animal called civilization white out recognition and with great fear and disgust, while some would make them look with a proud face due to the fact that each world is different. I am Craven the Hunter. I have found dignity, not in cities, but in the jungles. I have found honor, not in the civilized, but in the primal. I have found morality, I have found meaning in the hunt. But I cannot escape time forever. Herbs and roots and potions cannot rejuvenate a dying spirit or heal a heart crushed by the weight of what it is seen across the multiverse. I will die soon. I must die soon. But not yet. Time skip, one month. Carrie Topoff. I. Made it. I finally made IT to civilization. After four months of pure torture and agony and barely any rest, I was able to finally reach Hawaii. The sand. Finally the ground. I missed you. You should probably move, player. You're getting weird stares on the beach. Oh shit, right. I should look for food and a place to sleep for a year in. Recovering is essential right now. Wise choice. Rising gracefully from the sandy embrace of the shoreline, I found myself drawn to a quaint restaurant nestled along the beach. Seated in a serene ambience, I swiftly placed my order, opting for a delightful exploration of the culinary delights it had to offer. The menu, a cornucopia of flavors from diverse cultures, enticed my palate, and though the wait was somewhat protracted, my linguistic prowess facilitated seamless communication with the staff. As a seasoned traveler, having studied various languages from around the world, the art of conversation became a bridge connecting me effortlessly to the cultural tapestry surrounding me. A few minutes later. Ha 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 food go be ah ra 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 ra. Alas, my gastronomic ambitions proved too much for the establishment's culinary capacities, and I found myself unceremoniously escorted out and bestowed with the dubious honor of a banishment. Truly, I had not anticipated that my voracious appetite, compelled by the dual task of nourishing my own self and an enigmatic companion, would render such dramatic consequences. Yet, fortune favored my resourceful nature, and with a swift exchange of currencies courtesy of my well-stocked inventory. I managed to settle my culinary debts in the peculiar currency of Hawaii. One might deem this convenient, a boon bestowed upon intrepid travelers such as myself, who navigate the world's financial landscapes with relative ease. Now, as the delectable allure of various hotel accommodations beckons, I find myself not starved for sustenance but rather yearning for a different indulgence, rest, sleep, a seemingly elusive companion, relentlessly evades my grasp, and the pursuit of slumber has become an epic quest. The dire consequences of prolonged wakefulness upon my mental faculties are abundantly evident. Therefore, I shall retire with alacrity, to seek solace within the comforting embrace of a plush hotel bed. For in this realm, sleep deprivation reigns as the relentless tyrant, and I, a weary traveller, must surrender to its gentle yoke lest it siphon the very essence of my existence. The moon's gentle radiance painted the canvas of the night sky as I wandered, a weary traveller, seeking respite from my nomadic existence. My wandering eyes, blessed with perseverance, eventually chanced upon a humble establishment, a hotel, unassuming yet welcoming in its simplicity. Its walls held the stories of countless travelers, and tonight, I too would inscribe a chapter within its embrace. Once within the confines of my room, I luxuriated in the mundane luxury of a well-deserved shower, purging my weather-worn frame of the sea's lingering embrace. Oh, how the aquatic tendrils of the ocean had clung to me! a salty embrace that nearly lulled me into oblivion seven times over within the sanctum of the bathtub. Finally, clothed in nothing but the embrace of my undergarments, I surrendered myself to the beckoning allure of slumber. My body, an obedient supplicant, submitted to the sweet oblivion of sleep with alarming swiftness. In that tranquil state, I could almost pass for lifeless, for if any beholder were to cast their gaze upon me now, they might mistakenly assume that I had departed this realm altogether. A glimmer of concern lingered in my thoughts, for I yearned to return to New York, the city that called my name with irresistible allure. Yet, the spectre of wanted posters loomed, prompting me to impart my trusty symbiote, Toxin, with the task of obscuring my identity, a veil of anonymity to shield me from unwanted attention. Tomorrow, as dawn paints the sky with its gentle brush strokes, I shall venture to the airport and explore the possibility of clandestine passage. Yet, even as I close my eyes in slumber, a nagging thought nudges me, 
a flicker of uncertainty, a forgotten task whispering for my attention. Ah, but the weariness clouds my mind, and the elusive memory must relent for now, for slumber claims me in its tender grasp. Z z z z z z z z z z z z z No puff. In a sterile expanse veiled in pristine white, an enigmatic figure stood unabashedly exposed, the intensity etched upon his countenance and a resolute purpose animating his gaze. In this curious tableau, a silent symphony of arachnid denizens began to emerge, weaving their intricate webs of fate around the man, shrouding him in a tapestry of silk. Yet, as if guided by a frenetic force, he erupted forth from the heart of the Siri arachnid gathering, shattering the silken embrace, and embarked upon a surreal odyssey of consumption. The spiders, once enigmatic inhabitants of this space, now found themselves at the mercy of his insatiable appetite, their existence consumed as if by the ravenous maw of an all-consuming vortex. With each gnash and gulp, the fine line between lucidity and lunacy seemed to waver and blur, as his mind, besieged by enigmatic forces, found solace in conversation with itself. A dialogue of uncertainty and delirium echoed within his inner sanctum, reverberating through the corridors of his consciousness. Craven, the night. Within the confines of a somber hotel room, an unfortunate soul found himself ensnared within the tendrils of a nightmarish realm. Unseen forces seemed to grip his consciousness with relentless determination, molding the ethereal landscape of his dreams into a chilling tableau of terror. The room, once a sanctuary of tranquility, now bore witness to the disquieting spectacle that unfolded within the depths of his subconscious. As the night advanced, the man became ensnared within the clutches of a surreal nightmare, where the echo of one word reverberated with haunting insistence. No. No, 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 no. In this tormented reality, spectral hands, phantoms born of darkness, reached out to clutch his throat, constricting his very breath, leaving him grappling with a feeling of suffocating despair. The nightmare's malevolence bore down upon him, and he awoke with a primal scream, an outcry of terror born from the depths of his unconscious turmoil. Carito, no, starts hyperventilating NGH. Ah, dream, dream. It has to be a dream. No, a nightmare. Fuck. He wraps his hands around himself as he felt cold and wet. He felt things crawling all around him. Tonight. He couldn't breathe or move. He just felt the things crawl around him. Tonight. The hero saw a spider crawl on his hand and reacted by slamming his hand against a wall, killing it. Carito, near. What is wrong with me? Fuck. Two, night. The very essence of slumber which once courted Carito with an insistent embrace, now eluded him, eclipsed by the overpowering surge of adrenaline coursing through his veins. Within the confines of his being, a tempestuous storm raged, a symphony of emotions intertwining with the palpitations of his heart. The pressure within his chest intensified, as if his heart, unable to contain the intensity of his feelings, threatened to breach the confines of its mortal vessel. In an attempt to seek solace amidst the turmoil that now inhabited his psyche, Carito summoned the symbiotic entity. Swiftly, the two found symbiosis, and he adorned himself in his formidable suit, a carapace of power that enshrouded him with an aura of indomitable might. In the sanctuary of his apartment, he sought to quell the cacophony of emotions, yearning to clear his mind through the act of suiting up and embracing the persona of his alter ego. However, his expectations of respite were quickly shattered, for as he ventured into the nocturnal expanse, the world around him unveiled its own enigmatic tapestry. Spider-Man Puff. My head. Oh, it's throbbing like crazy, like a stampede of angry elephants having a party in there. What's happening to me? I feel so weird, like I'm gonna hurl any moment. Curling up into a ball seems so tempting right now, but I can't. I just can't. Wait, no. I have to keep moving, but why? Ugh, my brain feels like scrambled eggs. I've never felt sick after getting the detoxification skill, so why now? It's all so confusing. This chill down my spine is creeping me out, and my stomach is doing somersaults. But I can't let weakness take over, right? I have to figure this out. But my head is like a jungle full of chaos and mystery, and I can't make sense of it. The drums in my head are driving me nuts, and I can't find any relief. But no, I won't give in. I need answers, even if my brain is having a total meltdown. I'll keep going, even if I'm stumbling around like a lost chicken. Craven Puff. For years, I've hunted them down, the elusive Spider-Men, each one a tantalizing challenge, a prey like no other. They have proven to be cunning adversaries, testing my skills at every turn, yet I revel in the thrill of the hunt. 
I once naively believed they were just ordinary men, but oh, how mistaken I was. They possess extraordinary powers, transforming into formidable beasts, beyond the realm of human understanding. They are no mere men, but creatures of wonder and terror. Yet, their mystique intrigues me, drawing me closer to the darkness that embraces me, granting me strength and purpose. With each encounter, I grow more formidable, honing my abilities. This final Spider-Man, the ultimate quarry, will be the ultimate test, the pinnacle of my collection. The challenge that will define my legacy. I shall not waver, for I am driven by an unyielding determination. As long as they draw breath, I shall not rest, relentlessly pursuing my quarry until victory is assured, and the hunt is won. No poff. The crimson-clad Spider-Man soared gracefully through the cityscape, executing acrobatic swings with unparalleled finesse. Yet, as he alighted upon the apex of a towering rooftop, a sudden jolt of agony coursed through his being, forcing him to halt and clutch his head in distress. Spider-Man, fuck. Why is every single bad memory all of a sudden violating my mind? NGH, Kara the fuck is going on? My suspicions are leading me to a dark. They're most likely making you experience illusions and psychological trauma. Spider-Man, fuck. Then where is he? He's getting close. Very close. Spider-Man, damn it. And I just have to be tired as hell. He's here. Spider-Man's heightened senses snapped into focus, attuned to the slightest disturbances in the air around him. His agile form reacted instinctively, evading with uncanny swiftness what appeared to be a projectile hurtling towards him. A neary sight it was, for the arrow that whizzed through the night sky was not of ordinary make. Spider-Man, the fuck is this? In a harrowing turn of events, the web slinger's misfortune continued as another of those enigmatic black arrows found its mark with unerring precision. This time, the malevolent projectile impaled his left shoulder, eliciting a visceral cry of excruciating pain from the usually stoic hero. Spider-Man, no. Fuck. Fuck. Why does IT hurt so much? Ha. Huh. In an ominous turn of events, the system's warning signs flashed with urgency, revealing the dire reality of the situation. The projectile that found its mark was none other than a dark ST narrow, a rare and fearsome material hailing from the elusive darkness dimension. Known for its unparalleled strength and lethal properties, dark Astine stood as a formidable metal that struck terror into the hearts of all guardians. The notorious reputation of dark Astine preceded it, forged through the countless lives it had claimed and the sheer dread it inspired among those who knew of its existence said to be utilized solely by the darks with distinguished notoriety for vanquishing numerous guardians. It was a weapon of choice that epitomized danger and malevolence. The mere touch of dark castine upon a guardian's flesh was a bane beyond comprehension, evoking absolute anguish that defied mortal comprehension. Instances were recounted of guardians encountering the malevolent metal, only to succumb instantaneously to the unbearable tormented inflicted. Such was the dreadful efficacy of dark castine against the guardians, an otherwise formidable force of justice. Spider-Man's instinctive reaction to extricate the dark Astine arrow from his wounded arm was a testament to his seasoned expertise and unyielding resolve. Despite the excruciating pain that seared through his being, the symbiote's regenerative prowess proved to be a saving grace, hastening the healing process and allowing him a momentary respite to seek refuge. Spider-Man, I should definitely not get hit by another of these. Wait, it doesn't hurt you when you touch it? Spider-Man, is it supposed to? In most cases, yes, but it looks like you're a special case. Only a few guardians don't get affected by its touch. In a display of unyielding resolve, Spider-Man's stoic nod belied the trepidation that churned within him. With a deft hand, he snapped the dark as T narrow, keenly aware of its lethality, and swiftly initiated a sensory sweep to discern the whereabouts of his cunning adversary, Craven. The young hero's senses, honed to an extraordinary degree, went into overdrive as he endeavored to pick up the slightest hint of Craven's presence. In a heartbeat, a revelation flashed across his widened eyes, and he instinctively reacted, narrowly evading the ferocious swing of Craven's lethal machete. The deadly strike, charged with an undeniable intent to maim, rent the very billboard that had offered a semblance of shelter, causing it to cascade into the streets below. Dark Craven, a symbiote, huh? Spider Man, yeah? So what? Dark Craven, I've dealt with black suit Spider-Man. But yours seem to be a major upgrade. I wonder if it has the same weakness. Spider-Man, TCH, come at me then. In an ephemeral moment that seemed to defy the very fabric of time itself, Craven, with the grace and speed of a spectre, vanished into a blurred apparition. 
his lithe form became a mere whisper, an indiscernible streak in the tapestry of reality, leaving Spider-Man momentarily disoriented. Spider-Man, wait, does he have the powers of the one from Shattered Dimension? In an ephemeral moment of heightened awareness, Spider-Man's spider senses hummed with urgency, alerting him to an impending threat. Alas, time had eluded him, for the inexorable force of Craven's wrath was upon him. The hunter's powerful grasp ensnared Spider-Man's visage in a vice-like hold, leaving the young hero with no recourse but to bear witness to his adversary's display of raw strength. With an almost preternatural display of might, Craven hurled the crimson-clad hero through the air, as if he were naught but a mere puppet in the hunter's hands. The trajectory of their violent exchange carried Spider-Man's form into a distant edifice, its towering walls bearing witness to the spectacle of their clash. The impact was seismic, resonating with the dissonant cacophony of shattering glass and masonry. Like a tempest, the resulting destruction rippled through the air, sending tremors of chaos across the once peaceful urban landscape. As Spider-Man found himself entangled in a labyrinth of debris and wreckage, the denizens of the city were awash with fear and confusion. Like a panicked symphony, they fled in disarray, seeking refuge from the tempest of conflict that had encroached upon their world. Spider-Man, fist off. Ow. Second, you aren't supposed to be that strong unless you're in that beast form. So how? Dark Craven, remember, Spider. I'm not like any other Craven in the multiverse. Craven, the hunter, exhibited a ballet of prowess as he seamlessly leapt from one precipice to another. In stark contrast, Spider-Man, the acrobatic marvel, matched his adversary's every move with a fluid grace, each step a calculated response to the symphony of combat unfolding before them. In this dance of dexterity and might, Craven's relentless onslaught began to tip the scales in his favor. A torrent of blows, a fusion of ferocity and calculated strikes, found their mark upon Spider-Man's crimson-clad form. With each resounding impact, the young hero's resolve was tested, his will tempered amidst the unforgiving crucible of battle. Yet, unyielding in spirit, the web-slinger countered Craven's every maneuver, as their bodies weaved an intricate tapestry of struggle and defiance. A roundhouse kick sought to seize an opening in his adversary's defenses. However, Craven's predatory instincts proved keener, as he intercepted the audacious move with a display of uncanny timing, capturing the young hero in a vice-like grip. With a masterful display of strength, the hunter brought the crimson-clad hero to a thunderous halt, flipping him over and orchestrating a moment of awe-inspiring devastation. The force of impact, a cataclysm of might and precision, pierced the very ground beneath them, yielding to the hero's descent as he plummeted through the floor below. Spider-Man, NGH. This isn't good. Toxin, Carito. You're physically not ready for this, you're extremely exhausted, not just physically but also mentally. Spider-Man, not like I have a chow. The tides of verbal sparring were abruptly eclipsed by the violent interjection of physical combat. Craven, unleashed an onslaught of force, seeking to subdue the agile figure of Spider-Man, who proved elusive like a shadow in motion. The web-slinger's evasive maneuver was executed with finesse, executing a seamless backflip, a graceful defiance against Craven's overpowering assault. Harnessing the power of lateral repulsion, Spider-Man, an adept acrobat in his own right, propelled himself forward, his knee finding its mark upon Craven's visage. Within the confines of the edifice, their movements defied the laws of gravity, evoking the dance of two aerial artists, each striving for dominance over the other. As the momentum surged, the crimson-clad hero nimbly snared Craven's shirt, a fleeting anchor of control, and catapulted him through the unforgiving walls of cement. Spider-Man, had enough yet? In the relentless pursuit of his prey, Craven, unleashed an array of lethal implements. In a mesmerizing display of precision, the air became adorned with a deadly ballet of knives, poised to claim their target, the indomitable Spider-Man. However, the web-slinger's once impeccable agility seemed to wane under the weight of prolonged exertion, and his once effortless evasion now bore the mark of fatigue. His movements, once characterized by unrivaled grace, bore an uncharacteristic sluggishness, an indication of his drained state. Spider-Man, NGH, fuck. Dark Craven, oh, Spider. You really aren't looking in the bests of shapes right now. Why don't you give up and die? Spider-Man, as a wise man once said. I can do this all day, or night in this case. Dark Craven, so be it. With lightning-like celerity, Craven propelled himself forward, unleashing a formidable tackle that sent Spider-Man crashing through a solid wall and unceremoniously to the ground, seeking to vanquish his adversary.
Craven combined both hands into a forceful blow, but the quick-witted hero responded swiftly, ensnaring his opponent's eyes with a web, delivering an electrifying jolt. Undeterred by the initial setback, the relentless Craven repelled the spider's retaliatory venom blasts with deft movements of his trusty machete. In a calculated move, Spider-Man sought refuge in invisibility, hoping to capitalize on the element of surprise. Yet, Craven, displaying an uncanny intuition, stood composed with eyes shut tight, sensing the presence of his unseen foe. With decisive precision, he countered the elusive Spider-Man's attempt, striking him with a forceful elbow to the nose followed by a powerful sidekick, sending the hero sprawling. Undaunted, Spider-Man regained his composure, nimbly evading Craven's machete, and launching a venom-charged left hook, impacting with resounding force upon Craven's visage. The indomitable hunter was sent hurtling through another wall, his body crashing into a public restroom, bringing the skirmish to a momentary standstill. Spider-Man, breathing heavily tea time out. Let me. Take a breather. Spider-Man's imploring entreaties fell on deaf ears as Craven, employing his astounding swiftness, delivered a forceful blow to the hero's countenance, followed by a relentless barrage of heavy punches. In a bid to retaliate, the spider employed an expeditious decoy, skillfully evading Craven's ferocious assault, and unleashed a venomous blast at close quarters, sending the relentless hunter hurtling into a nearby wall. Alas, the impact proved insufficient to keep Craven at bay, for he promptly employed a rope ensnaring the spider by the neck and drawing him closer. Utilizing his prodigious strength, Craven effortlessly propelled Spider-Man through the partition walls, transforming the bathroom stalls into a scene of destruction. Grimacing in agony, Spider-Man found himself at the mercy of Craven, who, undeterred by the hero's struggle, summoned a rifle and placed his foot firmly upon Spider-Man's chest, leaving him immobilized and vulnerable. Dark Craven, any last words, Spider? Spider-Man, why yeah, I got some. Dark Craven, go ahead. Spider-Man, is it loaded? Dark Craven, wah. Amidst that fleeting instant of distraction, Spider-Man skillfully harnessed Kane's touch, utilizing it to administer a searing and agonizing burn to Craven's leg, eliciting a resounding cry of pain from the hunter. With a graceful swiftness, Spider-Man rose to his feet and executed a precision dropkick, propelling Craven across the expanse of the bathroom. Before Craven could mount a counterattack, the spider seized the initiative, propelling himself with unrestrained force to spearhead a visceral charge, crashing through the confines of a nearby wall and launching the two adversaries into the building's expansive hallway. In a display of unyielding tenacity, Spider-Man swiftly gained the upper hand, positioning himself atop the fallen Craven, whose resistance proved futile against the relentless barrage of punches delivered by the web-slinger's hands, now augmented by the symbiote's sharp spikes. The reverberating impact of each strike resonated throughout the hallway, creating a percussive symphony of ferocity and intensity. An onlooker, if present, might have mistaken the tumultuous sound for a rapid-fire mortar, given the relentless and devastating fury of Spider-Man's unyielding assault. Spider-Man, die. Die. Fucking die. In that fleeting moment of confrontation, Craven's astute reflexes allowed him to intercept Spider-Man's spiked fist with a composed smirk adorning his countenance. Dark Craven, I'm glad that you are resilient and strong. Let's turn this up a notch, shall we? In an abrupt surge of unrestrained energy, Spider-Man was forcefully propelled backward, causing him to collapse onto his knees with a watchful gaze fixed upon Craven. To his astonishment, he witnessed the transformation of the hunter into a formidable creature, unleashing a resounding roar that echoed throughout the surroundings. Dark Beast Craven, now, let's meet the rest of the family. Spider-Man, wait, you're not alone? Dark Beast Craven, of course not. Exhibiting newfound swiftness, Craven delivers a devastating blow to Spider-Man, propelling him with such force that he hurtles through the air and collides with the solemn grounds of a cemetery. The impact shatters several tombstones, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. Spider-Man, NGH. Ah fuck. With a renewed surge of determination, the arachnid hero swiftly regained his footing, his emotions heightened to an even greater degree. Alerted by his heightened senses, he deftly evaded a barrage of incoming cars hurled with malevolent intent. The final projectile aimed at him was seized by the spider's agile webs, and in a daring display of strength and strategy, he whirled the car through the air, crashing it upon Craven, who was poised to strike. With Craven pinned beneath the weight of the car, Spider-Man seized the opportunity to unleash his venom-enhanced webbing, causing the vehicle to detonate in a thunderous explosion. The aftermath revealed Craven still alive a smug grin adorning his face, 
as if reveling in the thrill of battle. Dark Beast Craven, Spider, Spider, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? Spider-Man, breathing heavily nice song Pussycat, got anything else rehearsed? Dark Beast Craven, yes. A white liquid starts enveloping his weapons and limbs your tombstone. Toxin, Carito, dodge. Alas, the portent of the impending assault was but a fleeting realization, arriving with an almost cruel swiftness that eluded the spider's keen senses. The hunter's lethal claws found their mark on Spider-Man's chest before he could react a blur of motion that left him in a state of incredulity. The speed of his adversary was so profound that one moment Craven was distant, and the next, he materialized directly before him, a breathtaking display of unbridled velocity. Spider-Man, A.C.K. Why does IT burn? Toxin, IT hurts, IT hurts, IT hurts. With a resolute pull, Craven wielded his whip anew, striking down upon the subdued figure of Spider-Man, who remained grounded, recuperating from the inflicted gash of the hunter's lethal claws. The whip's malevolent lashings provoked a visceral reaction from the symbiote, as it emitted a screeching, unbridled protest in response to each strike, its very form shrouded in steam as if to symbolize the torment it endured under the relentless assault. Spider-Man, no, fucking stop. In a moment of sheer desperation, a thunderous cry escaped Spider-Man's lips, setting forth an apocalyptic surge of power, a mega-venom blast of cataclysmic proportions that swept across the breadth of the street, unleashing its fury upon anything in its path, sending cars and obstacles hurtling backwards as if attempting to defy gravity's embrace. As the blowing explosion gradually dissipated, a startling revelation presented itself to Spider-Man, the symbiote known as Toxin had become intertwined with his being, manifesting a disheveled version of his Miles Morales suit, bearing the evident scars from the harrowing encounter with Craven's white whip, a revelation cemented by the lingering emanations of steaming wounds that continued to torment him. As the pieces of this enigmatic puzzle began to coalesce, realization dawned upon him, connecting the dots of the tumultuous strife he endured, revealing an unsettling truth lying beneath the surface. Spider-Man, you just had to have anti-venom with you? Grunts. Dark Beast Craven, oh? So you've heard of the anti-venom symbiote? Good. Spider-Man, TCH, slowly stands up. Dark Beast Craven, you are now weaker because your symbiote is obligated to recover. That won't matter after I blow your head off. Craven's relentless pursuit propelled him with unyielding force towards Spider-Man, who swiftly took to the skies, nimbly navigating the thick canopy of nearby trees. An exhilarating chase unfolded, their movements resembling an elegant dance through the verdant foliage. Yet, amidst this captivating spectacle, their encounter took a perilous turn as Craven's ferocity materialized in a powerful tackle, sending the web-slinger sprawling through the air. Undeterred, Spider-Man summoned his tenacious spirit, attempting to fend off the relentless predator. With an instinctual grace, the spider deftly engaged in a dynamic web-slinging sequence, artfully entangling Craven within an intricate labyrinth of his webbing. Each strand seemed to draw the hunter deeper into the captivating snare, ensnaring him in a mesmerizing display of determination and strategy. Despite Craven's best efforts to break free, the hero's unwavering determination prevailed, encasing the hunter further and further within the ethereal threads. Yet, as the confrontation reached its zenith, a disheartening revelation unfolded. A resounding PSSSS echoed through the air, the harrowing sound emanating from Spider-Man's web shooters. The treasured resource had run dry, leaving the hero momentarily bereft of his primary tool. Spider-Man, shit. I forgot to auto-add web shooters. Fortune favored Spider-Man as Craven, entangled within the final vestiges of webbing, found himself agonizingly close yet frustratingly out of reach of the elusive hero. A guttural roar of seething fury reverberated through the air, a crescendo of anger and vexation echoing amidst the aftermath of their fierce encounter. The mighty hunter's outstretched claws yearned for his nimble adversary, but the web-slinger had skillfully eluded his grasp, leaving Craven ensnared in a web-woven prison. Spider-Man, you, don't get close. The only one I'll allow to be this close is Black Cat. With remarkable swiftness, the spider retaliated, launching a calculated counter-offensive with two precise and formidable punches aimed at Craven's countenance. The weight of each blow carried a kinetic force that reverberated through the air. Undeterred, he followed the initial assault with a fluid display of acrobatics, executing two backflip kicks with astonishing grace and precision. Craven's form crumpled to the ground as Spider-Man's unyielding determination drove him to launch a forceful assault. 
his legs driven with remarkable power, burying themselves into Craven's abdomen, causing the earth beneath them to crack from the sheer impact. The fierce contest ensued, each relentless in delivering punishing blows upon the other. Craven's ruthless claws slashed and pounded upon Spider-Man's upper body, while the hero, undeterred, responded with venom-infused punches that resonated with intensity, forcing Craven to grit his teeth in pain. In the midst of the relentless exchange, Craven's astute observation began to unravel the enigma before him. The perplexity of Spider-Man's ceaseless endurance and unwavering resilience piqued his curiosity. Questions swirled in Craven's mind as he considered the potential source of this tenacious power. The notion of a secret skill of adaptation emerged as a plausible explanation, perhaps a natural ability gifted to this extraordinary adversary. The realization of Spider-Man's innate capability to improve and grow during the heat of battle dawned upon Craven, painting an image of a formidable opponent whose potential knew no bounds. Despite the harsh battering he endured, Spider-Man continued to demonstrate his uncanny stamina and resolve. With each exchange, the realization of facing a foe capable of growing stronger with every encounter further fueled Craven's determination to conclude the battle swiftly. He evaded Spider-Man's venomous punch, skillfully retaliating with an uppercut to the hero's jaw and delivering a thunderous back kick that propelled him through a labyrinth of trees, landing him back within the solemn confines of the cemetery. The urgency to bring an end to this perilous encounter drove Craven to unleash a primal roar, an eerie call for reinforcement that pierced the silence of the night. The haunting shadows that loomed in response to his call served as a harbinger of impending peril, a moment that seemed to signal a turning point in the relentless struggle. Spider-Man's eyes widened, realizing that the battlefield was about to be ensnared in a confrontation of even greater magnitude. Spider-Man, this is getting pretty damn unfair you know? As the relentless battle raged on, the darkened scene was further amplified by the emergence of new figures, each intrinsically linked to Craven's tumultuous past. Amongst them, Anna Craven, the resolute daughter of the Hunter, exuded an air of tenacity that rivaled her father's. Sasha, Craven's enigmatic wife appeared as an enigmatic presence, her motivations veiled in secrecy. Alongside them, Alia Shaw, Craven's mutant son, wielded powers beyond comprehension, adding another layer of complexity to the encounter. The unmistakable presence of Chameleon, Craven's enigmatic brother, brought forth an unsettling element, a master of deception and illusion, capable of sowing doubt and confusion amidst the chaos of the battle. And then there was Vladimir, once another of Craven's sons, transformed into a monstrous entity, a haunting reminder of past tragedies that shaped the course of their lives. The price paid for his revival was steep, as Spider-Woman, a valiant ally, sacrificed herself in the process. Spider-Man, stares at Vladimir you. I'm still fucking upset about how they revived your useless ass. In an unsettling tableau, the six formidable members of the Kravenov family converged upon the bloodied and battle-worn Spider-Man, an air of quiet intensity permeating the scene. Each figure stood with a palpable aura of determination, their eyes locked on the valiant hero before them. Clenching their fists, they signaled their unwavering resolve to face this formidable adversary. Spider-Man, come on you motherfuckers. I'm taking at least one of you down. Come on. As the Kravenoff family and Spider-Man surged forward with resolute battle cries, the atmosphere crackled with an electrifying tension, presaging the momentous clash about to unfold. A symphony of determination resonated in the air as they charged headlong into confrontation. In the heart of this fierce maelstrom, Spider-Man channeled the potent power of venom into his punch, his fist pulsating with an otherworldly energy. Simultaneously, Craven harnessed his own formidable strength, gathering an aura of raw power around his clenched fist. The collision of their fists sent forth a seismic shockwave of such intensity that the very heavens wept, casting a downpour upon the battleground. The heavens themselves seemed to bear witness to this momentous encounter, as if the very elements were stirred by the forces at play. What will happen? On this grim night. Chapter 28, The Last Hunt Part 2 Marvel DC, images, manhus, and every anime that will be mentioned and used in this story are not mine. They all belong to their respective owners. The main character carried to Josue Valdez and the story are mine. Warning. This chapter will be very violent and will contain disturbing content that the reader may find disturbing. You have been highly advised. In the dark and eerie night, the sounds of desperation and fear echoed through the air. The relentless onslaught of fists, fueled by the intent to kill, painted a grim portrait of a man cornered with no escape. In the face of overwhelming odds, the human spirit can be driven to the brink of madness, as the suffocating pressure of relentless pursuit takes its toll. In this harrowing moment, 
the hunted man found himself beset by an array of adversaries, each wielding superhuman powers fueled by the malevolent influence of darkness. The once rational mind was now clouded by the primal instincts of survival, leaving little room for critical thought or strategic planning. Every second was a frantic struggle to defend against the onslaught of six fearsome villains, leaving no time for contemplation. In the midst of the chaotic fray, physical limitations became an afterthought, for the hunted man fought with a fervor fueled by instinct alone. In this life-or-death struggle, reasoning gave way to raw determination, and the man fought with every fiber of his being, using whatever means available to fend off his attackers. Each strike, be it a kick, punch, slash, bite, scratch, electrification, burn, or stab, was a desperate bid for survival. Amidst the swirling darkness of the cemetery, he fought tooth and nail, driven by a fierce desire to live another day. The instinct for self-preservation propelled him forward, allowing him to deliver counter-attacks and evade with a measure of primal prowess. Spider-Man, thoughts why? Why is this happening to me? I'm being hunted down like some sort of animal. Why am I being treated like an animal? I'm just a man. Like every single person around here, nothing more and nothing else. I suffer just like everyone else. So why? It's just a simple question really. All this pressure, all this stress, all this anger the resentment, and enjoyment. Why is it that you darks do this? Because you're just evil for the sake of it? No. Of course not, that would be such a plain reason. Because you were commanded to do so? That's a more possible reason. But. I just can't wrap my head. Why do you smile as you attempt to cut me down? Am I just seen as a trophy for you all? A bounty to conquer for glory? It is awfully ironic I question your reasons to kill me as if I don't do it myself. The difference is, that you've shown me each and every time one appears there's a reason why you turned. Maybe your life was absolutely miserable which led you to such darkness. Your family abused you and went insane. Society treated you as an outcast and you found it unfair and not worth it to live in a world full of such depravity. So many reasons lead me to believe for the why you chose this life. This life. Of such sin. I. I don't even know what to think anymore. All this killing of your people has made me numb to it and each time I see a dark it just proves to me more that you all just do due to an obsession, something that has drugged you that the influence of the darkness can give you. And for you Craven, the obsession that leads you into this path, was Spider-Man. Spider-Man Poff. A sense of numbness washed over me, the pain no longer registering as I moved with instinctive precision, every fiber of my being focused on survival, evading and countering their relentless attacks. My stamina waned, and attempts to regain my breath were futile, thwarted by Sasha's unyielding sniper fire, keeping me firmly in their deadly grasp. Craven and his mutant son, monstrous in their forms, became the most formidable adversaries, their sheer power and ferocity forcing me to be ever vigilant. Chameleon's illusions sought to confuse, but my spider senses aided in seeing through his tricks, enabling me to navigate his deceptive ploys. Anna and Ali proved to be ruthless foes their relentless pursuit mirroring the primal instincts of savage beasts. The physical differences between Craven and his mutant son were evident, but their coordinated attacks presented a formidable challenge. Their collective strategy began to unveil itself, Sasha serving as their deadly sniper, while Craven and the mutant played the role of tank and damage. Anna and Ali, the barriers, were adept at cornering me, leaving little room for escape. Their dark castian weapons instilled fear, making any intention of taking a hit a risky endeavor. My focus shifted towards understanding their rhythm, discerning their roles in the orchestrated assault. Swiftly, I adapted, learning to navigate their onslaught with calculated precision. Vlad's attempt to catch me was thwarted, and I retaliated by stabbing his leg with my stinger. He howled in pain, seeking to retreat, but I held him firm. When Anu attacked from above, I used Vlad as a shield, forcing her to retreat from her assault. An upward venom blast sent her crashing to the ground, buying me a moment of respite. Craven lunged from the side, but I managed to throw him aside. Sasha and I engaged in a fierce ranged battle, both of us avoiding deadly shots with uncanny agility. Chameleon's illusions intensified, but I anticipated his moves, evading a sneak attack on my lower back. The scene unfolded in a dangerous stance, as Alia Shaw rushed towards me with feral fury. Chameleon's illusions multiplied, adding to the confusion. I knew the need to neutralize him, for his tricks could turn the tide against me. In a split-second decision, I leapt and twisted in midair, evading Alia Shaw's attack. Sensing two additional threats, I reacted swiftly, foiling Chameleon's attempt to stab me by redirecting the bullet towards his head, his illusions vanishing in an instant. 
A moment of shock gripped the Kravinov family as the illusionist fell, and the realization of his demise echoed through the air. My senses were heightened, and I braced myself, knowing that the fight was far from over. Dark Sasha, no. Dimitri. Dark Anna, uncle. With utmost finesse, I touched down gracefully upon the floor, my gaze resting upon the lifeless form of Chameleon, his head gruesomely imploded from his body. Spider-Man, you were a good villain for the OG Spider-Man, but in my opinion, you're just a D-lister to me. Beep. What was that? Beep. Wait. Beep. Godda. The deafening blast reverberated through the air, propelling me with merciless force into the facade of a quaint restaurant. Shards of glass found their way into my flesh, inflicting a symphony of pain that stirred the very core of my being. Blood cascaded from my wounds, painting a macabre tableau around me. The irony of it all weighed heavily on my mind, an incessant recurrence of explosive encounters destined to haunt my very soul. I couldn't help but contemplate the harrowing prospect of post-traumatic stress disorder, a specter that seemed all too real in the face of such unrelenting violence. A desperate yearning for respite consumed me, a mere month of reprieve would be a godsend. Alas, my senses were in disarray, distorted by the dizzying aftermath of the blast. The world swirled around me in an unforgiving whirlpool of disorientation, and my keen spider senses, usually a boon, now became an additional source of torment. Amidst this maelstrom, a bullet, lethal and purposeful, came hurtling towards my chest, yet through some elusive instinct, I evaded its deadly trajectory. Summoning the last vestiges of my strength and clarity, I propelled myself with a resilient slingshot maneuver, using my trusty webs to navigate towards the refuge of the nearby cemetery. It was there that I lighted, confronting the stern countenances of the weary Craven of family, their collective eye directed squarely at me, with the exception of Craven, who bore a more inscrutable expression. Dark Beast Craven, you are insanely durable spider. You're unlike anything I've ever seen. Ha ha ha. Uttering those words, my strength waned, and I found myself sinking to my knees, gasping for breath. The mutant adversary advanced relentlessly, a menacing figure hurtling directly towards me. Reacting instinctively, I swiftly projected a web towards a nearby tombstone, wrenching it from the earth and propelling it with forceful precision into Vlad's visage, momentarily diverting his menacing charge. Seizing the fleeting opportunity, I deftly mounted the colossal creature, brandishing yet another tombstone as my improvised weapon. However, to my astonishment, the ferocious beast displayed an unexpected feat of strength, overpowering me and holding me firmly in place. Bewilderment washed over me as I grappled with the enigma of why the seemingly mindless creature would halt its own assault. Cablem. A bullet pierced my stomach. Ha. Huh. Fuck. You'll pay. You will all fucking pay for that. Berserk mode activated. No poff. In the serene expanse of Hawaii, an earth-shattering roar erupted, its monstrous echoes seeming to span the very breadth of the island. The source of this primal cry was none other than Kerito, known far and wide as the fabled Spider-Man. His once gentle demeanor had been eclipsed, replaced by an all-consuming maelstrom of rage. With unparalleled speed and agility, his eyes fixated on Sasha, who cowered in fear at the impending tempest. In an instant, he harnessed the power of lateral repulsion, propelling himself with astonishing force toward his target. In a masterful display of web-slinging prowess, he ensnared Sasha, the threads coiling around her like a silken shroud, and commenced a whirlwind dance of velocity. His centrifugal might repelled any onlookers who dared to approach, lest they be swept away by the unleashed fury. Engulfed by unbridled wrath, he brought Sasha crashing down with such cataclysmic impact that the very ground beneath them seemed to shudder in submission, yielding to a crater of devastating proportions. The primal scream of anger tore through the air as he vented his pent-up frustration. Yet, the spectacle had garnered the attention of Craven, who had long admired the prowess of the enigmatic spider alongside his two sons and daughter, Craven launched a coordinated assault. However, the tables turned swiftly, for the spider's savagery surpassed even that of the most ferocious beasts in the animal kingdom. Alia Shaw's attempt to restrain the spider ended gruesomely as he lost an ear to the vengeful creature's fangs, the agonizing cry of pain resounding across the battleground. Undeterred, Spider-Man deftly countered, propelling Alia Shaw back with a force that spoke of untamed brutality. Next, Anna stepped forth, her intentions veiled in darkness. But her efforts proved futile, for the spider's preternatural reflexes deftly avoided her lethal strike, and in response, he delivered a blow of such intensity to her jaw that her skull seemed to part ways with her mouth, leaving a grim void in its wake. Darkana, gra, ha, gargle noises. 
Amidst the fray, the once regal figure of Spider-Man had transformed into an avatar of unbridled ferocity, driven by a darkened resolve that knew no bounds. The brutal confrontation unfolded with grim consequence, the combatants engaged in a relentless dance of pain and suffering. Sasha, her visage contorted in agony, bore the brunt of the spider's unyielding wrath. Her injured state left her tongue languishing, bereft of its natural support, while torrents of blood spilled forth, painting a haunting portrait of her torment. With an unforgiving kick, the spider flung her away, yet her cries of suffering lingered unabated. But the tide of the skirmish turned abruptly when Alia Shaw, wielding a deadly blade, lunged at the spider, piercing his thigh with a swift and precise strike. Reacting with grim determination, the spider seized Alia Shaw's hand, channeling Kane's incendiary gift to immolate the offending limb, leaving the agonized assailant screaming in anguish. In the midst of this visceral encounter, Vladimir, though barely standing, managed to execute a harrowing attack from behind, slashing the spider with vicious intent. A swift retaliation ensued, as the spider whirled around, impaling the monster's chest with a retaliatory stab. Despite his frenzied state, the spider's instincts remained keen. Employing the accelerated decoy skill, he artfully evaded a potentially lethal strike from the formidable Craven. Driven by relentless determination, the spider surged forward, intent on subduing Craven in his unrestrained fury. However, fate would intervene, as Anna, with a calculated move, intercepted the assault, driving her daggers into the hero's chest. The cacophony of screams and pain resounded, but amidst the tumult, the berserk hero was abruptly wrenched from his maddened trance. As the air escaped his lungs in gasps, the gravity of the situation dawned upon him. The once indomitable spider was thrown to the ground, a pool of crimson forming around him. Spider-Man poff. Spider-Man, ha. Huh? Someone. Anyone. This is too much. I can't do this anymore. I. I'm gonna die, aren't I? No. I can't die. My eyes beheld Craven's calculated advance, a sinister rifle firmly grasped in his hand its malevolent intent unmistakable. His countenance, a sinister tableau of malevolence, bore an unsettling smile, exuding an air of sadistic pleasure as he closed the distance between us with calculated composure. Craven, you are the most beautiful spider I have ever seen. You're so different. An animal. You're no man. An animal. Just like the rest that I've killed. With your death I will become superior. I will be better than you. Stronger than you in every way. You beautiful animal. Ha 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 ha. H he's. Insane. No. 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 He points his rifle at my head. Spider-Man, I'll kill you. I'll kill every single one of you. I'll kill you. Kill you. Kill you. Kill. Bang. In the eerie confines of an abandoned cemetery, the relentless rain cascaded entrance, creating an atmosphere of somber reflection. A family stood gathered, their figures obscured by the downpour, as they solemnly lowered a casket into the freshly dug grave. In the midst of this melancholic scene, Craven's demeanor exuded a palpable sense of sorrow, as if the loss of something deeply cherished had taken its toll on his soul. His face bore the weight of grief, an indication that he had been irrevocably altered by the departure of a beloved presence. Contrasting sharply with Craven's poignant sorrow, the rest of his family exhibited an inexplicable loathing, an unfathomable disdain directed towards the casket that now found its eternal rest in the earth. Their emotions appeared fraught with resentment, to the extent that they even expressed their disgust with visceral gestures, spitting upon the coffin in an act of bitter defiance. As the rain continued its relentless descent, the night's unfolding events seemed poised to shape the course of their lives forever. Craven, compelled by a sense of duty and closure, commenced the process of refilling the void, shoveling earth into the grave with a forlorn determination. And yet, in a twist that belied the depths of his inner turmoil, the weight of sorrow abruptly gave way to a maniacal laughter, a manifestation of the tumultuous emotions that now gripped him. The family, witnessing this sudden shift, regarded him with a mixture of concern and bewilderment, silently acknowledging the profound impact of the night's events upon them all. Completing the burial, the family slowly retreated from the site, their movements heavy with the burdens they bore. Craven's laughter, both haunting and disconcerting, echoed in the melancholy night, lingering like a phantom spectre, serving as a stark reminder that this night had left an indelible mark upon each member of the family, altering the trajectory of their lives in ways they could scarcely comprehend. Spider, spider, burning bright in the forest of the night. What immortal eye or hand could frame thy fearful, symmetry? Craven poff. Laughter erupted from the depths of my being, echoing through the darkened void as I reveled in the triumph that now lay before me. The spider, my greatest nemesis, 
now lay entombed, banished back to its own dimension, vanquished by my hand. The crimson hue of blood seemed to mirror the deep pleasure I derived from this moment, savoring the taste of victory, and relishing in the remembrance of our bitter struggles. For so long, countless iterations of Spider-Men had emerged, seemingly indistinguishable from one another, bound by the same unwavering moral code. Yet, this particular spider, infused with the symbiote's essence, stood apart, an extraordinary manifestation of power and savagery that constantly evolved and grew stronger. It captivated my attention, a sight to behold, and a worthy adversary that pushed my own limits to their edge. Yet, despite my eventual triumph, I could not deny the allure of that primal power. It was an entity that could have toppled me in a one-on-one -on -one battle, an adversary capable of surpassing my own prowess. Such a realization left me with an insatiable craving, to become one with the spider, to embrace its essence and wield its might, to prove my dominance over that formidable beast. With unyielding determination, I embarked on a journey through the dark dimension, navigating through the disdainful glares of the symbiotes, unfazed by their hostility. My destination was Clinter, the home of the symbiotes, where I sought an audience with their creator, Null, the eldritch god of darkness. As I entered Clinter's domain, I encountered potential adversaries. Yet I remained well prepared, armed with anti-venom weaponry that lay nestled within my inventory. There was no room for hesitation, my objective was clear, and nothing would deter me from achieving it. Eventually, I stood before the imposing presence of Null, clad in his ebony armor, its crimson emblem bearing a striking resemblance to the symbols adorning the black suit Spider-Man and Venom. His ethereal visage, crowned with flowing white hair, held an aura of formidable menace. Yet, I met his gaze with unflinching determination, for I was resolute in my purpose. My request for an audience with this dark deity was met, and as I stood before his throne room, I felt a surge of anticipation. Here, in the very heart of Clinter, I would dare to venture where few had dread. My desire to embody the spider, to become one with its essence, burned with a fervor that would not be quelled. I was prepared to embrace the darkness, to fuse my identity with that of my most formidable adversary. The journey ahead would be treacherous fraught with challenges, but the path to ultimate power beckoned me forward, and I would not be swayed. Dark Null, Wicked Smilo, who do we have here? The killer of 999 Spider-Men? Wait, it's now 1000 kills now. Congrats on your thousand kill, comrade. Dark Craven, I thank you for the gesture. I came to ask for a favor. Dark Null, Neck Cracks him. A favor? Don't be so humble, it'll be a gift for your thousand kills. Take it as a celebratory gift. Dark Craven, if you insist, then can I have a red symbiote? Dark Null. And why would you want a symbiote? Dark Craven, to prove myself better than the Spider-Man that I just killed, that beast gave me a lot of trouble to the point I had to call for my family for help. So as a solution I will become the spider and be better than it in every way possible. Dark Null, in his thoughts pfff ha ha. And I thought I was insane but this man takes insane and turns it into a stupid obsession? Well if he insists then he will get one, if bad things happen that's on him. Speaks alright, friend. Creates a red symbiote and throws it to Craven, making it latch itself into it and enter his body. Dark Craven, thank you. I shall continue with my duties. Walks away. Dark Null, mumbles this road you're taking, Craven. It will turn you more insane, more than you already are and I can't wait to see it happen so I can laugh at your incompetence. A few minutes after traversing back into his side of the dark dimension. At long last, I returned to the familiarity of my home, a sense of triumph and purpose coursing through my veins after traversing time and space to access a particular comic, wherein the enigmatic reality of Dark Null temporarily resided. The object of my relentless pursuit, now within my grasp, awaited me in the depths of my mansion's basement. With resolve etched upon my features, I summoned the symbiote, the dark entity that held the key to my transformation. Its sentient tendrils enveloped my entire form, melding with my being in a mesmerizing dance of otherworldly power. As the symbiote embraced me, a metamorphosis unfolded, rendering my visage akin to that of carnage, while imbuing me with heightened, animalistic traits. While this quest for superiority consumed me, a profound realization settled within my soul, I must protect my family from the shadows that lurked on the path ahead. They need not be entangled in the complexities of my relentless ambition. This journey to transcendence was a path I vowed to tread alone, shielding them from the inevitable perils and tribulations that would accompany my ascent. Yes, now I see in the eyes of the spider. I wear the spider's skin. I crawl. Yes. Now I am the spider.
venturing further into the depths of the basement, I find myself immersed in an area teeming with life. The air is rife with the cacophony of creatures, a diverse array of animals surrounding me, each carrying its own distinct presence. My gaze is drawn to a cage brimming with spiders, their tiny forms weaving intricate patterns in a desperate bid for freedom. As they skitter across the cage's confines, their relentless movements seem almost an attempt to intimidate, to assert their tenacity, but I remain resolute. In this moment, an inexplicable connection arises within me. I see myself mirrored in those spiders, a living embodiment of their essence. They are not just creatures confined within the cage, they are the very spirit of resilience, of adaptability, of tenacity, the embodiment of the spider. I, too, am the essence of this arachnid might, bearing its unique traits within myself. No. I am still craven of, the man. No, I am craven the hunter. And my metamorphosis is not complete. I need to feed into the spider's essence. I need to devour them. My metamorphosis. Why? I need to merge with the spider. Why am I doing this again? More, I need more of this blasphemous essence of the spider. How did I even end up like this? With the horror and majesty at its core. Why am I doing this? Don't question, drink, herbs, roots, and juices, poisons, fruits, and flowers. Let them pervade your mind, widen IT, break the craven. Let in the spider. Dark craven, no. Why am I doing this? Pain. Dark craven, starts convulsing on the floor gah, gah hack, ngh For honor, pain, for dignity, pain, for all your father bequeathed you? Pain. That damn further of mine. A pompous fool. A Russian nobleman who was exiled and living in poverty in my past life's America, too attached to what was to ever see what is. Pain. Pain. No. No. Father. Father was good. He was the last remnant of the world of culture and decency. A world the spider and its army of multiversal beings consumed. Dark Craven, starts throwing wild punches to the cage you did it. Russia was a model for a new and better. A holy civilization. And you with your guardians crushed IT, just as you crushed my father, Mount Hart. All of your counterparts take the guise of a Trotsky. A Lenin. A Hitler. A Reagan. A Gorbachev. Fuck damn IT. IT makes no difference. You start crawling and this world ceases to have any meaning. You crawl and you take humankind with you. Dark Craven, millions of spiders start forming around him you. I am. Dark Craven, spiders start to morph into something monstrous spider. Come out. I am so afraid. Dark Craven, millions of skittering and small spiders crawl on top of each other and form a huge spider. No. 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 This is inhumane. I'm standing over a shadow that doesn't even exist. This is just an illusion made by my intoxicated mind. Dark Craven, get away. 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 I'm craven. Craven of th there isn't anything that I don't fear. The hunter. Man. There is no spider. No supernatural creature that inhabits men's souls. The only one that has hunted me is the Spider-Man. But, I have proved myself better than all of them but my latest one. After so many years of being better than the spider. I was almost beaten. I had years of experience but yet I was almost beaten and humiliated again like many years ago with my first spider. But. But now I have been able to beat him with backup. I need to prove myself. I can't accept this victory. IT wasn't a fair fight. The spider was still keeping up even with six multivessel hunters on him. I need to be better. I want to magnify his defeat and prove that it was justifiable. But what? The only way I can prove myself better than him, than Spider-Man, is by taking his place. Then can my victory against him have a meaning. But what if? No, I insist on doing this, creating this, this thing, this ungodly form of the spider. The spider I just faced cannot be a man after those feats. I refuse to believe that a man was besting me. But what if it's? Come one, stand up, face the spider, Craven. But what if it's true? I am Craven, I am a hunter. There's nothing to fear. When my father died, when mother, oh, mother. 
I turned my back from my corrupted world. This sewer of darkness that I now reside in. This omniverse of darkness that is the most repulsive thing I have ever adventured. Luckily I was able to preserve a spot from this revolting multiverse. This primal area into the unruliness of a jungle. How mad. How paradoxical. Finding dignity and honor, sanctity and civilization, in that is what most men would call uncivilized. But I am not most men. I can see with my eyes that can pierce time, shadows, and falsehoods. I am craven and I fear nothing. I'm so afraid. Get away. 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 Get Iota away. Get away. G Iota at away. Get away. Get away. Get away. Get Iota away. Get Iota why. Get away. Get away. Get away. Get away. I was consumed by the millions of spiders. I can feel their hairy legs crawling on my very being. They defile my very existence. They're depriving me of my own self. I. What. Are. You. Spider. Inside this dark void, I can feel liquid dropping all over me. From black it all turned red. And then I saw something that will haunt me for the rest of my life. Something that I would rather die than see again. I saw a Spider-Man. I saw a monster. I stand before the grotesque visage of Spider-Man, an abomination born from the unholy union of the undead and the arachnid. My eyes trace the nightmarish contours of his once heroic form, now twisted beyond recognition. Decaying flesh clings to the skeletal remains of what was once a valiant defender, a mockery of his former self. His skin, pallid and mottled, is a patchwork of rot and decay, marked by oozing sores that seep with putrid fluids. Maggots writhe and squirm within the recesses of exposed wounds, their wriggling presence eliciting a shudder of revulsion. Patches of necrotic tissue dangle from his emaciated limbs, held together by sinewy tendrils of torn flesh. The remnants of his iconic crimson and black suit are now tattered remnants, stained with the grime of unending decay. The once gleaming insignia of a spider on his chest is now obscured by the grimy residue of death. His empty eye sockets gape, devoid of life, the hollow void a chilling testament to the soulless existence that now animates him. A foul stench permeates the air around him, a noxious cocktail of decay and decayed matter that overwhelms the senses. With each tortured step, his brittle bones audibly creak, a haunting melody of demise echoing in the air. Long, jagged fangs protrude from the remnants of his shredded lips, the grotesque gnashing instruments of his insatiable hunger. Strings of sinew dangle from his mouth as he moves, remnants of the grisly feasts that have sustained his unholy existence. Undead Spider-Man, I'm coming for you. Dark Craven, ha. Huh? Carry Topoff. It's warm. Everything is white. So quiet. So peaceful. Wherever I am, I like it here. I wanna stay. But why do I feel like I'm forgetting something? Forgetting someone? I feel a deep connection and longing for these people. Why am I crying? I finally got peace and quiet just like I wanted. A break from everything, from everyone, from everything. I just want peace and quiet for once in my goddamn life. All this pent-up stress from people expecting so much from me. The pressure on doing my best so I can have a better future. The struggle to keep up with the debts. The constant drama from family and friends. Just. Peace and quiet. No. Question mark hey, kid. Huh? Carito, uncle? Uncle Tony, yep, Uncle T for you, Adriel. Chuckles. Carito, but. How? You. You died of a heart attack at the age of 40. That's impossible because if he's dead and I'm seeing him, does that mean that I'm also? No, I don't know you. Uncle Tony, dead? I don't know anyone named Adriel. Uncle Tony, oh God. I just wanna be left alone. Uncle Tony, the flesh from his skin melts like acid was thrown all over his body he's right. In this white void. Wait. I remember. No, uncle. Please, come back. No. 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 Please come back. IT's not fair. Fuck. IT's not fair you left this world so early. Please. I want to talk about karate with you. Please. I want to tell you how I did in high school. Please. I want to know what gifts you wanted to give me. Please. Come to my birthday. Please. Hug me. Please. I. I miss you. So. So much. Sniff. Please. 
I hate when I lose a family member that I deeply cared about, especially when it was far from their time to go. I remember when it happened I was in high school just having a normal and happy day. All the teachers were just giving classes and doing what teachers do. In the afternoon mom had picked me up and would converse happily about our day. Reaching home I went straight to my PlayStation and play with my online friends and chill for the rest of the afternoon. Around 5 p.m. is where it happened. I was getting ready to eat dinner when my mother would come toward me with watery eyes and a sad expression. I got worried and asked what was wrong. She would mention my uncle and I would ask what happened. I wasn't expecting anything major but I couldn't be more wrong about it. When she told me he died, I just froze. I didn't even register what she said and told her to say it again. She went more in depth about it and said that he died of a heart attack and passed away at the age of 40. It just didn't fit me that my uncle who is a baseball coach and someone who takes care of himself well would just die of a heart attack of all things. I just panicked and started to think that she was just joking but, she then started to cry in front of me. And a piece of my heart just broke. My stomach would turn as I could feel my heart sink completely and sharp gasps enter and exit me. I couldn't believe it nor want it to. The uncle from my father's side, who continued to contact us even after everything that happened between my mother and father even after their divorce, still contacted us like we were still family. The only man who contacted us besides my aunt after the Hurricane Maria that devastated my home, my island. I cried. I cried so much that I felt empty inside. I cried too much that my body felt heavy and I fell to the floor. I cried so much that my sister had to help me. I cried so much that I couldn't sleep alone. I cried until my eyes got dry. I cried until I lost all feeling. I love my family very much and I would always feel devastated by the loss of one. I hate funerals because they make me feel completely empty inside. I hate to see their dead bodies as I know that'll be the last time I'll see them. I hate it, when I have to say goodbye to them forever. I always like to think that they are watching over me besides God just so I can keep an optimistic outlook on things but sometimes I just can't help but miss them. Ask why. Why were some of my loved ones taken away from such a young age? They still had so much time ahead of them. I miss them. Wait, them? Come out. Who's there? What is there? Mum? Who? No, that's not right. Father? Huh? Sis? Wait. No. Something's there. Always there. What are you? I, I am. The spider. Spider the I am. I'm dead. My uncle is dead. My friend is dead. My past girlfriend is dead. No, I am the spider, immortal imperishable. Mum? How long have been, this, this spider, this power, this monster, this crawling all-consuming thing? How long have I been seeing through the spider's eyes, doing the spider's bidding, waving its webs? For how long? I am the spider? Was this really who I was? This insect crawling in the holes of the earth devouring everything it came into contact with. Yeah, I am. Spiders are strong. Fearless. The spider can win against these dark shadows of hell who continue to spawn in the endless darkness. Unlike that coward. But I. That weakling. Am that coward. The one who can die. My current name is Kerita Josu, but my real name is Adriel. I. The spider is dying. The spider never lived. The spider is a trap, a lie, a coffin. I need to get out, this hairy six-legged spider. I need to be free of it. I. Free. I'm carried to just you. That's all I was and will ever be. I'm getting out of here and there won't be a damn thing you can do about it. You can't stop me. You can't keep me in this fake heaven that disguises itself as a paradise when night is just a mental torture. You just killed a mask, but you failed to murder the man that resides inside the mask. All these years, after all those Spider-Men you've killed your brain couldn't understand us. You misunderstood us. You thought we were something beyond comprehension, larger than life. You thought we were magic. You thought I was madness incarnate. You thought we were just craters that crawled in the void of darkness, that mocked and tormented and reveled in the darkness. Idiot. There is no spider. Mum? There's just me. Dad? I used to be a normal guy who just happened to be tapped on the shoulder by fate itself. Sister? Just carry to just you, my weakness? That's my strength. Dark Craven, come out. Carito, that's. Dark Craven, come out. Oh God, please. Don't let IT happen again. Mom help me. Dad save me. Sister embrace me. 
Dark Craven, so I can kill you. Mom help me. IT hurts. IT fucking hurts. Dad don't leave. Please IT hurts. Sister. Oh god, help me. Dark Craven, again. Spider. I. Fuck you. There's no spider. Miss. Dark Craven, I killed you, spider. My. I said there is no spider you fucker. Fam. Dark Craven, and I'm going to keep killing you. Over and 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 over until you can't handle it anymore. Miley. I miss my family. Crack. Chapter 29, The Last Hunt Part 3. Marvel DC, Images, Manacris, and every anime that will be mentioned and used in this story are not mine. They all belong to their respective owners. The main character Kerry to Josue Valdez and the story are mine. Warning, this chapter will be very violent and will contain disturbing content that the reader may find disturbing. You have been highly advised. Emerging from the depths below, I ascended to the surface with a weary yet determined demeanor. The exertion had taken its toll on my body, prompting a bout of severe coughing that racked my frame. Hastily, I raised my mask to gulp for air, only to be met with an overpowering wave of nausea that left me vomiting uncontrollably. Leaning on a nearby tombstone for support, I sought to steady myself amidst the disorienting vertigo. My hand instinctively moved to my head, seeking reassurance of its integrity. A momentary concern loomed as I feared the worst, a potential injury that could have gone unnoticed during the harrowing ordeal. Yet, to my relief, my touch revealed an intact skull, devoid of any visible harm. Toxin, oh my god, Carito. Are you feeling alright? It took me a bit to heal all your wounds because of the weapons they used. I also apologize for taking so long to heal you. I was severely wounded and needed to recover. Spider-Man, heavy breathing Toxin. Toxin, why yes? Spider-Man, shut up. Toxin. With a deliberate effort, I slowly rose to my feet and sluggishly made my way out of the cemetery. Spider-Man, raspy voice Kara. Why yes, player. Spider-Man, what happened while I was gone? Get the information from the nearest Wi-Fi. On it. After a few seconds, the news of what happened reached me, and I couldn't help but feel relieved and proud. It was Spider-Boy, or as I knew him, Peter Parker, who had managed to stop the Vulture and keep the ferry from disaster. In this timeline, things seemed to have worked out a bit easier for him than in the original one, and I couldn't help but smile at the thought. I remembered the training simulations I had designed for him, and it was heartening to see that they had paid off. It seemed like he had improved so much, and I couldn't have been happier for him. The burden he carried seemed to have lessened, and that was a weight off my shoulders too. Back then, there was a moment when Tony Stark had considered taking away his suit, but I was glad that didn't happen in this version of events. Peter had his full abilities at his disposal, and it made the fight relatively smoother for him. I hope Tony doesn't mind that I hacked into his satellite. Nay, fuck it. Spider-Man, Gara, show me my stats and the rewards that I got. Yes, players. Displaying stats and new skills. Player, carry to Josu Valdez. Level, 97. EXP, 35,232,58,000. HP, 370,372,000. Prestige, 7. Hero, Spider-Man, Miles Morales. STR, 386. End, 372. INT, 351. Dex, 400. Vit, 372. Stat points, SP, 0. Spider-Man, show me the new skills. Showing new skills, gotten after Civil War. Damage empowerment, the user becomes stronger, faster, more durable, etc. as they receive damage from their opponents, environment, or by themselves. They may be empowered by physical damage, mental damage, or soul damage. Lethal damage can give a, near, maximum boost on the attacks of the user of this ability. Activates after a battle. Combat adaptation, the player's fighting style, tactics, and abilities automatically adapt to be equal or superior to the opponent's style of fighting, whether armed or unarmed, making an opponent's attack useless after a prolonged battle. Spider-Man, huh? So I have a rip-off version of Zenkai Boost and Enhanced Adaptation based on combat skills, neat. Damage Empowering is activating. Calculating Enhancement. Due to the player receiving immense pain after being injured by Dark Astin repeatedly and dying by a headshot the player will get a 10x boost due to injuries sustained and a 20x boost for surviving death. Toxin, you're welcome, you would have died because of me. Spider-Man, yeah, yeah, thanks. 
times 30x boost will be given to the player. Status points, 3 by 30 equals 90. 90 stats points have been given. All skills will be upgraded by 30. The level of the player will increase by 30. Spider-Man, okay, this skill is kinda broken. Congrats, player. All skills are at max level, to further increase their power you need to reach Prestige Master. Congrats, player. You've reached Prestige 8. Spider-Man, smirks this is getting really good. Stat points, 120. Spider-Man, 90 from the skill and 30 more from leveling, nice. I'm just gonna put all of my stats to reach 400 and dump the last 6 on dexterity. There we go, perfectly balanced. I could have put it differently but I want it to be balanced. As I perused the news with a furrowed brow, my attention was drawn to a surreal sight, a figure clad in a replica of my costume, mercilessly assaulting innocent people with cruel intensity. The revelation of Craven, donning my attire, sent shockwaves through my consciousness. What could possibly drive him to commit such perverse acts under the guise of my identity? In the midst of my perplexity, my spider sense surged with an almost preternatural urgency. In an instant, I was transported to a disorienting expanse of pure white, where a nightmarish tableau unfolded before my eyes. There stood Craven, bearing my likeness, locked in a savage confrontation with none other than Peter, just a young, vulnerable kid. The ferocity with which Craven pursued Peter was chilling, an unyielding determination that disregarded the boy's tender age and innocence. I watched in silent agony as he hunted the young hero like a beast, reveling in the torment he inflicted upon him. But it was the sight that unfolded next, a cruel revelation that shattered my soul. There, in the heart of Craven's domain, Peter hung, suspended like a macabre trophy on the wall. He had been crucified, a gruesome spectacle of suffering, held captive by the sadistic whims of his merciless tormentor. No. 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 I'll kill him. I'll fucking kill him. Don't you dare. Craven. I will kill you, Craven. Small time skip. Seeking aid from my esteemed ally in Wakanda, I initiated the call, my voice tinged with a mixture of hope and desperation. To my surprise, it was none other than Black Panther's sister, a remarkable individual in her own right, who responded to my plea. A twinge of awe washed over me, recognizing the significance of conversing with such a distinguished figure from the Wakandan realm. As she arrived on a small vessel, a wave of emotions engulfed me, gratitude for her willingness to assist and apprehension due to the anger seething within me. Her welcome, warm and familiar, while simultaneously betraying traces of trepidation in the presence of my enraged disposition. Though I endeavored to maintain courtesy, the intensity of my indignation was unmistakable. The turmoil I grappled with threatened to overshadow the amity we once shared, and I yearned to contain the tumult of emotions surging within me. My heart ached with the weight of my burden, the urgency of reaching New York amplifying the storm of emotions that raged within. I knew I had to get there swiftly, to confront the situation that had ignited the inferno of fury within me. Thus, I implored her to hasten our journey, to traverse the distance with utmost speed. Cherry, Carito, W what's wrong? You haven't spoken since we launched. What's troubling you? Carito, everything is fucking wrong. Cherry, what do you mean? Carito, remember about the ducks? The enemies that I told you about? Cherry, yeah, I remember. Did another one appear? Carito, yeah, and that fucker was able to kill me and is now after my student. Shuri, what? Carito, so I need this ship to go as fast as possible because if he kills my student, I will never be the same. Shuri, why yes. Don't worry, Carito. I'll make sure you make it. Carito, thank you. Shuri, do you think we can help? Carito, as much as I would love backup, you can't even damage a dark. Shuri, clicks tongue. Carito, yup. That's basically everyone's reaction. By the way. How's the suit coming along? Shuri, you asked for a lot of complicated stuff for that suit you know? Carito, sorry, but hey, I did help you by giving you very useful blueprints. Shuri, how did you even come up with all of that? Carito, thoughts I didn't I just remember all of the items all of the spider menus. With a lot of bonuses thanks to the system. Speaking I got most of the ideas from Stark, and also made a few other ideas with his stuff. Shuri, that's pretty damn smart, even if most of your ideas are based out of Starks. Carito, I guess. Though, I'll definitely be smarter if I lived at Wakanda. Shuri, well, I can make that happen. Carito, for real? Shuri, duh, head scientist and princess of Wakanda? Carito, oh damn, right. Shuri, plus my brother respects you. 
Clarito, he does. Cherry, yeah, he said that you were right about the whole thing with Barnes and wants to apologize for it. Also, the fact that you redirected a bomb that can take out the entirety of America to the middle of nowhere in the ocean. That was pretty brave. Clarito, it better be brave, taking that explosion in the face hurts like a bitch. Cherry, how did you even survive an explosion of that magnitude? Clarito, just don't tell this to anyone. It was my symbiote suit. Shuri, symbiote, what's that? Clarito, I can tell you later, I know your curiosity will consume you. Spider sense I'm dropping here. Shuri, wait what? With a swift surge of determination, I rise from my position as toxin enshrouds me in a familiar embrace of my suit. With unwavering focus, I channel my formidable hacking prowess, commandeering control of the ship's systems with unyielding resolve. Employing my expertise, I exert a forceful command, compelling the ship's hangar doors to part before me, granting passage to my mission's next chapter. Cherry, Clarito, you do know we're above the clouds right? Spider-Man, not my first rodeo. With an audacious leap, I propel myself from the confines of the ship, plunging into the boundless expanse of the sky. The dazzling lights of New York City sprawl below, a mesmerizing mosaic of civilization that spreads like a living tapestry. As I descend, the symbiote reacts instinctively, embracing me with its uncanny abilities, allowing me to glide gracefully through the air. My journey across the cityscape is a breathtaking dance, a fusion of symbiotic grace and human intuition. I saw through the urban labyrinth with seamless precision, the bustling life below like a vibrant tapestry unfurling before my eyes. In a matter of moments, I arrive at Queens, my destination firmly in sight. Landing on the walls of Peter's apartment, I approach the window with a mix of apprehension and urgency. The room seems undisturbed, devoid of any immediate threat, but my senses betray the presence of something amiss. My gaze falls upon a seemingly innocuous sticky note, bearing a chilling message that sends a chill down my spine. Hunt me, the ominous words, accompanied by a picture of Peter and May, lead to the disconcerting revelation that they have been ensnared within some malevolent dungeon. The rage that surges within me is palpable my fists clenching tightly, blood seeping from my knuckles. Fueled by fury and desperation, I wield my exceptional hacking skills to decipher the cryptic coordinates inscribed on the sticky note. The darkness that envelopes this information intrigues me, a gateway, an invitation to the lair of Craven himself. Though my past attempts to traverse portals had proven futile, the dark aura surrounding this particular message grants me a unique passage. My concentration intensifies, honing my focus to open the portal that will lead me to confront Craven and rescue Peter and May. With a deep sigh, I stretch my body, loosening my muscles, preparing for the imminent confrontation that awaits. My eyes blaze with determination as I step through the portal, propelled by a resolute purpose that drives me forward, ready to face the malevolence that awaits on the other side. Spider-Man, okay, Craven. It's time to end this. This will be the last hunt you'll ever have. Craven Poff. Upon reuniting with my family, we engaged in a somber discourse, delving into the unsettling events that had transpired. Their expressions betrayed profound shock and concern, their gaze fixed upon me, the one who had embarked on a tumultuous journey that had pushed me to the brink of sanity. I could sense their genuine worry, but I was determined not to succumb to their pity. With resolute resolve, I steered the conversation away from my inner turmoil, redirecting our focus to the pressing matter at hand. There were weightier issues to confront, and I intended to address them with clarity and purpose. As we grappled with the gravity of the situation, I sought to uphold a semblance of composure, shielding my family from the full extent of my inner turmoil. Dark Craven, the spider, is alive. Dark Sasha, what? How? We killed him. We all saw IT. Dark Halia, sure, I don't understand, how is he alive? Dark Hana, getting used to the prosthetic jaw why yeah? How is T that possible? Dark Vladimir, GRRR. Dark Craven, it's certainly weird, no one should survive a bullet through the head. I even made sure to weaken the symbiote enough for him not to recover but he still lived. That symbiote is something else. Dark Sasha, is that why you capture that world's real Spider-Man and aunt? Dark Craven, I didn't want to do such a cowardly tactic. Dark Hannah, if it's to protect our family I don't care. Pride doesn't matter at this moment. That spider isn't afraid to end our lives even after we beg. Dark Craven, he's gonna come here, we are gonna have a territorial advantage but he won't. Dark Halia sure, then we should get ready, set all traps, and get our weapons. As the Craven of family departed to tend to their respective tasks, Sasha remained behind, 
a subtle indication that she sought a moment of private conversation. Her lingering presence suggested an unspoken message she wished to convey, an untold narrative that she felt compelled to share with me. Dark Sasha, honey? Dark Craven, yes, my love? Dark Sasha, if anything happens, I want you to know that I love you. Dark Craven, hesitates yes. I love you too. In a moment of profound emotion, I enfolded my wife in a passionate kiss, as if seeking to imprint the intensity of our love upon that tender connection. Our lips met with an ardent fervor, conveying unspoken sentiments that transcended mere words. It was an embrace of fervent affection, a tribute to the depth of our bond. As we reluctantly parted, I turned my gaze toward the windows, the anticipation building within me, the essence of the spider, an integral part of my identity, drew closer, akin to a long-awaited arrival at the sanctuary of my home. Dark Craven, come, spider, we are ready for you. No poff. Beneath the opulent expanse of the mansion lay a vast, somber cell, a confined space that housed two figures of profound significance. Within the confines of this dimly lit chamber were none other than Peter and May Parker, their presence hinting at the gravity of the situation that had befallen them. As Peter stirred from slumber, the weight of distress gripped his heart, memories of the harrowing assault from Craven resurfacing with a jolt of panic. In that moment of awakening, he found himself disoriented and fearful the aftermath of the confrontation shrouded in uncertainty. His gaze fell upon his beloved aunt, May, lying unconscious on the floor beside him. Relief washed over him as he observed the absence of visible injuries, yet concern gnawed at his soul, for he could not fathom the nature of their current predicament. Peter, Aunt May, are you all right? May, why yes Peter. I'm fine, just scared. Peter, don't worry, I won't let anything happen to you. Question mark Peter? Peter, W.H. shows there? Is that you? Craven was IT. Question mark calm down, boy. My name is Madam Webb, and I'm accompanied by two other spider women. Peter, wait, what the hell are talking about? Spider women? Anya, hey. My name is Anya Karazan and I'm Chikarana from Mexico. Julia, and I'm Julia Carpenter. Spider woman. Peter, what the hell is happening? May, wait, so there are more spider people? Madam Webb. There's always been many Spider-Men and women across the web of life but we have entered the dark multiverse or darkness dimension. Whichever you want to call it. Peter, W what? Madam Webb, the multiverse is real Peter and your master is the guardian of our multiverse alongside many others. Peter, wait, slow down. I don't even know where I am. May, please, we don't even know what's going on. Madam Webb, to explain things simply. And this might sound hard to believe but I only have such limited knowledge about this place. Peter, well, I got the we being on another dimension thing down, kinda. Madam Webb, well, how do I explain this? We are in a dimension outside of our stories. May, what? Peter, Peter.x has stopped working. Anya, it gets worse, trust me. I still don't get it. Julia, yup, me neither. Peter, ah, uh, outside of stories? Madam Webb, well, um, the easiest example would be, we live in a book or comic and this place is a higher realm that keeps our stories as a means to travel to different realities, like, our stories here are kept inside some sort of, library, I'm not sure, that's as far as my knowledge goes, may, w what, does that mean that our lives are just a story written in some sort of book, Madam Webb, look, I don't know, that's all the knowledge I could gather just by eavesdropping when we were captured. Peter, wait, how were you captured? Anya, that's the weird part, we were already but we saw some sort of distortion, and all of a sudden we were here? In an abrupt and startling turn of events, Sasha and Vladimir stormed into the cell with a sense of determined urgency. The atmosphere crackled with tension as they approached Madame Webb, seizing her with a firm grip around her neck. Dark Sasha, tell me, where is the spider? I know you're connected to him. Madam Webb, struggles to breathe why you, are reap what, you sow. Dark Sasha, TCH, you're useless to me then. In a chilling display of resolve, Sasha brandished her knife with a steely grip, the glint of cold dark astine catching the light in the dimly lit cell. With a swift and calculated motion, she brought the blade against Madam Webb's neck, severing the delicate thread of life that sustained her. The silence of the room was punctuated only by the sharp intake of breath and the muted thud as Madam Webb crumpled to the floor. Julia, no. Anya, looks down with tears in her eyes. Peter, no. How could you? May, oh my god. Madame, 
gasp in fear. Dark Sasha, it's unfortunate that we couldn't give you the proper death you deserve but we don't have time now. Vladimir, you can eat the re. Kadunk. In an instant, an eerie disturbance rippled through the mansion, causing the lights to flicker and dance in a disconcerting manner. A sense of foreboding seemed to linger in the air, as if unseen forces were at play, meddling with the very fabric of reality. Then, in a crescendo of chaos, all the light bulbs in the mansion erupted in a shower of sparks, casting the entire abode into darkness. Anya, be blackout. Dark Sasha, what the hell is going on? Madam Webb, gasping eyes. Terrifying. Isn't it? Teether. Darkness. This. Is the reaping. You have. Made a spider. Very very. Angry. Sasha's nervous scalp is barely concealed as cold sweat beads on her forehead. With a sense of urgency, she instructs Vladimir to assist his brother and sister. He complies promptly, hastening to their aid with a shared understanding between them. The mansion bears witness to this interplay of emotions and loyalties, as the consequences of their choices ripple through its halls. In this pivotal moment, Sasha's conflicted character emerges, navigating the complexities of her actions and the weight of responsibility that lies ahead. Upstairs. Dark Anna, how did he got rid of all the power in the mansion? He even made the generators explode. Hell, this place runs with supernatural electricity, so how? Dark Alia sure, I don't know sis, opens the room where Craven called the reunion father. Is he here? Father, where is he? Dark Anna, idiot. Shut up. Use your senses. Don't give away our location. As the echoes of Sasha's nervous gulp reverberated through the room, a sense of trepidation lingered in the air, its palpable presence underscoring the gravity of their circumstances. The siblings, attuned to every sound, caught wind of Vladimir's approach as he stealthily made his way into the chamber. Yet, as fate would have it, a sinister force lay in wait, poised to strike with an eerie precision. In a macabre twist of events, the room bore witness to an unsettling spectacle. Just as Vladimir drew near the windows, a serpentine tendril emerged from the shadows, snaking its way with preternatural swiftness, seizing him in its vice-like grasp. The abruptness of the attack left little time for reaction, and before anyone could intervene, Vladimir was swiftly yanked outside, his form swallowed by the darkness that lay beyond. Dark Beast Vladimir, Grow. Dark Alia Shaw, Vladimir, come and fight like a man you coward starts shooting where Vlad was taken. Dark Anna, don't you see that thing isn't a man? He's the spider, father's greatest nemesis. Especially this one, he's different. Even after killing him he still returns from the dead. So I suggest staying close, he's gonna take us out one by one. With a calculated grace, Spider-Man descended the stairs of the mansion, his form concealed by the subtle shroud of his camouflage skill. As he reached the dimly lit basement, a discerning eye would notice a glint of vigilance in his gaze. Upon scanning the area, his sharp senses immediately caught sight of ominous blood trails, marking a trail that beckoned him to follow. Yet, even in the midst of curiosity, an instinctive caution seized him. His spider senses, attuned to the faintest fluctuations in the environment, warned of unseen perils that lurked ahead. Spider-Man, TCH, I thought I threw you to kingdom come. Bring it, ugly. Amidst the tumultuous clash of titans, Vladimir's feral roar reverberated through the air a testament to the primal intensity that consumed the once human beast. With a surge of brute force, he lunged at Spider-Man, crashing through a wall with a destructive momentum that threatened to hurl them both into the nearby fountain. Yet, the hero's resolute determination held firm, and with deft precision, he planted his feet firmly, arresting Vladimir's wild charge in its tracks. Employing a technique of judo mastery, Spider-Man seized the opportunity and executed a swift, calculated maneuver hurling the monstrous foe into the fountain's depths. In the drenched confines of the fountain, Vladimir struggled to regain his footing, only to find himself ensnared in the spider's web of retribution. With deliberate intent, the hero activated his venom and delivered a surging charge of electricity, causing Vladimir to convulse in agony, his anguished roars echoing through the night. As the beast writhed in pain, the spider, ever tenacious, advanced with an aura of menace, his very presence a portent of justice delivered. With a calculated gesture, he seized Vladimir's grotesque maw and, with an unyielding grip, inserted his hand, ensnaring the monster in a deadly embrace of spider silk. The battle of wills played out in a harrowing symphony, the spider's web encroaching upon Vladimir's respiratory passages, constricting his every breath, an inexorable force choking the life from the one's human soul. Vladimir's desperate struggle to free himself only intensified the grip of the insidious web.
In the dim light of the fountain, the monster's demise was etched in tragic hues, his once menacing countenance now contorted and purpling, a chilling manifestation of the inescapable grip of mortality. In this haunting tableau, the hero's determination and prowess were a testament to the indomitable spirit that stood against the darkness, resolute in its pursuit of justice and protection. Spider-Man, so that's what happens when you shot spider webs inside a person's mouth. In this case, monster. In a moment of heightened awareness, the spider's finely tuned spider sense tingled with anticipation, warning him of an imminent threat. Yet, he remained undaunted, his demeanor unwavering, as he cast an almost quizzical gaze upon the oncoming projectile. With an almost imperceptible tilt of his head, he deftly sidestepped the bullet's path, evading the danger with uncanny ease. Alia Shaw's sinister figure materialized before him, his sniper rifle held with malicious intent, and beside him stood Dana, her daggers poised like deadly serpents ready to strike. Undeterred by the odds stacked against him, the spider's lips curled into a knowing smirk. Then, as if summoned by the shadows themselves, the spider effortlessly activated his camouflage skill, a master of stealth blending into the dim surroundings. His disappearance was swift. Madam Webpoff. I was slowly dying, this cut is fatal. There's nothing to do, but... This Spider-Man. Is he even a Spider-Man? Even as life flows through me I can feel him. His rage. His power. It's unlike any Spider-Man that I've seen. I'm not sure if I can even recognize him as a typical Spider-Man. Most Spider-Men are pure or have a moral code that keeps them in line. But this one? He does it without a care in the world. God help us. He's... He's a monster. Devoid of mercy and pain. He is quickly losing his humanity. Spider-Man. What have you done? No poff. Alia Shaw's impatience manifests in a subtle click of his tongue, a faint indication of his frustration as his shot misses its intended mark. Dark Alia Shaw, he dodged the bullet. Dark Anna, and he did it with style too. Dark Alia Shaw, this bullet moved at 4,000 feet per second. I even upgraded it after we killed him making it double. Was he that fast before? Unbeknownst to the others, the spider had silently ascended above them a ghostly presence veiled within the shadows. With unparalleled swiftness, he unleashed his webs, ensnaring Elia Shaw with uncanny precision, and with a decisive pull, hoisted him into the embrace of darkness. The visceral shrieks of horror that escaped Elia Shaw's lips echoed through the night. Dark Elia Shaw, ha, Anna, help, can't even struggle. Spider-Man, toxin, feed. K-R-N-N-C-H-H-H-H-S-K-L-C-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-H-
What has happened? Where's my family? Dark Craven, dead, lost, eaten? I don't know. Dark Sasha, where is my family? Dark Craven, disgusted shut it, woman. Slaps her I should have noticed my mistake in marrying you. You're too weak to protect this family and my tribe. Dark Sasha, angry no? I'll show you weak. As the haze of Craven's brutal slap began to dissipate, Sasha found herself awash in a surreal scene. The hunter was no longer present, but instead, she confronted the enigmatic figure of Spider-Man, an unmistakable crimson mask splattered with the evidence of a fierce battle. The sight of his blood-stained visage left Sasha in a state of bewilderment and panic. Driven by instinct, she resorted to her firearm, discharging rounds with unrelenting desperation. The bullets struck the spider's countenance, causing his head to recoil. Yet to her astonishment, the relentless hero remained unyielding, an impenetrable fortress against her barrage. The deflected bullets dropped to the floor like spent embers, failing to leave even the faintest mark upon his resilient facade. The symbiote's potent embrace seemed to bestow upon him an uncanny resilience, rendering him seemingly invulnerable to her futile attempts at inflicting harm. With unwavering purpose, he disarmed her with calculated finesse, dismantling her weapon with practiced ease. And in a moment that showcased his nobility, he refrained from resorting to lethal force in the presence of innocent bystanders. Forming an improvised hammer with his symbiotic appendages, he delivered a resounding blow upon Sasha's face, rendering her unconscious. His actions, a delicate balance between raw power and restraint, revealed the intricate complexity of a hero's moral dilemma. Julia, oh my god, you're a Spider-Man? Chills go down her spine? Spider-Man, starts freeing all of them take care of Cassandra. Sees Sasha wake up abnormally quick and starts running away. Peter, you are Mr. Spider-Man what are you going to do? Spider-Man, I'm going to kill this entire family. Aunt May, no. You shouldn't kill. Spider-Man, after the hell, these people put me through? They literally killed me. This is payback. Aunt May, and you teaching my boy how to be a murderer? Spider-Man, I'm teaching him not to be one. I want him to be better, and not end up like me. With a masterful flicker of his consciousness, the spider activates his camouflage skill, vanishing from plain sight as though melding with the shadows themselves. His resolute purpose leads him to pursue Sasha, a determined quest veiled in the cloak of secrecy. As he embarks on this path, he leaves behind a wake of curiosity and uncertainty, an enigmatic figure traversing the boundaries of light and darkness. Unbeknownst to him, Anya, driven by a yearning to avert tragedy, decides to follow in his elusive footsteps. Her steps are imbued with both trepidation and an unwavering commitment to intervene, to sway the course of events unfolding before them. Madam Webb, he's, too, far gone. There's, no helping, him. Julia, hush, I'm trying to help you. Takes off Madam Webb's blindfold. Madam Webb, you're a very, beautiful girl, when was there? Last time, someone told, you that? Julia, w wait, you aren't blind? Madam Webb, I'm sorry, there isn't much time to explain. And for what I'm about to do next. My final sin. For the good of the web. Julia, Cassandra, what? In a transcendental display of mystical prowess, the air around Madam Webb and Julia shimmers with an ethereal luminescence, a radiant tapestry of swirling yellow light. Within this hallowed glow, a profound transformation begins to unfold, as the mantle of wisdom and foresight is passed from one to the other. Julia, someone has to see with fresh eyes. Oh my god. In the hallways. Dark Sasha, Sege, he's here. The spider is here. Help. Spider-Man, camouflage activated you do know he doesn't love you, right? You were just a bitch to carry his seed. He even slapped you in the face and called you weak. I agree with him, you could never lead this family to greatness. Why? Because you messed with the wrong Spider-Man. I will be the one to end you and your family. I will kill you, slowly and painfully. You. Will. Die. Today. You fucking bitch. Spider-Man gracefully descends before her, and with a forceful impact, she is knocked to the ground, her horrified scream piercing the air. Spider-Man, who was it? Oh right, Gain. I remember when I read the comic that you stabbed him in the heart with no mercy so I'm gonna do something he did quite a lot. With an almost imperceptible swiftness, the spider bridges the distance between them, his movements marked by an uncanny agility that defies comprehension. In a hauntingly intimate gesture, he places the palm of his hand gently against Sasha's face, a touch that elicits a gasp of astonishment from her trembling lips. Spider-Man, rip, and tear. 
in a moment that blurs the boundaries between reality and nightmare. A visceral cry of agony escapes Sasha's lips as the relentless Spider-Man employs his wall-crawling prowess to unspeakably severe her face. The echo of her anguished screams reverberates through the halls, a haunting symphony of torment that pierces the air. Amidst this harrowing tableau, Sasha's visage contorts in unspeakable pain, her very identity now marred by the horrifying act of the spider. The crimson cascade of blood falls as a somber testament to the depth of suffering she endures. With desperate pleas, she implores the relentless hero to cease his merciless assault, her voice a haunting cry of desperation amidst the torment that engulfs her. Dark Sasha, no. Wait. Wait. I'm sorry. Please. Spare me. Spider-Man. That's fucking ironic, isn't it? How many, huh? How many? How many told you those same words? How many Spider-Men and women did you kill for the thrill of the hunt? How many of them cried as you butchered them? How many? In a fateful moment that defies the trajectory of cruelty, Anna steps forward with unyielding courage, interposing herself between the relentless Spider-Man and her mother's impending torment. Dark Anna, you won't touch her over my dead body. Spider-Man, your call. In an unforeseen twist of events, Anya's swift and decisive action interrupts the relentless spider's rampage. With an audacious kick to Anna's face, Anya stands as an enigmatic force, momentarily disrupting the course of events that threaten to escalate into further devastation. Arana, why you were really gonna kill them? Spider-Man, not my first rodeo. Now go back Arana, don't interrupt me. In his thoughts did she just damage a duck? Arana, I'm not going anywhere. I won't let you kill. Spider-Man, sure you will. As Spider-Man and Arana tread resolutely down the dimly lit halls, their purposeful steps echo the weight of their mission. Their shared determination cuts through the ominous atmosphere, a symphony of resolve amidst the lingering shadows. And there, in a haunting tableau that crystallizes the haunting enigma of their pursuit, they behold the enigmatic figure of Craven. Sasha, still shrouded in uncertainty, covers her face, a poignant reminder of the unspeakable ordeal she had faced. Anna, standing by her father's side, embodies the complexity of familial loyalty amidst a narrative veiled in mystery and retribution. Dark Craven, child, you should know that this Spider-Man isn't like the others. He does what needs to be done. He's a true warrior and hunter. Because of me, he was able to reach new heights, and because of me, he is stronger. He's more of a worthy foe than he already was. The ultimate prize. Now stands before me. Pulls his machete and shield out are you ready, Spider? Or do I need to kill your student? Within the blink of an eye, Spider-Man unleashes his lateral repulsion, a display of extraordinary kinetic force that propels him forward with unparalleled velocity. With uncanny precision, his fist collides with Craven's shield, and the clash of strength reverberates through the very foundation beneath them. Spider-Man, I fucking dare you, bastard. Spider-Man's relentless assault on Craven's shield gains an almost mythical intensity, an outpouring of pent-up fury and raw power. Each punch lands with a thunderous force, resonating through the very essence of the darkened forest. The ground trembles beneath the weight of this visceral battle, cracking under the strain as shockwaves of electricity ripple outward like a tempest unleashed. Amidst the chaos, Sasha and Anna, driven by their own fervent desperation, assail Arana, their minds consumed by the turmoil of the moment. Unaware of the subtle presence that skulks beneath the shadows, they overlook the hundreds of spiders steadily converging upon them their unyielding march a prelude to an unexpected twist of fate. As Anu attempts to ensnare Arana from behind, the hero's defiant response shatters the illusion of control, the young huntress met with a resolute slam to the ground. The unfolding events push the bounds of reality, as spiders, seemingly summoned by a mystical power, surround the huntress and her mother. In an awe-inspiring spectacle, Spider-Man's unrestrained fury reaches an apex, culminating in a venom-infused punch that obliterates Graven's shield and leaves the relentless hunter defenseless. The hero's unbridled assault on his adversary becomes a captivating portrait of power unhinged, a stark contrast to the measured conduct of a traditional hero. As Arana rushes to intervene, her desperate plea to halt the rampage reveals the profound complexities of this harrowing encounter. The ever-present interplay of humanity's dual nature, where justice and vengeance converge in an enigmatic dance. Arana, Spider-Man. Please stop. He's defeated. Stop. Spider-Man, as long as he breathes he can still take hits. He's fucking dying today. In an ethereal moment, Julia, now imbued with the powers of Madame Webb, appears beside Spider-Man, seeking to halt his relentless rampage. Julia Webb, Spider. Are you sure you wanna do this? Your life won't get any easier. 
If you continue this, you will continue to suffer. Spider-Man, nothing goes as planned in this accursed reality. If you can't handle suffering then you shouldn't have been born in the first place. Dark Craven, on the brink of death do, it, you, have to, kill me, please. It has, to be, you, please. Spider-Man. Amidst the charged atmosphere, Spider-Man's gaze rests upon Julia and Craven, each pleading for a different course of action, a moral quandary laid bare. Behind the inscrutable mask, a subtle smile emerges, hinting at the complexities within. Julia Webb, thank you, Spider. In her mind why can't I read his mind? Spider-Man pulls a rifle from his inventory kill yourself. Gives the rifle to Craven. Arana, W what? Spider-Man, what is wrong with you? Julia Webb, Spider, don't. Dark Craven, H huh? Spider-Man, your brother is dead. Your two sons are dead. Your daughter is dead. Your wife is dead. I won't give you the luxury of getting the easy way out. So, kill, your, self. Dark Craven, W what? You dare. Why you dare? Spider-Man, if you don't then I'll forcefully imprison you in this dark void. Alone, no Spider-Men to entertain you. No family to cling to. No jungle to live in. You're no human to me. Just a virus that needs to be destroyed and easily to be forgotten. You're so pathetic that you always need to constantly prove yourself to be better. Better than me. And I am. I will haunt you in life and death. The only way to free yourself of this curse is to take your own life and realize just how much of a wasted potential you really are. Craven looks in horror at what the spider was telling him. Him? Wasted potential? How can that be? He did everything possible to be better than his nemesis. He went through hell and back to prove he was better. How dare this spider insult him like this? But in the back of Craven's mind, another voice started to fill him with doubt, error, and mistakes. Everything he's been through up until now. Every hunt, every kill. It was a cycle. A cycle of the spider. He never became better. He was already playing around right into the spider's hands, and he's been in that hand for all of his life, wasting his time, proving himself to be better than someone who beat him since the beginning. He might have killed many spider's men but. Why did he keep killing more? He went through so many dimensions to kill and kill some more. What was he trying to prove? Then it clicked. He turned insane. The more time the spider lingered in his head the more he lost his life, his reason, his will. From the beginning he obligated himself to call it a test of strength, will, skill, experience for each time he killed a spider but, that's not true, is it? He was obsessed with the idea of spider man He just thought of all the possibilities, the power and strength. But this path, has just led him to despair. He wasn't himself since the day he accepted to become a dark his humanity stripped from his being and replaced with oblivion. This darkness, this, curse, is what drove him so deep into the pits of hell that there was no way of returning back. He's lost, everything, before it all even began. Once he had a life but the darkness stripped it away from him, and he was such a fool for letting it consume him. He's right is what he thought, I am incompetent, a fool, a maniac, all negativity showered him like how one drowns in the dark deeps of the sea. All sides were dark. Not even a spotlight of the sun could be seen. Craven's mind is completely empty. Devoided of life. He made a mistake and it kept piling up. He lost his way and kept walking blindly. No matter how much he searches for a reason just a simple reason to think of salvation, of living. The spider was right. The only way to free himself from this curse of despair. Was to die. By his own hands. Insanity. At his peak. Dark Craven, every man, has there, spider. And this time, I was yours. I have made a realization, after all these years, all those hunts, I only did it for the thrill. But none were with honor. We were each other's spider, huh? Did I not realize that? You. You're right. I have lost my way. My pride. Was shattered long before I meet you. All this time I've never known peace nor happiness, just rage and death. This. Is my farewell. As you said, I wasted my potential long ago, when I became insane. Just like my mother, goodbye. In a haunting moment, Craven seizes the rifle, placing its cold barrel within the confines of his own mouth, an act of chilling desperation. The room falls into a hushed silence, a poignant tableau of human frailty and torment. The echo of the trigger pull reverberates, shattering the realm of reality, as the scene unfolds in incomprehensible brutality. In the wake of this shocking act, 
the gathered spider women stand transfixed, a collective gasp escaping their lips, their eyes wide with disbelief. The spider's actions, veering so far from the realm of heroism, bear witness to the complexities of the human soul, the fathomless depths of darkness and light that dwell within. Spider-Man, it is done. Arana, H. How? Could you? Spider-Man, how could I? Ha! Huh, I wonder that myself. Julia Webb. Spider-Man, now, I'm not just going to senselessly leave him on the ground. With a solemn grace, Spider-Man bears Craven's lifeless form into the sanctum of his mansion. In the heart of the living room, a bespoke coffin materializes, a vessel for a soul whose journey has reached its somber end. Unfolding his unique abilities, the masked hero adorns Craven's form with newfound dignity, a final homage, dressing him in a tuxedo. The air of mourning is palpable, as the mansion's walls seem to echo the weight of the loss. With reverent hands, Spider-Man lays Craven to rest within the coffin, an acknowledgement of the complex nature of their intertwined destinies. As blood seeps from Craven's wounds, it serves as a poignant reminder of the mortality that unites all beings, the fragility that underpins the very fabric of existence. In a gesture of profound empathy, Spider-Man summons an image, a captured fragment of Craven's past, woven together with his parents, immortalized in a frame. This poignant assemblage is a tribute to the legacy of a man, driven by his past, and entwined in the tapestry of existence, an epitaph for a life defined by duality. Spider-Man, you! had sad life craven. You had the riches and comfort of money. Much good could have been done with your influence and popularity. But because you never realized that your mother's mental issues had passed on to you, you lost your way completely. I hope you didn't mind me using my telepathy to see fragments of your mind. I just needed to know why you were so obsessed with us Spider-Men. And now I know why. Your mother. She was killed by spiders when she was thrown inside the asylum wasn't she? Your pride wouldn't allow you to seek help. Even when you called for help your anger just increased because you felt less of a man because you sought assistance. And when you impersonated me because you thought it was a way to be better than me, your last remaining screws in your head had fallen and you went mad. You always kept a calm composure which was hard to notice those signs. But. You were hurting. You never did stop hurting. And this moment. This last hunt was your final attempt to redeem yourself and you still failed. You had it wrong this entire time. The Spider-Men were never the ones hunting you. You were hunting yourself. You were your own worst enemy. And Craven. You will forever be locked in the most dangerous hunt there is. The one in your mind. With an inscrutable demeanor, the spider diverts his gaze, leaving May and Peter to observe from a distance. Their anxious expressions, etched with concern. Spider-Man, one last thing. Looks back at the coffin you proved yourself as my toughest enemy yet, with that you can rest knowing that you were the one who gave me the most trouble out of all of my past villains. Walks past May and Peter lets go home. Peter, okay, Mr. Spider-Man. Spider-Man, Carito. Peter, what? Spider-Man, my name is Carito. May, Carito. Spider-Man, yeah? May, why did you kill him, even after what you said in front of his coffin? Spider-Man, because if I didn't our world would be consumed by darkness like this place is and all the rules will change. The last time I liberated a world from darkness the Dark Lord kidnapped children and put them through hellish training. Some would die in the process and a few would become assassins. The system in that world was also corrupt. Drug lords would roam around doing whatever they wanted, and all the police stations were corrupted. Nowhere in that place was safe. And for our world to die it only needs one dark entity to envelop it under its control and I'm not going to let that happen. I have people to care for and I'll be damned if I saw Peter or anyone else die by their hands because I let them live. May, be but what about their families? They also have lives. Spider-Man, they lost their humanity when they became darks, after that it just goes downhill for them. A palpable air of solemnity envelops the gathering as May chooses to remain reticent, her heart heavy with emotions left unspoken. In the wake of the tumultuous events, the spider takes the mantle of leadership, guiding Peter and May towards their own reality. Peter, Mr. Carito, you aren't coming with us? Spider-Man, I will just gotta lead Julia and Anya back to their worlds. Peter, oh okay, be safe. Spider-Man, he throws Peter a USB. Peter, catches it what's this? Spider-Man, with the holograms, I made you a program of accuracy, skill, and control. The full body control program. With that, you were able to save the people from the ferry but also defeat Vulture. I know it was a difficult fight but thanks to Tony's suit that he made for you, it should have been enough equipment to handle the threat. 
Now for this next regimen, you're going to practice martial art and your spider senses. May, or, I liked it more as Peter Tingle. Peter, spider sense sounds cooler though. Thank you, Mr. Carito. I'll keep training as requested. Now that I know that you have a pretty important job keeping the multiverse in check, I can imagine how tiresome that should be. Spider-Man, you have no idea kid. Now go, I'll be back. Hopefully, I don't jinx myself by saying that. With an understated gesture of camaraderie, the spider offers a swift, yet poignant, head pat to Peter, an unspoken gesture of encouragement and empathy that transcends words. Likewise, a dignified nod is bestowed upon May, a gesture of respect, acknowledging the resilience and strength that defines her spirit. As the portal seals shut, cocooning Peter and May within the embrace of their own reality, the spider remains, flanked by the two spider women. Julia Webb, well, spider, lead the way. Anya, MHM. Spider-Man, reveals his face and sighs all right, let's go. Inside Craven's memories, I saw a way for you two to return to your Earths. We will enter the library that resides in the outside or you can call the library the Omniverse. Julia Webb, W what? An Omniverse. Anya, I. Okay this is way above my pay grade. Julia Webb, what is the outside? I only have knowledge of our multiverse so everything outside it is just a mystery. Spider-Man, let's talk as we walk. In the boundless expanse of the enigmatic dimension, the trio of heroes strides with an air of purpose, guided by the enigmatic Spider-Man, whose movements seem to defy the conventional laws of space and time. With each twist and unexpected disappearance, the Spider-Women find themselves challenged to keep pace. Yet, the profound connection between the Spider-Women and Spider-Man transcends the limitations of mere words. As the hero weaves the tapestry of Craven's stolen memories, he offers morsels of insight, unveiling fragments of knowledge that illuminate the path ahead. In this silent exchange of recollections, the trio finds common ground, building a bridge of shared understanding amidst the ethereal expanse. Spider-Man, well, as I was saying earlier, the Omniversal Library resides at the edge of the Omniverse itself, at the edge of everything. Now, for the outside I have no clue. Julia Webb, why you don't know? Spider-Man, Craven was only shown how to travel this place, not its secrets, though. Anya, what is it, Spider-Man? Spider-Man, if my nerd instincts aren't wrong. The outside is an unexplored void that inhabits everything that exists. But that's just a web page that I found out about before I even entered the world of fiction. Anya, brain explodes. Julia Webb, everything? As in, literally everything? Spider-Man, well, that's as far as my brain can process. I might be pretty good in these theories but I can't know something that only twelfth dimensional beings and above only exist in. Julia Webb, okay, I've had enough. My brain hurts from all this crazy talk, and I thought knowing about the multiverse was a headache. Anya, quick question, Spider. Spider-Man, yeah? Anya, you said something about before I even entered the world of fiction. What do you mean by that? Spider-Man, damn, I hoped you didn't listen to that part. Well, in short, I'm from the real real world. Anya, what? Julia Webb, wait, you're from Earth 1218? Spider-Man, well, similar but where I used to live was the real world, IRL or whatever you want to call it, where real humans reside and where fiction is a concept of the human imagination. For example, comics, movies, novels, and everything related falls in the category of fiction. I and the people from the real world created the concept of fiction and imagination as a sort of entertainment. Julia Webb, wah. Now I'm just losing my mind at this point. Spider-Man, explaining this to you will be a waste of time, it's only knowledge of characters who are in the level of the one above all and higher no. Maybe some other characters are an exception but it is usually something tier one and above characters know about, though at least I think so. Anya, tears. What do you mean by tears? Spider-Man, oh. Will you look at that we finally made it to the Omniversal Library? Anya, did he just avoid my question? Julia Webb, yes he did. Amidst the enigmatic realm of dark matter that adorned the void, Spider-Man strode with an air of purpose, leading his companions towards a library of profound mystery. As they stepped into this surreal sanctuary, the atmosphere underwent a metamorphosis, an ethereal transformation akin to the shift from haunting melodies to the tranquil embrace of serenity. The heroes found themselves surrounded by an infinite array of knowledge, a boundless repository of books, comics, novels, movies, and all forms of artistic expression. 
the boundless expanse of this library seemed to mirror the enigmatic nature of the dimension itself, where the boundaries of reality and imagination blurred into an intricately woven tapestry. With the spider at the helm, they navigated through the labyrinthine shelves, each tome and narrative beckoning to be explored. The arrangement of this literary haven was nothing short of awe-inspiring, a symphony of order amidst the boundless chaos of the void. The mere act of thought summoned the desired book, gracefully flying into the hands of its seeker, a mystical communion between knowledge and intention. In the heart of this transcendent collection, the spider steered his course towards the comic section, a domain of vibrant narratives, both known and unknown. As he reached for a particular tome, an uncanny sense of decay permeated the cover, lending an air of mystique to the experience. Intrigued, he caught another book that found its way to him, revealing a similar enigmatic state. Spider-Man the Grim Hunt Spider-Man, Craven's Last Hunt The spider's countenance was tinged with perplexity as he beheld the enigmatic state of the two decayed books. An alluring enigma beckoned him forth, compelling him to delve into the mysteries concealed within these aged pages. With a deliberate resolve, he unsealed the first tome its secrets unveiled before his discerning eyes. Instantly, an alternate tapestry unfurled, a reality where the relentless craven triumphed over Spider-Man, sending shockwaves through the web-singer's consciousness. In this multifarious version, Craven's malevolence transcended his mere dimension, and he embarked on an interdimensional odyssey, relentless in his pursuit of countless Spider-Men across the vast multiverse. Yet, a more startling revelation awaited, the narrative of the Grim Hunt, once attributed to another had undergone a profound metamorphosis. In this iteration, the spider found himself inexplicably woven into the very fabric of the tale, supplanting Peter Parker's role, and effectively transforming the narrative into a distinct semblance of its former self. As the hero contemplated the bewildering implications of this altered reality, an ethereal interplay of conjectures and deductions commenced. The elusive tendrils of understanding reached out, weaving a tapestry of connections, a convergence of distinct realities and a curious fusion of destinies. Did the decay happen because Craven turned into a dark and the stories got corrupted? Once a story that was taken over by a dark, it loses its importance and gets turned into dust. Once a story is consumed by darkness it dies. Spider-Man, so that's why. Julia Webb, what's why? Spider-Man, once a story gets salted by a dark it gets corrupted, like how a file gets corrupted in a computer. In simpler terms, the darkness is a virus inside a computer. They would start fucking up everything that the computer has. The content inside the computer is the multiverse that the darks are gonna affect. And that's where I and the Guardians come into play. We are the antivirus of the system. Anya, but, why would they need Guardians? Spider-Man, because what can kill a virus inside a computer? the antivirus. Of course, sometimes the user can delete the virus if it's weak enough but because the darkness is so powerful not just in numbers but also in power, and has many varieties it has no choice but to rely on the antivirus. So that's why only guardians can affect the darkness. Eyes narrow. Anya, you seem disturbed, Spider-Man. Spider-Man, it's because I am. I may be pushing my theory on this but. I think the dark's origins are from the guardians. I think they are one and the same but with different purposes and intentions. Julia Webb, so you're saying that the Guardians were the cause of the Darkness's creation? Spider-Man, I'm not sure, this is all just from what I have observed and got from Craven's head. I know how to fix the corruption of these stories though, somehow. In the ethereal expanse of the library, as Carito, the enigmatic spider, laid his hands upon the two aged and altered tomes. A luminous notification manifested itself before his discerning gaze, another worldly message veiled in cryptic elegance. Restore this world's reality. Yes, no. A Spider-Man's inquisitive gaze lingered upon the luminous notification, a moment of contemplation ensued. The veil of uncertainty lifted, and a resolute decision was made. With a measured touch, he pressed yes, the enigmatic choice resonating through the recesses of the cosmic library. In response, the time-worn comic book surged with life, awash in a radiant yellow brilliance. The symphony of color breathed new vitality into its pages, the decayed veneer dissolving like a fleeting memory. Transmutation took hold, granting rebirth to its fading essence, as the authentic hues of the tale began to unfurl. As the rejuvenated comic exuded an aura of captivating brilliance, the profound metamorphosis reached far beyond its pages. Julia and Anya, the two spider-women bound by fate's ethereal threads, were suffused with a celestial luminosity, marking the impending return to their respective realities. Spider-Man, your world should be fixing itself by now, so I think this is goodbye. 
Julia Webb, well, it was nice to have a conversation with you. Even though your first impression on me was bone chilling. Anya, thanks for helping us. Even though you are pretty ruthless and scary, you are weirdly carrying. Spider-Man, hey, I'm nice. I just don't like darks, that's all. Within the transcendental confines of the comic's resplendent pages, an ethereal metamorphosis began to unfurl. Julia and Anya, the stalwart Spider-Women, became enveloped in a mesmerizing cascade of crystalline radiance. Julia Webb, farewell, Carito. Anya, yeah, thank you. Spider-Man, see you next time. Kerry Topoff. As I stood in the vast, eerie library, a mix of curiosity and unease danced in my heart. Seeing Julia and Anya disappear into the crystalline pages left me both amazed and concerned. The aura of this place was unlike anything I'd encountered before, and a sense of trepidation gnawed at me. My mind was still grappling with the revelations I had stumbled upon. The enigmatic presence of the Guardians and the inexplicable design of this place puzzled me deeply. The books, like whispers of forgotten tales, seemed to hold answers, yet the unfamiliarity of it all weighed heavily on my mind. Feeling a bit disoriented, I wondered if I truly belonged here. The mysterious atmosphere made me feel a little sick, like a vertigo in my soul. Was this realm intended for me, or had I ventured into a space that defied my understanding? As I continued my exploration, I couldn't help but notice the resemblance of this library to the one from the Amanco verse. A part of me wondered if it was an intentional homage or just a fascinating coincidence. Either way, the place added another layer of intrigue to the enigma that surrounded me. Despite the discomfort, my determination to uncover the truth remained firm. This peculiar library held secrets that begged to be discovered. With each step, I braced myself against the unsettling feelings, determined to unlock the hidden knowledge that lay within these boundless shelves. In this eerie and tense environment, my heart pounded anxiously, and my senses were on high alert. The silence that enveloped the library felt thick and suffocating, adding to the uncertainty of my situation. The weight of my every step was carefully measured as I navigated the dimly lit corridors, my eyes darting around, searching for any sign of movement or danger. The thought of being alone in enemy territory sent a shiver down my spine, and I took great pains to ensure that I remained hidden from prying eyes. Utilizing my camouflage skill, I blended seamlessly with the shadows, hoping to evade any potential threats that might lurk in the darkness. The vastness of the library puzzled me. Its seemingly endless rows of books, comics, and novels made me wonder how far this place truly extended. The notion that one could simply think of a book and have it fly into their hands added to the mystique of this enigmatic realm. As I clung to the ceiling, invisible and vigilant, I felt a sense of trepidation building inside me. My heart raced as I heard footsteps approaching, and my instincts told me that I might not be alone in this ominous space. The fear of discovery urged me to remain concealed, to wait until the intruder passed by. Suddenly, my hidden form was met by a pair of eyes, their gaze locking with mine. In that moment, time seemed to stand still as we both sized each other up, unsure of the other's intentions. The tension in the air was palpable, and I could feel the weight of the encounter hanging heavily on my shoulders. Question mark who are you? Why are you so deep into this library? Spider-Man, are you? It's my first time here. And uh. No one told me, what to do. Question mark lying to me is useless you know? Spider-Man, the whole vibe I'm emitting kinda sells me out doesn't it? Question mark it does, now you shall be eliminated, Guardian. In the midst of this surreal encounter, the black-winged entity unsheathed a flaming sword with fierce determination. With a single bound, it closed the distance between us in a blazing display of power. Yet, my reflexes, honed through trials and tribulations, proved sharper than before and the symbiote's newfound strength granted me the agility to evade such a swift assault. Question mark that was surprising. I just attacked you with the speed of light and you dodged it? Spider-Man, well, Spider-Man has an enemy called Lightmaster and you can guess where the reaction speed comes from. Question mark let's continue. Spider-Man, oh for the love of barely dodges another sword slash shit. Our fight continued as I was completely on the defense, I couldn't even fight back. My entire body just screams to run away from him, this dark angel looking man just seems to be in a league of his own. There were times when I had to activate my hacking skill to cancel some of his attacks that were clearly gonna kill me if it wasn't for my spider sense warning me and showing me glimpse of the future. What worried me is that I continue to feel the presence of multiple people, and our fight is gaining more and more attention. I need to get out of here but I can't even catch a moment to think because if I do this dark angel will kill me. Fuck. 
As I continued to panic more and barely dodge and cancel out the angel's attack in a distance I saw a mature lady with dark violet hair styled in a classic heim cut, purple eyes, and a well-proportioned figure. She wears a sweeping strapless light pink ball gown that resembles a Junito kimono, yet the layers seem to be mere stripes in green, blue, and red. A yellow sash-like accessory is draped around the skirt. The dress is held in place by a formal magenta obi with red padding, accessorized with a red and white aubergine. The outfit is complete with matching light pink gloves and the light green fringed scarf draped over her left shoulder. A brooch is pinned to the scarf comprising a striped flag matching her dress layers affixed to a star-shaped pendant, resembling a military medal. She also carries a cane. Her most notable accessory is the metallic horseshoe-shaped object that seemingly levitates around her head. Wait. I feel like I've seen this bitch somewhere. Question mark 001 is this thing giving you that much trouble? Dark SCP-001, he somehow cancelling all of my attacks. Usually I could end my foes with a single word but he seems to cancel that as well. Spider-Man, hey. No. I already have my hand ducks shit. Question mark si well, I'll be watching because it's interesting how someone of your level can't seem to capture this child of man. Dark SCP-001, you know Featherine, helping could be nice once in a while. Dark Featherine, but it's fun watching a godlike creature like yourself struggling to catch this insect. In the face of an unimaginable foe, fear gripped my heart, and every instinct screamed at me to flee. SCP-001, the formidable gate guardian, stood before me, a being of immense power that surpassed anything I had ever encountered. My mind struggled to process the gravity of the situation, I was hopelessly outmatched. With every swing of his flaming sword, I could feel the heat and force of his attacks, narrowly evading them by the skin of my teeth. Panic threatened to overtake me as I realized the danger I was in. This guardian was meant to watch over the Gate of Eden, and yet here he was, intent on tearing me apart. His strikes were swift and precise, leaving painful cuts on my body with each near miss. The pain was unbearable, but I forced myself to focus, to keep moving, desperate to find a way to survive. My mind raced with the limited options I had, knowing that my chances of defeating him were slim to none. In that moment, I caught a glimpse of the black windows of the library, and a daring idea formed in my mind. It was a long shot, but I had no other choice. With my heart pounding in my chest, I mustered all the courage I had left and made my move. Dark Featherine, what is the thing doing? In a moment of sheer desperation, I mustered the courage to make a life-altering decision. My heart pounded in my chest as I gazed out of the darkened library windows, uncertainty shrouding my mind. Facing the formidable gate guardian was not an option I could entertain, for his power dwarfed mine in comparison. Summoning every last ounce of willpower, I leapt through the glass, a leap of faith into the unknown. The chaos of the dark void swallowed me whole, and for an instant, I felt as if I had vanished from existence. It was a risk I had to take, anything was preferable to confronting a being of godlike proportions. Dark SCP-001, well, my target just killed himself. There's no way he's gonna survive in the void. Featherine, wow, that was anticlimactic. No poff. In the boundless expanse of the dark void, Spider-Man found himself tumbling, lost in an infinite loop of disorienting disarray. The laws of reality seemed to lose their grip on his body as unseen forces subjected him to strange and disturbing contortions. Each descent felt like an eternity, his anguished cries reverberating through the impenetrable darkness. Refusing to succumb to the torment, Spider-Man resorted to his hacking prowess, identifying a particular line of purple that beckoned to him. With a desperate punch, he shattered the spectral barrier, revealing a black hole that promptly swallowed him whole. The black hole's unforgiving gravity subjected him to spaghettification, an agonizing process of simultaneous compression and stretching. Amidst the turmoil, his body convulsed, enveloped in crackling electricity as he unleashed a final scream before seemingly disintegrating into subatomic particles. The display was akin to a glitch in the fabric of reality itself. Yet, inexplicably, as the chaos peaked, the spider-powered hero teleported to an unknown destination, his form reforming in an alien landscape. In the strange realm, Carito found himself suspended in an expansive, pristine white void devoid of discernible landmarks. He gingerly opened his eyes, surveying the surroundings, where whirlpools of voids swirled in intricate patterns, each flowing with purposeful cosmic intent. His symbiote companion, Toxin, shared his bewilderment, their confusion a shared bond in this enigmatic realm. As he attempted to gather his bearings, a curious sight emerged on the horizon, a minuscule speck, rapidly expanding in size as it approached. 
Though instinctively panicked, his heightened spider senses remained unresponsive, suggesting an absence of immediate threat. Thus, he stood his ground, watching in or as the approaching entity revealed its visage, a gargantuan whale-like creature, whose bizarre nature stirred unease within him. A mysterious presence echoed in his mind, Gara's voice manifesting as if to guide him through this cosmic enigma. Oh my god! Spider-Man, W what is it? It's the Leviathan. Spider-Man, excuse me? In the boundless cosmic expanse, the colossal Leviathan ceased its majestic movements, coming to an imposing halt before the diminutive figure of Carito. The vastness of the creature was unfathomable, leaving the spider-powered hero feeling infinitesimal in comparison to the enigmatic behemoth before him. In that suspended moment, an eerie silence enveloped them, a serene encounter between two vastly different beings. Their gaze locked, Carito's human eyes met the unfathomable depths of the whale's gaze, as if an unspoken communication transpired between them. Time seemed to slow, elongating each second into an eternity, a mesmerizing exchange that held its own sense of otherworldly significance. For several minutes, their cosmic encounter remained undisturbed, the giant whale's presence both captivating and overwhelming. The atmosphere was pregnant with intrigue, a dance of curiosity and uncertainty between two entities inhabiting distinct realms of existence. With a graceful and deliberate movement, the majestic Leviathan initiated a departure, its ethereal form gliding away from Carito, its intentions and purpose remaining inscrutable. As the colossal being gently receded into the cosmic ether, its passage seemed like an enigmatic acknowledgement of Carito's presence, leaving him with a sense of wonder and awe in the wake of this extraordinary encounter. Spider-Man, Kara, what the fuck did I just see? You just saw the unwritten Leviathan. Carito shot a web on the Leviathan's back and went for a ride. He gently got on top of the whale and the entity didn't seem to mind what he was doing. Now the real question is. Spider-Man, how the fuck did I end up here? And how do I get out? Chapter 30, Across the Line of Reality Marvel DC, Images, Manhus, and every anime that will be mentioned and used in this story are not mine. They all belong to their respective owners. The main character carry to Josue Valdez and the story are mine. No poff. Amidst the enigmatic expanse of an uncharted realm, our protagonist found himself adrift, his very presence devoured to a celestial being known as the unwritten Leviathan. Like a mere passenger, he rode upon the back of this cosmic entity, traversing vast distances between worlds and stories. With each transition, the arachnid hero observed the whale effortlessly consuming and preserving these tales, providing a sense of solace in knowing they remained intact and safeguarded. Yet, an intriguing pattern emerged. The Leviathan exhibited discernment, refraining from devouring worlds plagued by dark entities. Instead, it would patiently linger, seemingly waiting for the hero to intervene, only to discern that he lacked the might to confront such malevolence. In such instances, the whale would continue its ethereal void through the immaculate void, leaving those troubled stories for another time or hero to address. Curiously, the hero's state defied the norms of mortal existence. Time seemed to bend, its relentless march silenced, and the constraints of hunger and fatigue were absent. Perplexed by this strange phenomenon, he began to question the nature of his experience and the unique qualities of this enigmatic realm. Amidst his musings, a voice, soft and reassuring, manifested within his consciousness, offering answers to his innermost queries. It was Kara, his guiding presence, providing insight and understanding to the inexplicable circumstances surrounding him. Player, my guess on your current state is because of a leviathan. Carito, the whale? Yes, it seems to be energizing you with its power, keeping you in perfect condition. Carito, and why would it do that? I'm certain that it knows that you're a guardian. That's why it sometimes stops in front of consumed dark worlds but it notices that the enemy residing inside that world is leagues above you so it leaves. Carito, damn, even a whale is calling me weak. Well, I wouldn't say so. You did somehow hack a line of dark matter and turned it onto a black hole. Carito, I don't even know how the hell I even did that, I just wanted to get out of there. And because you did so we are now in some unknown white void. I can't blame you for doing so, we were in an extremely dangerous situation by then. It surprised me that for a millisecond you considered dying when you were running away from 001 the Gate Guardian. Carito, I wonder why? I'm not messing with that, I was barely dodging his attacks. He seemed to be testing me instead of actually killing me on the spot. Though, I did cancel all of his incoming hacks and shit. He used one where he told me to drop dead with just his voice and I barely cancelled that attack and many others. This hacking skill has saved my ass more times than I can count. It is certainly a very useful skill. 
you should try upgrading it more when you make it to Prestige Master. Carito, you don't have to tell me twice. This skill seems like it does more than the description actually says. It says technology but after the skill kept getting upgraded I have been able to create portals and other sorts. It's like I can do an Urfeta version of molecular manipulation, just like Molecule Man but not at his level. Bah. I don't know. Thinking about this is about the only thing that keeps me occupied while I traverse here with the Leviathan. Toxin, Carito, I may have an idea of where we are but I'm not completely sure. It's an idea I took from reading your memories before you entered the world of fiction. Carito, sure, go ahead. Toxin, do you remember when you read the comics of Lucifer Morningstar? Carito, yeah, those were pretty complex books but entertaining. Wait you don't mean? Toxin, well, remember the concept of the source wall? What if we went beyond the Marvel Zone source wall? Carito, I'm not so knowledgeable about Marvel when it's about cosmology but does Marvel have its own source wall? Well if we talk about the crossover of the X-Men and the Teen Titans you can say that Toxin's theory isn't so far-fetched. Carito, well, that is true. Let's just assume that we went beyond Marvel's source wall. How the fuck did I even go through it? I guess that the Dark Dimension or Multiverse, whichever you rather call it, resides at the edge of each Omniverse as some sort of entrance and exit for the Darks to travel in. Carito, so because I entered the Omniversal Library from Marvel's sector, which the location resides at the very edge of everything in Marvel, and because I jumped outside the container which in this case is the library I fell into some sort of... What do you call it? Toxin, maybe you were stuck in between the concept of real and what is imagination? That would explain the weird way, the player's body was behaving. He was going through a process of being broken, written, drawn, told, and many other things that an author needs to do the creator character. Carito, wait, so I was being deleted and created at the same time? Toxin, I guess you can say that I don't understand this topic at all. Carito, same, it just sounds awful but about the location that we are right now, what is it? Well if Toxin's theory isn't just bonkers, we are in the outside or the source. Carito, huh? Wasn't the outside a dark and unexplored void of nothingness that no one knows what resides in it? Well, what if we are truly outside and just traveling the different entrances of different omniverses? Didn't we just pass around 49 different doors with different stories inside of them? Carito, if that's true, then we are in a place where beings like Lucifer Morningstar and the Presence, those kinds of people specifically, can enter. Like I can understand the god of their own multiverse going outside of it to monitor it and not interrupt the other gods with their own omniverse. Toxin, I don't know. The more I keep hearing the more brain cells I lose. Carito, yeah, let's just drop this subject. It's too complicated to think about right now. Let's just think that we are at the entrances of all stories. The manifestation of human imagination where stories reside. Capish? That's all right by me. So what are we calling this space? Carito, let's just call it. The bridge. Toxin, because it's connected to all stories with their entrances? Nice. Carito, there's another thing that concerns me though. Does it involve on how time works in the bridge? Carito, exactly. Well, before you entered the black hole you were in the deleting and creation process, so the time had stopped for you. It is unknown how much time had passed for you during that state but you were stuck for. That's weird. Carito, W what is it? I can't measure the time you were stuck in that state, the math is. Just all over the place. It's incalculable. Carito, what the hell do you mean incalculable? I can't calculate the estimated time during your frozen state inside of that black hole. It says unknown. Carito, I swear, if a million years had passed already I'm gonna start breaking down. Emotionally. Again. I don't think that much time had passed, or so I hope. Toxin, well, we don't know. We are all in unknown territory. Unless we by a miracle meet someone here that can explain to us what's going on we won't know anything. Carito, yeah. I'm just gonna think about it later. All these assumptions are gonna make us think the wrong things. Agreed. Carito, I'm gonna force myself to sleep. Honestly. There's literally nothing else to do. We are riding a whale in an infinite white void that connects to all stories, or so we assume. I can forcefully make you sleep, just press short rest to sleep 4 hours and long rest to sleep 8 hours. Carito, I'll take the long rest. Wake me up if anything happens, alright? Yes, player. Good night. 
After accepting the long rest, Kerito fell into a peaceful slumber atop the unwritten Leviathan for a full eight hours, experiencing an ethereal and harmonious connection with the cosmic entity. Location. Dark Multiverse. In the somber reality, where the arch-nemesis of the Guardians reigned, a solemn gathering took place in response to recent unsettling incidents. The intrusion of a Guardian into enemy territory, coupled with the elimination of a highly skilled soldier with a record of 1,000 confirmed Guardian kills, raised profound concerns among their ranks. Even more alarming was the Guardian's ability to navigate their realm with uncanny precision, reaching their very heartland without faltering and locating the elusive Omniversal Library. This fabled repository of stories had been under their control for over a billion years, its captured contents utilized to spread corruption across countless narratives. The library's unholy influence bestowed upon them the gift of swift and unhindered travel, granting access to any destination within the multiverse. Their wrathful dark god seethed with fury at the audacity of a guardian breaching their realm and mending two universes within a mere fraction of time. The sheer intensity of his malevolence exuded an ominous aura capable of bending the very fabric of time and space, instilling tremors of dread among his trembling commanders. Question mark 001. You were in charge to guard that place for the next 100 years until the next turn. And a guardian slipped through your fingers? Dark SCP-001 Gate Guardian, S. Sir. The target had killed himself the moment he jumped out of the library's windows. There's no way he would survive the void. Its main purpose is to delete the character completely from the face of fiction. He shouldn't exist in anybody's head right now, neither inside of fiction nor in the real world. Question mark then why are there people who know about him? I can feel more than 500 people already aware of his existence and still remember who he is. Dark SCP-001 Gate Guardian, what? Sir, that shouldn't be possible. Question mark unless he altered fate itself. Onslaught, but that's impossible. Sir, you don't mean. Dark Astral Regulator Thanos, did he change the plot? Question mark it is a possibility, but I have a feeling it was accidental seeing he doesn't know what he did and just speculated it as mere luck. Dark Mephisto, that is still very dangerous, sir. We have never seen someone being able to alter the plot itself. Besides you. And your original self at the beginning of everything. A few others as well. Question mark that's why we should do everything possible to make him think it was just luck. Dark Kang the Conqueror, we must eliminate him at all costs. We can keep increasing the reward in this dark multiverse and hope that every comic, video game, movie, and novel characters see it. Question mark let the bounty reward be a promotion for a higher standing in the Omniverse. Everyone seeks power here, in hopes to be strong enough to be a 2.0 of God of Stories Loki. Dark God Emperor Doom, yes, sir. We will do as accordingly. This is Marvel's business. Let's try not to involve others in this. Complication. The last thing I want is for someone from DC to get the power to do anything he wants. There's more than enough of those around already. Dark Mephisto, can't handle the competition having stronger characters than ours? Chuckles. Dark God Emperor Doom, silence. I will not tolerate your jokes. Dark Mephisto, you're too easy to pick on, you know, Doom? Question mark that's enough. I don't want to see an incident like this happen again, hurry and update the announcement. I want Carrie to Josia to be deleted permanently from the face of history. Each participant nodded with resolute understanding before vanishing into the ether. In the aftermath of the intense deliberation, a heavy sigh escaped the lips of an enigmatic figure seated at the head of the table. The room was now empty, save for this lone individual who remained, contemplating the consequences of the decisions made. As he cast his gaze across the length of the table, his eyes alighted upon a solitary figure stationed at the far end. A subtle smile graced her countenance, imbuing a sense of cryptic satisfaction. Question mark Featherine, I don't like that look on your face. Dark Featherine, hm, what looks do I have? Question mark you have the face of someone interested in someone else. Dark Featherine, do I? Chuckles. Question mark the only times you have that face is when someone totally exceeds your expectations. Your curiosity to know more about that person overwhelm you to the point you become obsessed with them. Honestly. I preferred your past personality and not the one you have now. Dark Featherine, I can't help myself. Once I acknowledge someone and they keep getting more interesting I just... want them. Question mark okay, get the fuck out here, you're creeping me out. With a simple gesture? Transported Featherine to her universe and then turned his attention to Yan, curiosity glimmering in his eyes. Question mark what? You thought I didn't know you were all reading? The narration says it itself. I'm an anomaly though, 
explaining things now is just gonna be a hassle. In. Question mark don't worry narrator, you don't have to waste your energy telling these people anything, I don't want them to know. I'm just gonna leave you all in a confused state and leave you questioning yourself. What the hell was that? So, fuck off will you? YN? Flick. Error. Time skip. Location. The bridge. The hero remained in a tranquil slumber, seemingly unaffected by the passage of time in this enigmatic realm. The concept of hours and days had become inconsequential to him amidst the peculiar circumstances. Yet, just as the serenity of his rest enveloped him, a gentle awakening came in the form of his AI companion, Kara. Player, the Leviathan has stopped moving. Carito, slowly wakes up you. The mother of who now? The Leviathan has stopped its march and seemed to be on alert. Carito, high alert? What happened? Amidst the inquiry, an ethereal message coursed through Carito's consciousness, originating from the enigmatic Leviathan itself. In an instant, he was informed of the shifting tides within the realm of fiction, an awareness bestowed upon him by the cosmic entity. Carito, wait, I was placed as a high priority target? Ah oh, fuck, this is great. Not only was I on the most wanted list on Earth but I'm also slowly being on the most wanted lists in the multiverse. Wow. Toxin. That's very concerning. Doesn't this mean that we will constantly have to watch our backs? While it is concerning, darks tend to work alone most of the time, at least from what I have seen most of the time. While the ones in a group go for higher priority quest targets. Knowing our luck if we continue to survive and defeat more darks, a group of darks will eventually come after us. I suggest we try and get as strong as possible by then. Carito, sighs this is incredibly annoying. Toxin. It's a good thing that the gamer system allows us to have infinite potential, just like Sung Jin Woo from solo leveling. Carito, I know right? But reaching that level will take too long, I need to find a faster way. Maybe going to a dimension where Shang-Chi can train me or going to Kunlun where Iron Fist trained, or other places similar to that. I got many options. Kunlun is a pretty ruthless place with its training. I think Shang-Chi will go a bit easier on you. Carito, I know that he was nice enough to help 616 Spider-Man train when he didn't have his spider sense, which thanks to Shang-Chi, the way of the spider was born. But I feel like I'll benefit from both. Despite knowing that Kun Lun is pretty ruthless, Shang will not cut me some slack either. Plus learning from one of the greatest martial artists on the planet sounds cool. Toxin, bruh, cool? You're gonna get your ass handed a lot. Carito, hey, I ain't no slacker on hand-to-hand -hand combat. As their conversation ensued, the Leviathan's majestic form moved with a measured and vigilant pace, exhibiting a sense of caution that belied its cosmic power. It navigated the vast expanse of the bridge, the boundless white void, as if anticipating an impending intrusion. The Leviathan's immense gaze scanned every conceivable point, watchful for any signs of an unexpected assault. As moments drifted by, the cosmic entity's wariness was justified when a rift materialized in the fabric of reality. A brilliant green hand thrust forth from the crevice, surging towards its intended mark with astonishing velocity. Spider-Man, gets a telepathic warning from the Leviathan Toxin. Toxin, got it. In a display of remarkable reflexes, Spider-Man swiftly called upon the aid of his symbiote, sculpting an intricate shield that materialized just in time to intercept the colossal stinger hurtling towards him. The impact reverberated through the shield, imparting a momentary backward jolt upon the hero. Spider-Man, TCH, Scorpion. Dark Scorpion, it wasn't easy to find you, Spider. Spider-Man, aren't you the scorpion that got infected by one of Maniac's symbiotes? Dark Scorpion, yes I am, the difference is that I was able to escape that bitch's control. Spider-Man, well fuck. No wonder my spider sense didn't work. Dark Scorpion, haven't faced an enemy with a symbiote before, huh? Spider-Man, well, congrats you're gonna be the first in my death note. Dark Scorpion, I won't be so easy, I killed my own Spider-Man rather easily. In the blink of an eye, the Scorpion unleashed a barrage of scorching plasma blasts from his menacing tail, each projectile seeking to find its mark on the nimble Spider-Man. However, with an uncanny grace, the web slinger danced through the air, evading the sizzling onslaught with remarkable ease. Closing the distance between them, Spider-Man infused his clenched fist with a potent venomous charge and leapt into the air, poised to strike at Scorpion's visage. Yet, to his astonishment, the villain's fist was ablaze with a searing yellow fire, his own countermeasure to meet the hero's onslaught. As their charged fists collided, an eruption of energy ensued, propelling both adversaries in opposite trajectories. 
inadvertently engulfing the unwritten Leviathan in the midst of their cataclysmic clash. Spider-Man, NGH, Toxin. Toxin, shapeshift complete. Spider-Man's very form adapted to the turbulent forces unleashed in the collision. From his arachnid frame, sprouted magnificent wings born of the symbiote's formidable essence, arresting his momentum and restoring equilibrium to his aerial position. With an air of newfound control, he hovered defiantly in the face of adversity. Yet, as he locked eyes with his formidable adversary, a profound sense of awe struck him. Scorpion, too, was undergoing a metamorphic transformation, mirroring the hero's emergence of wings. The once human figure now donned wings of verdant and ebony hue, emanating an aura of malevolence that matched the intensity of their mutual animosity. Spider-Man, you. You killed Iron Fist in your world? Dark Scorpion, yeah, and stole his powers. Let me tell you, they're awesome. Spider-Man, you bastard. In a breathtaking display of agility and ferocity, Spider-Man surged forward with newfound swiftness, delivering a precise knee strike to Scorpion's visage. In seamless motion, he utilized his web shooters, entwining the villain in a web cocoon, drawing him closer with each swift tug. The relentless barrage of punches from the hero followed, delivering a barrage of blows that sent Scorpion hurtling through the air like a pendulum, oscillating between the force of Spider-Man's strikes and the pull of our web tether. Fueled by mounting frustration, Scorpion managed to sever the webs with his razor-sharp claws and retaliated with a deadly salvo of energy projectiles from his menacing tail. The nimble hero, however, proved his mettle by gracefully maneuvering with his symbiotic wings, eluding each deadly shot with calculated ease. As Scorpion saw an opportunity to ensnare the hero, he struck swiftly, coiling his tail around Spider-Man while aiming the venomous stinger menacingly at the hero's countenance. In a desperate act of self-defense, Spider-Man channeled his inner power, generating a surge of electrifying energy that repelled the villain and allowed him to break free from the perilous embrace. Dark Scorpion, okay, I might have underestimated you, you just took my attack in the face, and I was one able to destroy the Daily Bugle with said attack. Spider-Man, you shouldn't. That's how your buddies died. In a mesmerizing display of acrobatic finesse, Spider-Man harnessed the combined might of his symbiotic wings and lateral repulsion, translocating instantaneously before the astonished Scorpion. The swift dance of the hero's movements caught the villain off guard, leaving him momentarily perplexed. Seizing the opportune moment, the spider executed a seamless roundhouse kick that found its mark on Scorpion's ribs, evoking a resounding grunt of agony from the malevolent foe. Undeterred, the hero followed with an elegant combination of an uppercut and a cross punch, propelling the villain several feet backward. The resolute scorpion, ever tenacious, recovered promptly and found himself facing an impending axe kick descending upon him with resolute force. Reacting with an uncanny swiftness, he ensnared the airborne leg of the hero, directing the needle-like tip of his tail precisely at Spider-Man's knee. The hero's resolve and determination, however, were unyielding as he gritted his teeth in response to the ensuing pain. Locked in a riveting standoff, their gazes locked with a shared intensity, the spider and scorpion mustered their formidable powers. The hero channeled his venom-enhanced punch, synergizing it with his remarkable hacking proficiency. Simultaneously, the villain infused his own strike with the empowering might of the Iron Fist technique. Wait, player. If you clash again you'll both be teleported somewhere random. This place is too sensitive. In a cataclysmic moment, their fists clashed with unimaginable force. Avitting held its breath, witnessing the collision of two formidable wills, each striving for dominance. The clash sent shockwaves through the astral realm, marking a pivotal confrontation that could determine the course of existence itself. The combatants locked eyes, realizing the profound significance of this encounter, a convergence of destinies woven into the fabric of many omniverses. As the titanic clash between Spider-Man and Scorpion reverberated across the ethereal expanse of the bridge, an interdimensional phenomenon was set into motion. This extraordinary event had profound consequences that rippled throughout the very essence of fiction itself. The bridge, serving as a delicate equilibrium between the multitudes of story universes, suffered the brunt of this cataclysmic encounter. The balance between realms became unhinged, like a fractured bridge on the verge of collapse, and with this disruption, the interconnectedness of stories faltered, leading to a cascade of devastating consequences across multiple realities. Data Live Dimension Thirty years ago before the events of Date Alive, the first ever space earthquake in history was made on the frontier between China and Mongolia, killing over 150 million people. After it started a chain of similar disasters around the world that lasted for six months. The shocking thing is, that Sir Isaac Ray, Pelham Westcott, 
Ellen Myra Mathers, and Elliot Baldwin Woodman, were barely finished collecting enough mana. History changed. Dragon Ball Z Dimension. In a destroyed city, where no life was present, only death. In a small puddle of water lay a dead person with a missing arm and teared up G.I. Crack. History changed. Future Goen, gasp. One Piece Dimension. Two tombstones with piles of flowers rested near them, for many people loved them. These two graves were Edward Newgate and Porgas D. Ace. History change. The tombstone of Ace, disappeared. History change. 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 Carrie Topoff. I feel so weightless. I don't even know what happened to me. My whole body. It hurts. What the hell even happened? I I shouldn't be able to make that much power. Or wait, Kara said. That the bridge was sensitive? Maybe it's that. It can't take so much abuse. And I did exactly that with Scorpion. Fuck I'm an idiot. I stand my ground as I inspected my surroundings. I seem to be in some forest. Which one? I have no clue. Spider-Man, hey, Kara, where am I? After the distortion, you have fallen into the omniverse of anime due to its skate being the closest. You have entered the world of Princess Mononoke. Spider-Man, great, just great. Player, you, look different. Spider-Man, what do you mean? Look at the nearby lake. Spider-Man, you, okay? Understood. As I approached the nearby lake and beheld my reflection, I was taken aback by what I saw. Spider-Man, what? I'm 15. Why am I younger? I assume it was the consequence of teleporting to another dimension without the assistance of the system. Spider-Man, no wonder I felt a lot different. I'm a teen. Well shit. In deep contemplation of these enigmatic questions, my heightened senses alerted me to an imminent threat. Swiftly, I pivoted on my heels, conjuring a makeshift shield with my hands just in time to intercept Scorpion's fierce tail attack. The impact was formidable, propelling me across the lake's surface like a skipping stone until I managed to anchor myself by digging my fingers into the earth on the opposite bank. Spider-Man, Scorpion. What the hell did you do? Dark Scorpion, what the hell did I do? What did you do? I have no idea what even happened. Also, did you lose a few inches in height? Spider-Man, how am I fifteen? Dark Scorpion, oh, that explains it. PFFF. Spider-Man, don't laugh. I was already six feet tall when I was fifteen. Dark Scorpion, laughs hysterically oh, lucky me. I don't face those consequences of time and space bullshit. Ha ha ha. Spider-Man, because you're a duck? Dark Scorpion, exactly. Anyways, enough talk, let's do this. Smirk. Spider-Man, TCH, fine by me. In a breathtaking display of kinetic prowess, our trajectories intersected with phenomenal force, rending the water's surface asunder, revealing the submerged depths below. Our relentless exchange of blows echoed through the surrounding wilderness as I harnessed the potential of the venom within me, unleashing a charged blast directed at Scorpion's abdomen. The resulting impact propelled him through a barrage of trees, their sturdy trunks offering meager resistance to his unforgiving trajectory. As I pursued the relentless villain, my heightened instincts detected a peculiar presence among the natural surroundings. Emanating an aura of mystique, ethereal beings, and enigmatic spirits cast their watchful gaze upon me. These phantasmal spectators observed my every move with cautious intrigue, raising an eerie ambience amidst the already chaotic encounter. However, my keen senses left no room for distraction, and in an instant, I deftly evaded an onslaught of razor-sharp claws that effortlessly sliced through an unfortunate tree, underscoring the magnitude of my adversary's ferocity. Spider-Man, go away. IT's dangerous. Dark Scorpion, no, they won't. My gaze fell upon a mysterious figure, garbed in pristine white attire, with enigmatic facial markings. Seizing the opportune moment, I unleashed my webbing with unparalleled precision, ensnaring Scorpion from behind. Utilizing my enhanced strength, I exerted force, drawing him toward me, the resonating tautness of the webs hinting at the tensile power at play. With a seasoned mastery of my hacking acumen, I initiated a swift sequence, opening a portal to dimensions beyond our own. 
The shimmering gateway materialized before us, a passageway to realms unknown, offering a path to subdue and contain my relentless adversary. Spider-Man, you won't hurt anyone here. Let's go somewhere else, shall we? Dark Scorpion, or oh come on, not again. As I leapt into the enigmatic portal, an ethereal vortex swirling with arcane energies, my being succumbed to an unforeseen tumult. The very fabric of reality seemed to waver and distort, causing my form to flicker and glitch within the cosmic currents. My grip on Scorpion inadvertently faltered, allowing him to break free from my webbed grasp, and in a swift retaliation, he spun around with venomous intent, delivering a forceful blow from his formidable tail. The impact was devastating, propelling me with unimaginable force through the expanse of a towering structure, shattering its foundations, and sending debris cascading in every direction. As I plummeted, disoriented and shaken, the interior of the edifice bore the brunt of my uncontrolled trajectory. Spider-Man, and G.H., fuck. I'm building insane endurance for this shit. Player, you entered the world of Elfin Lied. And you also fell into the prison where the protagonist is. And also freed her when you crashed inside. Before you ask, your body is now 18 years old. Spider-Man, you know me so well. Stands up now, I should avoid could during her prison escape. Dark Scorpion, this is probably the craziest fight I've ever been in. Spider-Man, O.S.H. Scorpion's ferocious assault struck me with unyielding force, hurling my form through an imposing wall with a resounding crash. Shaken but resolute, I promptly regained my footing, my senses keenly attuned to every nuance of the chaotic battlefield. A fleeting glimpse of my adversary revealed Scorpion's evasive tactics, as he effortlessly vanished from sight, blending seamlessly into the shadows once more. Spider-Man, Toxin, handle the defense. Toxin, got it. I adroitly evaded Scorpion's frenzied charge, gracefully maneuvering my body to capitalize on the opportune moment. Employing my symbiotic enhanced agility, I deftly ducked and propelled myself upward, delivering a stunningly executed kick that sent Scorpion hurtling towards the ceiling with an echoing impact. Swiftly capitalizing on the momentum, I followed through with an upward uppercut, propelling him further through the levels above. As the dust settled from our previous exchanges, I swiftly employed my webbing, strategically placing it around the room to facilitate my movements and seize control of the dynamic battlefield. Scorpion, undeterred by his earlier setback, resumed his assault with a relentless onslaught of claws and forceful strikes. However, I had anticipated his every move, utilizing my web shooting abilities to gracefully evade his attacks, artfully dancing around him with a graceful ballet of acrobatic prowess. My web-slinging maneuvers allowed me to effortlessly traverse the room and execute a perfectly timed drop kick, delivering a resounding blow to his formidable visage. Dark Scorpion, NHG. Stand still. Spider-Man, Poth, you're telling a Spider-Man to stand still. Dark Scorpion, ARGH. Scorpion's fury surged, driving him to unleash a torrential barrage of deadly projectiles that tore through the once pristine hallway, reducing it to a chaotic scene of devastation. My heightened reflexes served me well, allowing me to deftly maneuver through the onslaught, evading each projectile with calculated precision. However, amidst the chaos, I heard the chilling sound of anguished screams reverberating through the corridor. My heart sank as I turned to behold a harrowing sight, the lifeless bodies of multiple men strewn across the floor, their lives abruptly snuffed out by the cruel hands of an enigmatic figure. My eyes locked with a haunting vision, the form of a naked woman, her face concealed behind a helmet exuding an aura of malevolence. Her unhurried and deliberate strides towards the carnage painted a grim portrait of her intentions, to deal death and destruction without remorse. Spider-Man, okay, I think I've overstated my stay here. In that critical moment, my senses heightened to their fullest, granting me a clear perception of the perilous situation unfolding before me. With every fiber of my being alert and focused, my spider sense finally activated, allowing me to anticipate the invisible strikes of the enigmatic figure. My enhanced vision provided a crucial advantage, enabling me to perceive her deadly hands even when veiled from ordinary sight, an ability that proved invaluable in this high-stakes encounter. I sprang into action, agilely evading the relentless hail of projectiles that sought to engulf me from all directions. Despite the chaotic onslaught, I kept my focus firmly on Scorpion. With unyielding determination, I closed the distance between Scorpion and me, maneuvering through the onslaught with deft precision. As I approached, my thoughts raced, formulating a strategy to outmaneuver my assailants. In a flash, an idea came to me, I formed a portal behind Scorpion, a rift in the fabric of reality that offered an opportunity to gain the upper hand. 
I sought to employ this dimensional advantage to my benefit, utilizing it as a means to gain a tactical advantage over my adversary. Dark Scorpion, not again. With unwavering determination, I seized the opportune moment and lunged at Scorpion, propelling both of us through the portal. Yet, this time, I was well prepared for the disorienting effects of the dimensional rift. Swiftly, before the distortions could destabilize my being, I unleashed a potent venom blast, its charged energy directed at Scorpion's chest with unerring precision. The impact of the venom blast was resounding, its forceful energy propelling Scorpion with great velocity through the very fabric of a towering structure. As the building bore witness to the violent collision, its foundations quivered, bearing the brunt of our fierce confrontation. In the heart of this cataclysmic clash, I descended alongside Scorpion, our intertwined fates plunging us through the shattered edifice of the building. A resonant groan of discomfort escaped my lips as the impact reverberated through my being, yet I remained steadfast, fueled by an indomitable spirit that refused to yield. In the blink of an eye, Scorpion rebounded with uncanny swiftness, seizing my leg with a forceful grip, propelling me with a calculated precision that sent me hurtling onto a passing bus. With reflexes attuned to the chaos of the moment, I nimbly rolled out of harm's way, narrowly avoiding a hail of deadly projectiles that bombarded the surroundings. In the midst of this relentless fray, my strategic instincts kicked in, weaving a web of deception to divert Scorpion's attention. Employing my webbing with deft precision, I hurled a car towards him exploiting the diversion to seize an opening, driving my symbiotic claws into Scorpion's face. With a surge of electric energy, channeled through the touch I inherited from Cain, I held fast, my resolve steeling my mind against the sounds of his anguished cries. Yet, Scorpion, in a desperate bid to retaliate, sought to breach the symbiote's defenses, his claws finding their mark in my vulnerable lungs. The searing pain flared through my body, igniting a maelstrom of emotions within me. In that harrowing moment, I summoned every ounce of strength I possessed and, with a burst of determination, hoisted Scorpion skyward, forging yet another portal through which we would descend into the unknown. The portal delivered us to a rooftop, its location unknown and inconsequential in the face of our relentless combat. Though my ribs throbbed with agony, I did not pause to assess the surroundings. Focused solely on the foe before me, I deftly harnessed my web-slinging abilities to draw Scorpion near. The air crackled with charged energy, an ominous prelude to the decisive strike that lay ahead. My feet, firmly grounded, bore the weight of my resolve, and with unyielding force, I summoned the venomous power within, delivering a potent blow to Scorpion's chest that propelled him through the vast expanse of the sky. Once I couldn't see Scorpion I fell to my knees as I breathed heavily. Spider-Man, gasping for air where? Am. I? Player, you entered the world of golden time. You are currently on top of a university. You are also 19 years old now. Spider-Man, NGH. Fuck. Okay, I think. Those teleporters are. Messing with my body. And not just physically. Damn. Swiftly beseeching Toxin, my symbiotic companion, to conjure a suitable guise, I found myself adorned in casual attire, as felt black hoodie complemented by well-fitted jeans, with Adidas footwear completing the ensemble. Prepared to venture forth. My acute senses detected a flurry of movement, the clatter of footsteps ascending towards the rooftop in urgency. Without hesitation, I invoked my adept camouflage skill, melding seamlessly into the surroundings, evading the approaching individuals with expert stealth. As the law enforcement personnel forcefully breached the door, astonishment played upon their countenances, perplexed by the apparent disappearance of their elusive quarry. Taking advantage of the momentary disarray, I nimbly retreated from the scene hastening my descent down the stairwell. To my chagrin, the echo of panic resonated through the school's corridors, a cacophony of students seeking refuge beneath their desks, seeking solace amidst the tumult. Finally, I sought respite within the confines of the male bathroom, skillfully deactivating my camouflage as the solitude within the lavatory assured me of privacy. Hastily resuming my external guise, I stepped outside, yet the fates seemed determined to test my composure. Colliding with an individual propelled at breakneck speed, he stumbled and fell to the floor while I remained unscathed. With swift concern, I extended a helping hand to aid the unfortunate soul in regaining his footing. Carito, oh shit, are you okay? Lends a hand. Question mark confused and starts speaking Japanese while he grabs Carito's hand. Shit, that's right. I'm in Japan right now. Kara, I need a skill that allows me to speak all languages. Searching skills. Found essential skill. All tongue, allows the player to speak all languages. 
In other words, anything the player hears is automatically translated for them to understand and anything the player says can be understood by a group as if it were speaking in their own language. Cost, 50 million gold. Damn. I'll get it then. Skill has been added to the system. 50 mil gold was taken, and you have now 100 mil gold. Question mark hey man, are you good? Carito, thoughts works like a charm. Talks sorry I just had a lot in mind, you okay? Gazing upon the man who had inadvertently crossed my path, I engaged in a discerning appraisal of his countenance. My keen observation revealed the distinct allure of his green irises, set amid a sea of long, lustrous brown locks that cascaded gracefully. Clad in a sartorial ensemble befitting a ceremonial occasion, the fine threads of a well-tailored suit, adorned with a resplendent blue tie and pristine white shirt, conferred an air of elegance upon his presence. In stature, he stood at an approximate height of five feet and five inches, bearing an aura of youthful composure and poise. The occasion of his arrival, seemingly a freshman orientation, was not lost on my analytical perception. Question mark are you here for the orientation? Carito, Lizo, yeah. I'm guessing that it's cancelled due to the explosion that happened. That's why I was in the bathroom. Question mark dude, we need to evacuate that's why I was running. All orientations were cancelled. Carito, oh, fuck. Well, let's go then. By the way, I haven't gotten your name. Banry, oh, my name's Banry Dada. You don't seem from around here, are you a transfer? Carito, yeah, I'm new to this whole place and to Japan. I'm Carito Josu, from America. A pleasure to meet you, Banry. Hey, wanna hang out? It's kinda obvious that you and I won't be able to function for a bit. Banry, ah, uh, I don't know, I have a few things to do. Carito, you need help moving in? Banry, was it that obvious? Carito, lucky guess. Shrugs I can help if you want plus, I'm kinda bored. Banry, well, I think that's fine. Carito, bro, chill, it's gonna be fine. Let's go. Places his arm on Banry's should and drags him along. Well, that just happened. I need to make sure no protagonist or important people from this world dies. If I can find someone else from the anime I should probably befriend them as quickly as possible. I don't know where I threw Scorpion at so I gotta stay alert. I have a feeling Darks has some sort of trackers for us guardians which would be a bother if that's the case. Anyways, I should spend as much time with Banry as possible to ensure this world's survival. Okay. Let's do this. Scorpion Poff. Ha. Huh. Boom. UGH. That son of a bitch. Where did he send me flying? That hurt. That hurt way too much. I look around as I seem to be. In Mount Fuji? What the hell? How strong is that bastard? The only Spider-Man I've seen with this kind of strength is Cosmic Spider-Man, but he's not at that level. This is weird, very weird. Ugh. This is such a pain in the ass. My stomach hurts, even with the symbiote healing factor. Talking about symbiotes, mine was severely damaged due to that spider's electricity and it looks like he has a skill that involves heat. I can't let that touch me. It's a weakness for my symbiote. But not for him. Lucky bastard. All right, I need to find this world's focus. In other words, it's the protagonist. If I'm not wrong this Spider-Man will do anything possible to protect significant people from their stories. I can call him out with that. It's two times he stopped me from using the protagonist as a decoy, but I'll get them this time. Now, where is it? Dark skill activated. Found important characters. Banri Tada, near the Guardian. Kuko Kaga. Alone in a restaurant. Perfect, the spider hasn't found the second important character. I'll get to her as quickly as I can. I extended my symbiotic wings as I took flight heading straight for the girl. Banri Poff. It's was supposed to my orientation to enter college but. I'm currently in an arcade playing Terminator with my new friend. Isn't this game a little too violent for people? Though, Carito seems to be having a blast. That's nice, he's nice. Very nice. He's incredibly easy to talk to and, I don't know. I feel like I want to be friends with him. He gives out this incredible level of charisma, not only just by his looks because he's probably the most handsome guy I've ever met but he seems to. Approachable? I guess that is the answer. Anyways, he's cool and I haven't had this much fun in a while. Are Americans like this? This energetic? Banri, hey, Carito, why did you move to Japan? Carito, oh, I just thought why not? And moved here. Maybe it's all the anime and shit that made me move here. Banri, chuckles the anime. Foreigners usually say that. Looks like you are no exception. Carito, nope, totally not. 
I'm a huge nerd, like collecting Lego Star Wars kind of nerd. Banry, I haven't seen Star Wars. Carito. Banry, what's with that face? Carito, stare motherfuckly. He's giving me a judgmental face. I'm starting to get nervous. Is it even possible to feel someone's disappointment in you? Banry, W what? Carito, you haven't seen Star Wars? Banry, you hen and nn. Carito, Japanese motherfucker. Do you speak IT? Banry, yes. I do. Carito, let's get out of here. I'm getting you the whole saga. We don't talk about the most recent ones, the old ones are the ones that matter. Banry, H huh? I start to get dragged away by Carito. This is embarrassing, he's dragging me like I was a sack of potatoes. Damn, he's strong as hell. A few minutes later. Carito was successful in dragging me the entire way into a movie store. How did I let this happen? Carito, he grabs the Star Wars Complete Saga collection and walks to the cashier I want this. Cashier, 19,825.998 yen. Carito, stares into space for a few seconds. Banry, Carito, forget about it. It's too expensive anyways. Carito, here. He throws exactly 19,825.998 yen into the basket. Banry, zero to zero. Cashier, thank you, sir. Have a good day. Banry, W what? Carito, let's go, Banry. Starts dragging Banry. Banry, I can walk you know? Carito. He ignored me. Well great. A few minutes later. How did we end up in a restaurant again? Carito, hey Banry, order whatever you want. It's on me. Banry, what? I can't make you pay for everything. Carito, jokingly holds the fork do you want me to stab you with this right into your eye socket? Banry, thank you for your generosity, Carito-sama. Carito, laughs profusely. Banry, well, everything here is kind of expensive so I wouldn't be able to pay it anyways. Carito, I assumed so, don't worry. Take what sounds interesting to you. I'm gonna get a yaki soba, sounds good. Banry, well you, I'll get some unagi no kabayaki. Carito, yeah. That. Banry, pfff, you're hilarious. Carito, I dry, smirk and looks to the side. Banry, what are you staring at, Carito? Carito poff. Looks like I found the wife of this story. Though she might have some issues but she's still pretty hot. Kuko Kaga has wavy waist length light caramel brown hair that has little flicks or curls at the ends of her hair, dark hazel eyes, and large breasts. I know that she wears a lot of stylish clothes in her daily life, almost always wearing high heels pink lip gloss, lipstick. Pretty good to have a rich family, huh? Too bad that it's just one of the reasons why people avoid you because you're rich and they feel intimidated. Besides other issues. Banry, what are you staring at, Carito? Carito, I'm just looking at the hottie right next to us. Banry, huh? Dude, that's inappropriate. Don't stare at her. Carito, or, I didn't know you got so jealous so quickly. How cute. Chuckles. Banry, WHA. That's not true. Don't tease me. Carito, I'm sorry Banry. You're cute and all but I prefer women. Sorry, pal. Banry, I don't know how to feel about that. Carito, getting rejected by your first friend? Terrible I guess. Banry, come on man. Carito, oh dot my dot god. Are you blushing? Ha ha ha. Holds Banry's cheeks. Banry, you asshole. You're so mean. Carito, this is my way of showing love, I annoy the shit out of people so get used to it. Banry, so you're gonna do worse things than this? Carito, what? I gotta kiss the homies goodnight. Banry, what? Carito, starts laughing hysterically. Most of the people inside the restaurant were staring at us in annoyance but there was one specific girl who was silently laughing at our antics. I took note of this and was about to start a conversation with her. Toxin, Carito. Look out. In a split second, my instincts guided me to act decisively, executing a precise spin and channeling the potent force of my venom punch towards the oncoming car that threatened to collide with the restaurant. The impact was swift and powerful, halting the vehicle's perilous trajectory just moments before disaster could unfold. The bystanders were rendered speechless, their countenances etched with astonishment and disbelief at the spectacle that had just transpired before their very eyes. Carito, TCH. There goes my cover. That also felt weird. Banry, W what the hell? Carito, 
Did you just punch a car like it was nothing? Carito, Banri, I need you to listen very carefully. I want you to run away with this chick right here. Don't ever let her out of your sight. Do you hear me? Banri, ah, uh, are you hum? Carito, Banri. Banri, yes. I will. Carito, good. Now, everyone. Get out of the building. Hacks the alarm system and the fire alarm starts sounding. Banri, W what are you? Spider-Man, toxin envelops him your friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. As my gaze shifts towards the outside world, I witness Banri and Kuko making their escape from the scene, finding safety amidst the chaos. Yet, as I stand there momentarily, my attention is abruptly drawn back to the imminent danger that lurks in my immediate vicinity. A powerful blast hurtles towards my head, but with uncanny reflexes, I evade its trajectory in the nick of time. My eyes lock onto the figure of Scorpion, steadily advancing towards me with an aura of malice. Dark Scorpion, how the hell did you make it here earlier than me? Spider-Man, luck I guess? Dark Scorpion, TCH. It's been a long day. Let's finish this. Spider-Man, agreed. In a burst of motion, our forms vanished from sight, reappearing at the heart of the bustling street, where our fateful encounter took shape. With sheer force, our fists collided, engendering a resounding shockwave that rippled through the very fabric of our surroundings. The dance of combat ensued, an intricate ballet of dodges, strikes, and counterattacks, where the essence of our being manifested through each move. I endeavored to close the distance, my jabs seeking a target, but Scorpion's elusive finesse allowed him to deftly evade two of my advances. Undeterred, he retaliated with a swift palm strike beneath my chin followed by a graceful high kick that compelled me to recoil. An electric surge surged through my veins, electrifying my resolve as I unleashed a flurry of blows directed at Scorpion's visage. The symbiote coating his form began to crumble, unable to withstand the relentless barrage I imposed. With an emphatic gesture, Scorpion unleashed a devastating strike that struck the ground, unleashing an explosion of destruction. My body propelled into the air, scanning the surroundings for his next move, but I discerned the telltale gleam on his tail. Reacting with urgency, I summoned a protective shield, but the force of his attack engulfed me entirely, carrying me through the very structures that compose the cityscape. Spider-Man, ugh. Goddamn. I really need to stop getting blasted through all kinds of things. As I regained my footing, I beheld the aftermath of Scorpion's cataclysmic assault. A trail of devastation etched its path through the cityscape, with buildings now bearing unsightly wounds, punctured by the force of his attack. Debris cascaded from above, echoing the chaos that had unfolded mere moments ago. The once tranquil streets now bore the scars of conflict, a testament to the extraordinary power that Scorpion possessed. Spider-Man, well, fuck. I really need to put this guy down. Why is it that I can't fight their normal ones? This level of destruction from just a dark is ridiculous. The original Scorpion could never be this strong. Sayo, he's getting closer. Crack's neck enough damage was caused in this normal world. Don't want any more people having existential crisis thinking that superheroes live among them. I make another portal behind me with a random location. Spider-Man, this is gonna be a pain. In a display of instinctive reflex, I seized hold of Scorpion's lethal stinger, thwarting his menacing intent. Utilizing the element of surprise, I brought him crashing to the ground with a forceful impact. Without hesitating, I propelled both of us through the portal, steeling myself for the ensuing dissonance that the dimensional journey would inevitably impose. Emerging on the other side, my surroundings took me aback, finding myself amidst a radio tower, an unexpected convergence of peril and intrigue. My eyes fell upon an enigmatic assembly of not only terrorists but, oddly juxtaposed, young girls attired in school uniforms. The bizarre amalgamation of elements perplexed me, prompting further scrutiny of the unfolding enigma. Spider-Man, what the fuck? Dark Scorpion, where the hell are we now? Terrorist, who the hell are you guys? I embarked on a swift and efficient course of action, engaging the terrorists and schoolgirls with guns that happened to be within my line of sight. Despite the disconcerting mix of adversaries, I remained steadfast and composed, executing precise maneuvers to incapacitate the threats with minimal collateral impact. Dark Scorpion, the hell? Spider, you look very small. Spider-Man, webs a terrorist against a wall what's my age right now? You're seven years old, player. Spider-Man, for fuck's sake. Terrorist, shot them. Scorpion's unnerving resilience seemed to defy the very laws of physics, rendering the hail of bullets from the terrorist subtly ineffectual against his formidable form. Similarly, 
The symbiotic protection offered by Toxin afforded me an impervious shield against the barrage of projectiles directed my way. Yet, amidst the perplexing amalgamation of enemies, the most confounding aspect lay in the presence of school-uniformed girls thrust into this battlefield. In the relentless dance of combat, I found myself nimbly evading Scorpion's deadly stinger, a deadly weapon capable of reducing adversaries to mere remnants. The unfortunate terrorist who inadvertently became the unintended target of Scorpion's strike met a dire fate, succumbing to the ferocity of the blow. Spider-Man, I would prefer if you didn't kill. Dark Scorpio, is the only exception in your kill list are darks. Spider-Man, yes. Any other enemy lives? Dark Scorpion, makes even more sense to distract you with them. With unparalleled grace, I evade Scorpion's claws and prepare a charged venom punch. Spider-Man, not if I do this again. Dark Scorpion, oh no, you don't. In a seamless display of strategic cunning, I witnessed him leaping into the air, seeking to create distance. Unbeknownst to him, I deftly employed my accelerated decoy technique, ensuring that the true me remained quietly beside him. Spider-Man, psych. You fell for right he. With an unprecedented display of strength, my punch struck Scorpion with such force that the entire radio tower seemed to yield, tilting precariously to one side. As his body plummeted to the streets below, my gaze swiftly shifted to the remaining terrorists and battle-ready girls, who were still entrenched within this enigmatic tower. Spider-Man, I can tell you guys are bad guys and... I don't even know what the hell you girls are but it is clear as day that some beef is going on here. So make this easy for me, give up now or be next to the guy I just sent flying to the streets. Terrorist, hell no. We worked too hard for this. Fire. School girls, fire the intruder. These guys must not understand that I'm bulletproof. Oh well, let's take care of them. With calculated precision and unmatched agility, I executed a swift flying kick, rendering my first adversary unconscious, swiftly ensnaring him in a cocoon of webs. I propelled him towards his compatriots, leaving them momentarily bewildered. My superhuman speed allowed me to unleash a flurry of precise blows, deftly targeting the vital points of the remaining foes, leaving them incapacitated and unable to offer any resistance. Amongst the adversaries were the battle-ready girls, who proved surprisingly formidable with their unexpected speed. However, employing a strategic approach, I subdued them with efficiency, employing non-lethal techniques that leveraged the potency of my venom. A precise chop to their necks ensured their temporary incapacitation, sparing them from grave harm. Making my way towards the stairs, I confronted yet more foes determined to reinforce their ranks. Drawing upon Toxin's shape-shifting capabilities, my hand transformed into a hammer-like structure, delivering a forceful blow that shattered the stairs, causing the adversaries to lose their footing and plummet helplessly. Employing my web-slinging prowess, I effortlessly ensnared the falling adversaries, suspending them from the walls, leaving them powerless and at my mercy. Spider-Man, shit, that was accidental. Didn't mean to almost kill them. Better be more careful. I descended from the upper floor, executing a perfectly controlled landing that sent triples of impact through the air. As I alighted amidst the middle floors, my discerning gaze discerned a group of armed terrorists, one of whom clutched a potentially lethal device, undoubtedly a bomb of sorts. And there, amidst the chaotic fray, stood Scorpion, steadfast in his malevolence. Question mark bleeding out activate the bomb? Terrorist, activates the bomb. Spider-Man, there's usually a bit more time. In a cataclysmic display of power, the tower quivered and teetered precariously, its foundations trembling under the weight of devastation below. A symphony of destruction unfolded as the lower levels succumbed to annihilation, claiming the lives of those who lacked the superhuman resilience to endure such chaos. Amidst this apocalyptic scene, Scorpion and I were forcefully expelled from the crumbling structure, our clash of titans spilling onto the exterior, where the remnants of the radio tower bore witness to our unyielding conflict. Spider-Man, NGH. I have something with taking explosions constantly in the face. Cracks back ouch. Dark Scorpion, you know. Coughs I have never had such a chaotic fight. Until I meet you. Spider-Man, or. NGH. Thanks. Question mark H help. As I swiftly turned my gaze, my attention was arrested by a soft soft voice. My eyes fell upon a child, her form adorned in a crimson hued uniform, the stark contrast of black knee high socks and brown loafers further accentuating her presence. Her ensemble bore an uncanny resemblance to that of traditional school attire, a juxtaposition of innocence and intrigue. My senses were captivated by her medium length blonde hair, cascading gently around her countenance, and the striking crimson hue of her eyes, which bore an enigmatic allure. 
a resplendent red ribbon, elegantly tied in a bow, graced the left side of her hair, adding a touch of refinement to her youthful appearance. Yet, despite her picturesque appearance, a grievous wound on her chest marred the idyllic portrait, demanding immediate attention and evoking my concern. Question mark coughs. Spider-Man, thoughts I haven't seen this character before. It must be an anime that I haven't watched. Speaks shit. I'm coming. Dark Scorpion, he he. Seizing the opportune moment, Scorpion deftly capitalized on the situation, swiftly ensnaring the injured girl and utilizing her as a human shield. Question mark NGH, gasp for air. Dark Scorpion, grabs the girl's throat now, Spider-Man. What are you gonna do now, huh? This is a protagonist, and if I kill her I will ruin this world's story. So let me kill you right here, easily. Kneel in front of me. Spider-Man, you fuck. How dare you? Question mark blood would drip from her hands H help, gasping for air. Spider-Man, no. This, this bastard. That girl barely has any time to live. If I don't hurry she'll die. Shit, shit, wait, shit, I hope this works. Don't worry little one. I'll save you. I slowly walk towards Scorpion and fall on one knee in front of him. Spider-Man, please, let her live. Dark Scorpion, ha 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 ha. This is hilarious. The Darks were having trouble with you? Ha ha ha. They must have been dumb, but I'll be truthful, you gave me a lot of trouble, Spider. Who would have thought we would be fighting in different universes? That was crazy. Spider-Man, I had a good run. Now, please let her live. Dark Scorpion, sure. He raises his tincture for Spider-Man's head. Spider-Man, inhale and exhales this is gonna hurt. Dark Scorpion, what? With nimble precision and grace, I employed a forward momentum, deftly executing a split that served as a life-saving maneuver, narrowly evading Scorpion's lethal blast. In a daring act, I seized the opportune moment, channeling all my strength into a venom-charged punch aimed precisely at Scorpion's vulnerable core. The excruciating pain incapacitated the villain, causing him to involuntarily release his hostage as he clutched his incapacitated source of strength. The impact of the blow reverberated through the surroundings, inducing a chilling sensation for all men within a ten-mile radius, myself included. Dark Scorpion, for you Oh God. Ha. Huh. I caught the girl before she hit the ground and sprinted to where I could see people who looked like officers. Spider-Man, please help her. Leaps and web swings towards Scorpion. No poff. A sense of bewilderment pervaded the onlookers' expressions as they bore witness to the enigmatic events unfolding before them. Within the girl's earpiece, a voice of feminine demeanor emanated, attempting to discern the perplexing circumstances that had transpired, seeking clarity amidst the enigma that had gripped the scene. Medic, crap. She's severely injured. Her heart has received major damage we need to hurry. Question mark breathing heavily I, I, need, to, thank, him. Medic, let's take her to DA quickly. This thing seems to have changed everything. Meanwhile, with a calculated grace, Spider-Man descended before Scorpion, who was gradually regaining his composure after the unexpected assault. Dark Scorpion, why you fucker? Spider-Man, come on, you let a seven-year-old hit you in the jewels? Damn, I even heard a few pops. Dark Scorpion, you fuck. As Scorpion's aura intensified, a palpable surge of power emanated from him transforming his very demeanor. His physical form underwent a remarkable metamorphosis, becoming more robust, and his elongated tail accentuated the menace he exuded. With this newfound strength, he surged forth, unleashing a colossal uppercut aimed squarely at Spider-Man. Swift as a gust of wind, the nimble hero evaded the attack, wisely steering clear of the devastating shockwave that ensued, ravaging an entire city block. Undeterred by the mayhem, Spider-Man's quick reflexes and sense of responsibility prompted him to deploy his webbing with unparalleled precision, rescuing innocent bystanders from the calamitous debris. Alas, even the acrobatic hero's attentiveness couldn't shield him entirely, as Scorpion's vicious grip clamped onto his leg, launching him unceremoniously through a stone statue and into the unforgiving walls of a nearby building. Spider-Man, oh Experiencing a surge of pain as he rolled along the building's surface, the valiant spider hero summoned his symbiote's strength to bring himself to an abrupt halt. His face contorted with both strain and determination, he assessed the situation, silently expressing relief that only one building bore the brunt of the impact, sparing the surrounding structures from further harm. Spider-Man, this is seriously more than I bargained for. Stands up. 
In a mesmerizing display of agility and strategy, Spider-Man adroitly evaded Scorpion's relentless attacks, utilizing the environment to his advantage. With remarkable speed and finesse, the hero navigated behind walls and sought shelter behind tables, ensuring the safety of both himself and those around him. A master of misdirection, Spider-Man's stealth and precision allowed him to vanish from Scorpion's view, leaving the villain momentarily bewildered in search of his nimble foe. However, the wall crawler's absence was merely a clever ruse, as he materialized with impressive force, launching a powerful uppercut that found its mark beneath Scorpion's jaw. In a swift and calculated move, the intrepid hero seized the villain's stinger, maneuvering it skillfully to anchor Scorpion to the ground. Using the secure stinger as a pivot, Spider-Man gracefully twirled around it, creating vital distance between them. Employing his web-slinging prowess, he propelled himself forward, executing a devastating drop kick with impeccable precision, delivering a resounding blow to Scorpion's face. With a tenacious ferocity, the Scorpion emitted pained grunts as the agile hero executed a sliding maneuver across the floor, swiftly engaging his lateral repulsion to deliver a forceful knee strike to the villain's countenance once more. Relentless in his pursuit, Spider-Man deftly ensnared the hapless adversary with his webs, immobilizing him completely. Unyielding, the hero unleashed a barrage of venom-infused punches that resonated throughout the entire edifice, causing the building to tremble with each resounding impact. Aware of the dire consequences his unrestrained onslaught could bring, Spider-Man's keen sense of responsibility compelled him to act. With measured resolve, he delivered one final, controlled punch, ensuring the structural integrity of the building would not be compromised further. Thus, the once imposing structure succumbed to its weakened state, crumbling down as the valiant web slinger deftly swung away from danger, leaving a trail of destruction in his wake. Upon safely reaching the ground, Spider-Man surveyed the aftermath, searching for any sign of his adversary's presence. The faint sound of debris shuffling drew his attention, leading him to a disheveled and severely beaten scorpion. The symbiote that once bolstered his strength now appeared drained and incapable of regenerating its master, leaving the villain's fate hanging in the balance. Spider-Man, well, Scorpion. You looking pretty roughed up there, buddy. Dark Scorpion, shut. Up. Huh? Are you, so strong? Spider-Man, I eat my spinach. Dark Scorpion, you're, not normal. You're not a normal Spider-Man. You're, an anomaly. Your power is, insane. There's no spider like that. You aren't cosmic. So how? Spider-Man, I guess I just have potential. For some reason, I grow abnormally fast compared to other people. I always thought how do I always grow stronger during a fight? I haven't noticed it until now. Before I even have the adaptability skill I was already growing insanely fast, and now with this skill, it's doubled. Dark Scorpion, that, coughs isn't fair. Spider-Man, for you, it isn't. I don't wanna die. Even though I already did and it's horrible. Before we finish this I'm letting you know that I'm just gonna be growing stronger and stronger. Dark Scorpion, I, have never met a Spider-Man like you. Spider-Man, like I've said before. Do I look like the original Spider-Man? Of course not. So stand up, we are ending this. In a ballet of combat prowess, Scorpion and Spider-Man engaged in a high-speed clash, their movements a symphony of agility and skill. With incredible finesse, the web slinger gracefully sidestepped Scorpion's attempted tail strike, swiftly retaliating with a flawlessly executed roundhouse kick to the villain's jaw. As Scorpion staggered, dazed by the blow, Spider-Man acted with the precision of a virtuoso, ensnaring his foe with webbing, rendering him immobile. With unwavering determination, Spider-Man unleashed a formidable flurry of punches, a rapid-fire sequence of blows that seemed to defy the laws of time itself. The force behind each strike was so immense that the air around the hero's fists appeared to form a discernible line. The echoes of the blows reverberated across the battlefield, akin to the thunderous report of mighty cannons. As the intense combination concluded, Spider-Man surveyed the aftermath of his assault. Scorpion lay motionless on the ground, his body battered and bloodied, while the web-slinger stood above him, his eyes reflecting a mix of somberness and resolution. The once vicious villain now appeared lifeless. Spider-Man, I won, bitches, smirks. With a profound sense of composure, the spider assumed a position of repose, his controlled breaths harmonizing with the ethereal hum of his self-healing suit. Perched atop the scattered debris, he engaged in introspection, delving into the depths of his thoughts, dissecting every moment of the intense battle that had just transpired. Carrie Topoff. Spider-Man, goddamn. How many dimensions did I fucked up with just one fight? I can't be doing that over and over again. 
The damn Peter luck hit me hard this time. Every time I would try to teleport to an abandoned area or world I landed on a very populated one instead. I need to control this hacking ability. It's too unstable. For me at least. Which is weird. Why just me? Everything else works just fine but not me. It affects my body and mind. How many times did my age change with just one fight? I already lost count, and I have a feeling that my personality changes according to the age I am. I noticed it when I was in the world of golden time. When I was at that age I used to be kind of a perv. Luckily I reserved myself and didn't do anything stupid. Size this is troublesome. I need due to some sort of training so I can keep my old personality. But what can I do? Player, Scorpion's body is heating up, and it's convulsing. Spider-Man, what? I quickly turned to where I left Scorpion and my eyes widen as a memory resurfaced. Memory. Carito, Yelena. Yelena, thank you. Lee's body exploded and Yelena was turned into ash, almost all of Indonesia's forest was destroyed. Its only survivor being. Carito. Reality. In that moment of desperation, I felt an urgent need to act, to ensure that Scorpion's malevolence could never resurface again. With swift determination, I rushed towards his lifeless form, my mind racing to find a fitting solution. Gathering my resolve, I manipulated my power over the interdimensional portals, opening one behind the villain's fallen body. I skillfully webbed his form, encasing it in a cocoon of my technology, my intent clear. With a force born of both physical strength and unyielding purpose, I exerted myself to hurl Scorpion's body into the yawning maw of an active volcano. Spider-Man, great, I just caused Pompeii's destruction. In the aftermath of my decisive act, I was met with an unforeseen consequence of cataclysmic proportions. A Scorpion's body was engulfed in the fiery abyss of the active volcano. An ominous energy seemed to be unleashed, intensifying the eruption to unimaginable levels. The very air crackled with a volatile energy, and the earth trembled beneath the unrestrained power. I could only watch in awe and trepidation, as the explosive might amplified exponentially, surpassing any expectations I could have harbored. The force of the eruption surged forth like a tempest, and in a moment of terrible miscalculation, I found myself caught in a devastating shock wave. My body was assailed by the sheer ferocity of the explosion, and I cried out in agonizing pain. It felt as though the very essence of the volcano's fury was searing through my every fiber. My senses were overwhelmed by the intensity of the blast, leaving me momentarily disoriented and vulnerable. Tumbling through the portal I had opened, I was thrust into a violent collision with reality. The impact of my landing sent me careening into an alleyway, my face harshly meeting the unyielding surface of a concrete wall. The portal closed behind me, severing my connection to the inferno that had claimed Scorpion. As I lay gasping for breath, the scorching agony of my burns enveloped me. The force of the eruption had left me grievously wounded, my skin scorched and my body aching from the ordeal. Even the indomitable symbiote, Toxin, was unable to withstand the intensity of the explosion, retreating into my body to recuperate from the extensive damage. Carito, unequipped his Spider-Man suit and J.H. K. Kara. Healing. Potion. Using healing potion. Healing. I quickly started feeling relieved as my burns were getting healed. I stayed on the ground catching my breath not moving. I'm too tired to do anything else. I just wanna sleep. Player, multiple hostiles detected. As I heard Kara's warning I lazily looked at the hostiles. They weren't a big deal, just your typical thug. Thug number one, well look who we have here. You don't look so good, kid. Cackles. Thug number two, what? Did your family abandon you? The group would start to laugh at such petty insults as they walk closer to me. I saw more clearly and around six men were now surrounding me. I really can't catch a break. Carito, slowly stands up and gh. Okay. Let's do this. Thug number three, oh, tough are we now? Learn your lesson, kid. With an almost nonchalant composure, I intercepted the thug's impetuous slap, swiftly seizing his hand in a vice-like grip. In response, my retaliation was marked by an artful display of force, an effortless backhand that reverberated through the air with a resounding impact. The thug crumpled to the ground, the unmistakable evidence of a fractured countenance evident on his unconscious form. The abrupt display of prowess left the other five assailants momentarily stupefied, their initial bravado giving way to a semblance of trepidation. Undeterred, they regrouped, wielding their weapons with a mixture of caution and desperation. Thugs number four, why you freak, pulls a knife. In a display of deft footwork, I sidestepped the assailant's reckless lunge, causing him to lose his balance. His momentum betrayed him, 
and in a tragic twist of fate, his weapon found an unintended target, his own chest. A gut-wrenching cry of agony escaped his lips as the blade penetrated his flesh, leaving both him and me stunned by the abrupt turn of events. Carito, do you even know how to use a knife? How the hell did you stab yourself? Thug number five, Nua, swings a bat. Everything is so slow. I caught the bat and flicked the thug's forehead, instantly knocking him out. Thug number six, what the hell is this kid? Carito, come on, guys, you're boring me. As they all attacked me together a random girl appears out of nowhere and calls them out. Chizato, hey, leave him alone. Thug number six, hell no, he has to pay, get out of here kid. Instantly the girl ran towards the sixth thug and delivered a flying kick right in his face which knocked him out easily. She proceeds to expertly take down the rest of the thugs with ease. Using her martial arts and impressive speed, she ended the fight in just a few seconds. Chizato, hey, are you alright? Tilt's head. Carito, thoughts she's cute. Speaks yeah, I'm fine. Lucky for me that I have pretty good reflexes and made at least two of them hit themselves. Chizato, wow, really? That's pretty impressive. Though, I got to ask again are you okay? Your clothes aren't in the best shape and you look very tired and dirty. Carito, well, truthfully I have nowhere to go. No family, nor nothing. I was pretty unlucky and just had to come across those thugs while I was sleeping beside this. Sees the melted trash can and comes up with a lie woe. When did that happen? Chizato, for real. Was this place this messed up before? Carito, well, it wasn't. I wasn't focused on it when I was running away from those thugs. Chizato, it's certainly a weird thing to see melted trash cans. It's like a volcano erupted here or something, there's even ash. Carito, gulps that's true, certainly weird. Chizato, oh, I haven't gotten your name. My name's Chizato Nishikigi, a pleasure to meet you. Carito, my name is Carito Josu. The pleasure's all mine, smiles. Chizato, thought's cute, speaks well, if you don't have a home. Why don't you come with me? Carito, what? I can't intrude like that. Chizato, a www come on. It'd be fine, no one will mind. I'll convince them. Carito, but, may, I don't wanna be an obstacle in the way of your family. Chizato, you won't don't worry. I leave and get you a job. I promise that you won't regret it. Carito, I don't know. Chizato, please question mark tilde. Carito, <laughs> Chizato, please question mark tilde, with a cherry on top. Carito. Chizato, starts giving him puppy eyes. Carito, A.G.H., for fuck's sake all right, who made you so cute, that's not fair. Chizato, jiggles he he he, my mother did. Carito, those are some hell of jeans. Chizato, thanks. Now let's go. Quickly starts leaving the alleyway. A profound sigh resonates within the depths of the hero's consciousness as he contemplates the tangled web of events that now enshrouds him. In the recesses of his mind, he finds himself echoing a poignant verse, there's no mercy for the wicked, I guess. Such introspection bespeaks the gravity of his predicament, the intricate moral dilemmas he must confront. Amid this contemplative soliloquy, a beckoning voice disrupts the inward musings. It is Chizato, a guiding figure in this labyrinthine narrative. With a sense of purpose, she calls upon the hero to follow, an invitation laden with implicit urgency and import. Chizato, hey, Carito. Come on, don't leave me alone here, smiles. Carito, thoughts that level of cuteness should be legal, talks yup, I'm going. With an elegant stride, the hero walks beside Chizato, her unwavering smile bringing comfort to his heart. Their conversation flows effortlessly, slowly forming a bond. Carito, thoughts well. Let's see what this world has to offer. I hope it isn't as chaotic as the MCU's, because if it is, well that's gonna be a job for the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man. Though I don't think I'm so friendly. May, I should work on that later. Right now, I just gotta focus on this cute girl beside me. And shower. I stink of volcano ash. Player, you have entered the world of Lycoris Recoil. Your current age is 17 years old. Detected changed into the story, the cause of the radio tower incident. You. The original storyline has been altered. Instead of Chizato single-handedly defeating the terrorist, two random people with a suit were the cause of the incident and that event marked Tokyo forever as the strange person disappeared, for ten years.